Section 27 of Grey's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bianca. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. Development of Urinary and Generative Organs, Part 2. The testis. The testis is developed in much the same way as the ovary. Like the ovary, in its earliest stages, it consists of a central mass of epithelium covered by a surface epithelium. In the central mass, a series of cords appear, and the periphery of the mass is converted into the tunica albuginea, thus excluding the surface epithelium from any part in the formation of the tissue of the testis. The cords of the central mass run together toward the future hylus and form a network which ultimately becomes the Wheaty testis. From the cords, the seminiferous tubules are developed, and between them, connective tissue septa extend. The seminiferous tubules become connected with outgrowth from the Wolfian body, which, as before mentioned, form the efferent ducts of the testis. Descent of the testes. The testes, at an early period of fetal life, are placed at the back part of the abdominal cavity, behind the peritoneum, and each is attached by a peritoneal fold, the mesorchium, to the mesonephros. From the front of the mesonephros, a fold of peritoneum, termed the inguinal fold, goes forward to meet and fuse with a peritoneal fold, the inguinal crest which grows backward from the anterolateral abdominal wall. The testis thus acquires an indirect connection with the anterior abdominal wall, and at the same time, a portion of the peritoneal cavity lateral to these fused folds is marked off as the future saccus vaginalis. In the inguinal crest, a peculiar structure, the gubernaculum testis, makes its appearance. This is at first a slender band, extending from that part of the skin of the groin, which afterward forms the scrotum, through the inguinal canal, to the body and epididymis of the testis. As development advances, the peritoneum enclosing the gubernaculum forms two folds, one above the testis and the other below it. The one above the testis is the plica vascularis, and contains ultimately the internal spermatic vessels. The one below, the plica gubernatrix contains the lower part of the gubernaculum, which has now grown into a thick cord. It ends below, at the abdominal inguinal ring, in a tube of peritoneum, the saccus vaginalis, which protrudes itself down the inguinal canal. By the fifth month, the lower part of the gubernaculum has become a thick cord, while the upper part has disappeared. The lower part now consists of a central core of unstriped muscle fiber, and outside this of a firm layer of striped elements, connected, behind the peritoneum, with the abdominal wall. As the scrotum develops, the main portion of the lower end of the gubernaculum is carried, with the skin to which it is attached, to the bottom of this pouch. Other bands are carried to the medial side of the thigh and to the perineum. The tube of peritoneum, constituting the saccus vaginalis, projects itself downward into the inguinal canal, and emerges at the cutaneous inguinal ring, pushing before it a part of the obliquus internus and the aponeurosis of the obliquus externus, which form, respectively, the cremaster muscle and the intercrural fascia. It forms a gradually elongating pouch, which eventually reaches the bottom of the scrotum, and behind this pouch the testis is drawn by the growth of the body of the fetus, for the gubernaculum does not grow commensurately with the growth of other parts, and therefore the testis, being attached by the gubernaculum to the bottom of the scrotum, is prevented from rising as the body grows, and is drawn first into the inguinal canal, and eventually into the scrotum. It seems certain also that the gubernacular cord becomes shortened as development proceeds, and this assists in causing the testis to reach the bottom of the scrotum. By the end of the eighth month, the testis has reached the scrotum, preceded by the saccus vaginalis, 
which communicates by its upper extremity with the peritoneal cavity. Just before birth, the upper part of the saccus vaginalis usually becomes closed, and this obliteration extends gradually downward to within a short distance of the testis. The process of peritoneum surrounding the testis is now entirely cut off from the general peritoneal cavity and constitutes the tunica vaginalis. Descent of the ovaries In the female, there is also a gubernaculum, which affects a considerable change in the position of the ovary, though not so extensive a change as in that of the testis. The gubernaculum in the female lies in contact with the fundus of the uterus and contracts adhesions to this organ, and thus the ovary is prevented from descending below this level. The part of the gubernaculum between the ovary and the uterus becomes ultimately the proper ligament of the ovary, while the part between the uterus and the labia magus forms the round ligament of the uterus. A pouch of peritoneum, analogous to the saccus vaginalis in the male, accompanies it along the inguinal canal. It is called the canal of Nuck. In rare cases, the gubernaculum may fail to contract adhesions to the uterus, and then the ovary descends through the inguinal canal into the labia magus, and under these circumstances its position resembles that of the testis. The metanephros and the permanent kidney The rudiments of the permanent kidneys make their appearance about the end of the first or the beginning of the second month. Each kidney has a twofold origin, part arising from the metanephros and part as a diverticulum from the hind end of the wolfian duct, close to where the latter opens into the cloaca. The metanephros arises in the intermediate cell mass, caudal to the mesonephros, which it resembles in structure. The diverticulum from the wolfian duct grows dorsalward and forward along the posterior abdominal wall, where its blind extremity expands and subsequently divides into several buds, which form the rudiments of the pelvis and calyces of the kidney. By continued growth and subdivision, it gives rise to the collecting tubules of the kidney. The proximal portion of the diverticulum becomes the ureter. The secretory tubules are developed from the metanephros, which is molded over the growing end of the diverticulum from the wolfian duct. The tubules of the metanephros unlike those of the pronephros and mesonephros, do not open into the wolfian duct. One end expands to form a glomerulus, while the rest of the tubule rapidly elongates to form the convoluted and straight tubules, the loops of Henley, and the connecting tubules. These last join and establish communications with the collecting tubules derived from the ultimate ramifications of the diverticulum from the wolfian duct. The mesoderm around the tubules becomes condensed to form the connective tissue of the kidney. The ureter opens at first into the hind end of the wolfian duct. After the sixth week, it separates from the wolfian duct and opens independently into the part of the cloaca which ultimately becomes the bladder. The secretory tubules of the kidney become arranged into pyramidal masses or lobules and the lobulated condition of the kidneys exists for some time after birth, while traces of it may be found even in the adult. The kidney of the ox and many other animals remains lobulated throughout life. The urinary bladder The bladder is formed partly from the endodermal cloaca and partly from the ends of the wolfian ducts. The allantois takes no share in its formation. After the separation of the rectum from the dorsal part of the cloaca, the ventral part becomes subdivided into three portions. 1. An anterior vesico-ureteral portion, continuous with the allantois, into this portion the wolfian ducts open. 2. An intermediate narrow channel, the pelvic portion. and 3. A posterior phallic portion, closed externally by the urogenital membrane. The second and third parts together constitute the urogenital sinus. The vesico-ureteral portion absorbs the ends of the wolfian ducts and the associated ends of the renal diverticula, and these give rise to the trigone of the bladder and part of the prostatic urethra. 
The remainder of the vesico-urethral portion forms the body of the bladder and part of the prostatic urethra. Its apex is prolonged to the umbilicus as a narrow canal, which later is obliterated and becomes the medial umbilical ligament, urecus. The prostate. The prostate originally consists of two separate portions, each of which arises as a series of diverticular buds from the epithelial lining of the urogenital sinus and vesico-urethral part of the cloaca, between the third and fourth months. These buds become tubular and form the glandular substance of the two lobes, which ultimately meet and fuse behind the urethra and also extend to its ventral aspect. The isthmus, or middle lobe, is formed as an extension of the lateral lobes between the common ejaculatory ducts and the bladder. Skinny's ducts in the female urethra are regarded as the homologues of the prostatic glands. The bulbo-urethral glands of Cowper in the male and greater vestibular glands of Bartholin in the female also arise as diverticula from the epithelial lining of the urogenital sinus. The external organs of generation. As already stated, the cloacal membrane, composed of ectoderm and endoderm, originally reaches from the umbilicus to the tail. The mesoderm extends to the midventral line for some distance behind the umbilicus and forms the lower part of the abdominal wall. It ends below in a prominent swelling, the cloacal tubercle. Behind this tubercle, the urogenital part of the cloacal membrane separates the ingrowing sheets of mesoderm. The first rudiment of the penis, or clitoris, is a structure termed the phallus. It is derived from the phallic portion of the cloaca, which has extended on to the end and sides of the undersurface of the cloacal tubercle. The terminal part of the phallus, representing the future glands, becomes solid. The remainder, which is hollow, is converted into a longitudinal groove by the adsorption of the urogenital membrane. In the female, a deep groove forms around the phallus and separates it from the rest of the cloacal tubercle, which is now termed the genital tubercle. The sides of the genital tubercle grow backward as the genital swellings, which ultimately form the labia majora. The tubercle itself becomes the mons pubis. The labia minora arise by the continued growth of the lips of the groove on the undersurface of the phallus. The remainder of the phallus forms the clitoris. In the male, the early changes are similar, but the pelvic portion of the cloaca undergoes much greater development, pushing before it the phallic portion. The genital swellings extend around between the pelvic portion and the anus, and forms a scrotal area. During the changes associated with the descent of the testis, this area is drawn out to form the scrotal sex. The penis is developed from the phallus. As in the female, the urogenital membrane undergoes adsorption, forming a channel on the undersurface of the phallus. This channel extends only as far forward as the corona glandis. The corpora cavernosa of the penis or clitoris and of the urethra arise from the mesodermal tissue in the phallus. They are at first dense structures, but later vascular spaces appear in them, and they gradually become cavernous. The prepuce in both sexes is formed by the growth of a solid plate of ectoderm into the superficial part of the phallus. On coronal section, this plate presents the shape of a horseshoe. By the breaking down of its more centrally situated cells, the plate is split into two lamellae, and the cutaneous fold, the prepuce, is liberated and forms a hood over the glands. Adherent prepuce is not an adhesion really, but a hindered central discremation. Very hard. The urethra. As already described, in both sexes, the phallic portion of the cloaca extends on to the undersurface of the cloacal tubercle as far forward as the apex. At the apex, the walls of the phallic portion come together and fuse, the lumen is obliterated, and the solid plate, the urethral plate, is formed. The remainder of the phallic portion is for a time tubular, and then, by the absorption of the urogenital membrane, 
it establishes a communication with the exterior. This opening is the primitive urogenital ostium, and it extends forward to the corona glandis. In the female, this condition is largely retained. The portion of the groove on the clitoris broadens out while the body of the clitoris enlarges, and thus the adult urethral opening is situated behind the base of the clitoris. In the male, by the greater growth of the pelvic portion of the cloaca, a longer urethra is formed, and the primitive ostium is carried forward with the phallus, but it still ends at the corona glandis. Later it closes from behind forward. Meanwhile, the urethral plate of the glands breaks down centrally to form a median groove, continuous with the primitive ostium. This groove also closes from behind forward, so that the external urethral opening is shifted forward to the end of the glands. End of section 27 Recorded by Bianca in Utrecht, the Netherlands on March 1, 2010section 28 of gray's anatomy part 5 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org anatomy of the human body part 5 by henry gray the kidneys part 1 the urinary organs the urinary organs comprise the kidneys which secrete the urine the ureters or ducts which convey urine to the urinary bladder, where it is for a time retained, and the urethra, through which it is discharged from the body. 1. The kidneys, renis. The kidneys are situated in the posterior part of the abdomen, one on either side of the vertebral column, behind the peritoneum, and surrounded by a mass of fat and loose areolar tissue. Their upper extremities are on a level with the upper border of the twelfth thoracic vertebra, their lower extremities on a level with the third lumbar. The right kidney is usually slightly lower than the left, probably on account of the vicinity of the liver. The long axis of each kidney is directed downward and lateralward, the transverse axis backward and lateralward. Each kidney is about 11.25 cm in length, 5 to 7.5 cm in breadth, and rather more than 2.5 cm in thickness. The left is somewhat longer and narrower than the right, the weight of the kidney in the adult male varies from 125 to 170 grams, in the adult female from 115 to 155 grams. The combined weight of the two kidneys in proportion to that of the body is about 1 to 240. The kidney has a characteristic form and presents for examination two surfaces, two borders, and an upper and lower extremity. Relations The anterior surface, facies anterior, of each kidney is convex, and looks forward and lateralward. Its relations to adjacent viscera differ so completely on the two sides that separate descriptions are necessary. Anterior surface of right kidney. A narrow portion at the upper extremity is in relation with the right suprarenal gland. A large area just below this, and involving about three-fourths of the surface, lies in the renal impression on the inferior surface of the liver, and a narrow but somewhat variable area near the medial border is in contact with the descending part of the duodenum. The lower part of the anterior surface is in contact laterally with the right colic flexure, and medially, as a rule, with the small intestine. The areas in relation with the liver and small intestine are covered by peritoneum. The suprarenal, duodenal, and colic areas are devoid of peritoneum. Anterior surface of the left kidney. A small area along the upper part of the medial border is in relation with the left suprarenal gland, and close to the lateral border is a long strip in contact with the renal impression on the spleen. A somewhat quadrilateral field about the middle of the anterior surface marks the site of contact with the body of the pancreas, on the deep surface of which are the lienal vessels. Above this is a small triangular portion, between the suprarenal and splenic areas, in contact with the posterior inferior surface of the stomach. Below the pancreatic area, the lateral part is in relation with the left colic flexure, the medial with the small intestine. The areas in contact with the stomach and spleen are covered by the peritoneum of the omental bursa, while that in relation to the small intestine is covered by the peritoneum of the general cavity. Behind the latter are some branches of the left colic vessels. 
the suprarenal, pancreatic, and colic areas are devoid of peritoneum. The posterior surface, facies posterior. The posterior surface of each kidney is directed backward and medialward. It is embedded in an areolar and fatty tissue and entirely devoid of peritoneal covering. It lies upon the diaphragm, the medial and lateral lumbocostal arches, the psoas major, the quadratus lumborum, and the tendon of the transversus abdominis, the subcostal, and one or two of the upper lumbar arteries, and the last thoracic, iliohypogastric, and ilioinguinal nerves. The right kidney rests upon the twelfth rib, the left usually on the eleventh and twelfth. The diaphragm separates the kidney from the pleura, which dips down to form the phrenicocostal sinus, but frequently the muscular fibers of the diaphragm are defective or absent over a triangular area immediately above the lateral lumbocostal arch, and when this is the case, the perinephric areolar tissue is in contact with the diaphragmatic pleura. Borders The lateral border, margo lateralis, external border, is convex and is directed toward the posterior lateral wall of the abdomen. On the left side it is in contact at its upper part with the spleen. The medial border, margo medialis, internal border, is concave in the center and convex toward either extremity. It is directed forward and a little downward. Its central part presents a deep longitudinal fissure, bounded by prominent overhanging anterior and posterior lips. This fissure is named the hilum, and transmits the vessels, nerves, and ureter. Above the hilum, the medial border is in relation with the suprarenal gland, below the hilum with the ureter. Extremities the superior extremity, extremitus superior, is thick and rounded, and is nearer the median line than the lower. It is surmounted by the suprarenal gland, which covers also a small portion of the anterior surface. The inferior extremity, extremitus inferior, is smaller and thinner than the superior, and farther from the median line. It extends to within five centimeters of the iliac crest. The relative position of the main structures in the hilum is as follows. The vein is in front, the artery in the middle, and the ureter behind and directed downward. Frequently, however, branches of both artery and vein are placed behind the ureter. Fixation of the kidney. The kidney and its vessels are embedded in a mass of fatty tissue, termed the adipose capsule, which is thickest at the margins of the kidney and is prolonged through the hilum into the renal sinus. The kidney and the adipose capsule are enclosed in a sheath of fibrous tissue continuous with the subperitoneal fascia, and named the renal fascia. At the lateral border of the kidney, the renal fascia splits into an anterior and a posterior layer. The anterior layer is carried medialward in front of the kidney and its vessels, and is continuous over the aorta with the corresponding layer of the opposite side. The posterior layer extends medialward behind the kidney and blends with the fascia on the quadratus lumborum and psoas major and through this fascia is attached to the vertebral column. Above the suprarenal gland, the two layers of the renal fascia fuse and unite with the fascia of the diaphragm. Below they remain separate and are gradually lost in the subperitoneal fascia of the iliac fossa. The renal fascia is connected to the fibrous tunic of the kidney by numerous trabriculi, which traverse the adipose capsule and are strongest near the lower end of the organ. Behind the fascia renalis, is a considerable quantity of fat, which constitutes the paranephric body. The kidney is held in position partly through the attachment of the renal fascia and partly by the apposition of the neighboring viscera. General structure of the kidney. The kidney is invested by a fibrous tunic, which forms a firm, smooth covering to the organ. The tunic can easily be stripped off, but in doing so, numerous fine processes of connective tissue and small blood vessels are torn through. Beneath this coat, a thin, wide-meshed network of unstriped muscular fiber forms an incomplete covering to the organ. When the capsule is stripped off, the surface of the kidney is found to be smooth and even and of a deep red color. In infants, fissures extending for some depth may be seen on the surface of the organ, a remnant of the lobular construction of the gland. The kidney is dense in texture, but is easily lacerable by mechanical force. If a vertical section of the kidney be made from its convex to its concave border, it will be seen that the hilum expands into a central cavity, the renal sinus. This contains the upper part of the renal pelvis and the calluses, surrounded by some fat, in which are embedded the branches of the renal vessels and nerves. 
the renal sinus is lined by a prolongation of the fibrous tunic, which is continued around the lips of the hilum. The renal calyces, from seven to thirteen in number, are cup-shaped tubes, each of which embraces one or more of the renal papillae. They unite to form two or three short tubes, and these in turn join to form a funnel-shaped sac, the renal pelvis. The renal pelvis, wide above and narrow below where it joins the ureter, is partly outside the renal sinus. The renal calyces and pelvis form the upper expanded end of the excretory duct of the kidney. The kidney is composed of an internal medullary and an external cortical substance. The medullary substance, substantia medullaris, consists of a series of red-colored striated conical masses, termed the renal pyramids, the bases of which are directed toward the circumference of the kidney, while their apices converge toward the renal sinus, where they form prominent papillae projecting into the interior of the calyces. The cortical substance, substantia corticalis, is reddish-brown in color and soft and granular in consistence. It lies immediately beneath the fibrous tunic, arches over the basis of the pyramids, and dips in between adjacent pyramids toward the renal sinus. The parts dipping in between the pyramids are named the renal columns, Bertini, while the portions which connect the renal columns to each other and intervene between the bases of the pyramids and the fibrous tunic are called the cortical arches. If the cortex be examined with a lens, it will be seen to consist of a series of lighter-colored conical areas, termed the radiate part, and a darker-colored intervening substance, which from the complexity of its structure is named the convoluted part. The rays gradually taper toward the circumference of the kidney, and consist of a series of outward prolongations from the base of each renal pyramid. End of section 28《セクション・ e ゥ・ e ィ・ナイ・オブ・グレイズ・アナトミー・パート・ファイブ・ディス・イズ・エイ・リブロヴォックス・レコーディング・オール・リブロヴォックス・レコーディングズ・アイン・ザ・パブリック・ドメイン・フォー・モー・インフォメーション・オー・トゥ・ヴォランティア・プリーズ・ヴィジット・リブロヴォックス・ドット・オーグ・アナトミー・オブ・ザ・ヒューマン・バディ・パート・ファイブ・バイ・ヘンリー・グレイ・ザ・キッニーズ・パート・ゥ・マイ・ヌート・アナトミー・ザ・レノル・トゥ・ビュー・ズ・オブ・ウィッチ・ザ・キッニー・イズ・フォー・ザ・モス・パート・メイド・アップ・コメンス・イン・ザ・コーティカル・サブスタンス・and after pursuing a very circuitous course through the cortical and medullary substances, finally end up at the apices of the renal pyramids by open mouths, so that the fluid which they contain is emptied through the calluses into the pelvis of the kidney. If the surface of one of the papillae be examined with a lens, it will be seen to be studded over with minute openings, the orifices of the renal tubules, from sixteen to twenty in number, and if pressure be made on a fresh kidney, urine will be seen to exude from these orifices. The tubules commence in the convoluted part and renal columns as the renal corpuscles, which are small, rounded masses of a deep red color, varying in size, but of an average of about 0.2 millimeters in diameter. Each of these little bodies is composed of two parts, a central glomerulus of vessels and a membranous envelope, the glomerular capsule, capsule of Bowman, which is the small, pouch-like commencement of a renal tubule. The glomerulus is a lobulated network of convoluted capillary blood vessels, held together by scanty connective tissue. This capillary network is derived from a small arterial twig, the afferent vessel, which enters the capsule, generally at a point opposite to that at which the latter is connected with the tubule, and the resulting vein, the efferent vessel, emerges from the capsule at the same point. The afferent vessel is usually the larger of the two. The glomerular, or Bowman's capsule, which surrounds the glomerulus, consists of a basement membrane, lined on its inner surface by a layer of flattened epithelial cells, which are reflected from the lining membrane onto the glomerulus, at the point of entrance or exit of the afferent and efferent vessels. The whole surface of the glomerulus is covered with a continuous layer of the same cells, on a delicate supporting membrane. Thus, between the glomerulus and the capsule, a space is left, forming a cavity lined by a continuous layer of squamous cells. This cavity varies in size according to the state of secretion and the amount of fluid present in it. In the fetus and young subject, the lining epithelial cells are polyhedral or even columnar. The renal tubules, commencing in the renal corpuscles, present during their course many changes in shape and direction and are contained partly in the medullary and partly in the cortical substance. 
At their junction with the glomerular capsule, they exhibit a somewhat constricted portion, which is termed the neck. Beyond this, the tubule becomes convoluted, and pursues a considerable course in the cortical substance, constituting the proximal convoluted tube. After a time, the convolutions disappear, and the tube approaches the medullary substance in a more or less spiral manner. This section of the tubule has been called the spiral tube. Throughout this portion of their course, the renal tubules are contained entirely in the cortical substance, and present a fairly uniform caliber. They now enter the medullary substance, suddenly become much smaller, quite straight in direction, and dip down for a variable depth into the pyramids, constituting the descending limb of Henley's loop. Bending on themselves, they form what is termed the loop of Henley, and reascending, they become suddenly enlarged, forming the ascending limb of Henley's loop, and re-enter the cortical substance. This portion of the tubule ascends for a short distance, when it again becomes dilated, irregular, and angular. This section is termed the zigzag tubule. It ends in a convoluted tube, which resembles the proximal convoluted tubule, and is called the distal convoluted tubule. This again terminates in a narrow junctional tube, which enters the straight or collecting tube. The straight or collecting tubes commence in the radiate part of the cortex, where they receive the curved ends of the distal convoluted tubules. They unite at short intervals with one another, the resulting tubes presenting a considerable increase in caliber, so that a series of comparatively large tubes passes from the bases of the rays into the renal pyramids. In the medulla, the tubes of each pyramid converge to join a central tube, duct of Bellini, which finally opens on the summit of one of the papillae. The contents of the tube are therefore discharged into one of the calluses. Structure of the renal tubules The renal tubules consist of a basement membrane lined with epithelium. The epithelium varies considerably in different sections of the tubule. In the neck, the epithelium is continuous with that lining the glomerular capsule, and like it consists of flattened cells, each containing an oval nucleus. The two convoluted tubules, the spiral and zigzag tubules, and the ascending limb of Henley's loop, are lined by a type of epithelium which is histologically the same in all. The cells are somewhat columnar in shape, and dovetail into one another of their lateral aspect. Each has a striated border near the lumen of the tube. Its inner part is granular, and its outer portion vertically striated. The nucleus is spherical and situated about the center of the cell. In the descending limb of Henley's loop, the epithelium resembles that found in the glomerular capsule, and the commencement of the tube, consisting of flat, clear epithelial plates, each with an oval nucleus. The nuclei alternate on opposite sides of the tubule, so that the lumen remains fairly constant. In the straight tube, the epithelium is clear and cubical. In its papillary portion, the cells are distinctly columnar and transparent. The Renal Blood Vessels the kidney is plentifully supplied with blood by the renal artery, a large branch of the abdominal aorta. Before it enters the kidney, each artery divides into four or five branches, which at the hilum lie mainly between the renal vein and ureter, the vein being in front, the ureter behind. One branch usually lies behind the ureter. Each vessel gives off some small branches to the suprarenal glands, to the ureter, and to the surrounding cellular tissue and muscles. Frequently, a second renal artery, termed the inferior renal, is given off from the abdominal aorta at a lower level, and supplies the lower portion of the kidney, while occasionally an additional artery enters the upper part of the kidney. The branches of the renal artery, while in the sinus, give off a few twigs for the nutrition of the surrounding tissues, and end in the arteriae propriae renales, which enter the kidney proper in the renal columns. Two of these pass to each renal pyramid and run along its sides for its entire length, giving off in their course the afferent vessels of the renal corpuscles in the renal columns. Having arrived at the bases of the pyramids, they form arterial arches or arcades which lie in the boundary zone between the bases of the pyramids and the cortical arches, and break up into two distinct sets of branches devoted to the supply of the remaining portions of the kidney. The first set, the interlobular arteries, are given off at right angles from the side of the arterial arcade looking toward the cortical substance, and pass directly outward between the medullary rays to reach the fibrous tunic, where they end in the capillary network of this part. 
These vessels do not anastomose with each other, but form what are called end arteries. In their outward course they give off lateral branches. These are the afferent vessels for the renal corpuscles. They enter the capsule and end in the glomerulus. From each tuft the corresponding efferent vessel arises, and having made its egress from the capsule, near to the point where the afferent vessel enters, breaks up into a number of branches, which form a dense plexus around the adjacent urinary tubes. The second set of branches from the arterial arcades supply the renal pyramids, which they enter at their bases, and passing straight through their substance to their apices, terminate in the venous plexuses found in that situation. They are called the arteriae recti. The efferent vessels from the glomeruli nearest the medulla break up into leashes of straight vessels, false arteriae recti, which pass down into the medulla and join the plexus of vessels there. The renal veins arise from three sources, namely, the veins beneath the fibrous tunic, the plexuses around the convoluted tubules in the cortex, and the plexuses situated at the apices of the renal pyramids. The veins beneath the fibrous tunic, veni stellati, are stellate in arrangement, and are derived from the capillary network, into which the terminal branches of the interlobular arteries break up. These join to form the interlobular veins, which pass inward between the rays, receive branches from the plexuses around the convoluted tubules, and having arrived at the bases of the renal pyramids, join with the veni recti, next to be described. The veni recti are branches from the plexuses at the apices of the medullary pyramids, formed by the terminations of the arteriae recti. They run outward in a straight course between the tubes of the medullary substance, and joining, as above stated, the interlobular veins, form venous arcades. These in turn unite and form veins, which pass along the sides of the pyramids. These vessels, veni proprii renales, accompany the arteries of the same name, running along the entire length of the sides of the pyramids, and quit the kidney substance to enter the sinus. In this cavity they join the corresponding veins from the other pyramids to form the renal vein, which emerges from the kidney at the hilum and opens into the inferior vena cava. The left vein is longer than the right, and crosses in front of the abdominal aorta. The lymphatics of the kidney are described on page 712. Nerves of the kidney the nerves of the kidney, although small, are about fifteen in number. They have small ganglia developed upon them, and are derived from the renal plexus, which is formed by branches from the celiac plexus, the lower and outer part of the celiac ganglion and aortic plexus, and from the lesser and lowest splanchnic nerves. They communicate with the spermatic plexus, a circumstance which may explain the occurrence of pain in the testes and affections of the kidney. They accompany the renal artery and its branches, and are distributed to the blood vessels and to the cells of the urinary tubules. Connective Tissue Intertubular Stroma Although the tubules and vessels are closely packed, a small amount of connective tissue, continuous with the fibrous tunic, binds them firmly together and supports the blood vessels, lymphatics, and nerves. Variations Malformations of the kidney are not uncommon. There may be an entire absence of one kidney, but according to Morris, the number of these cases is excessively small. Or there may be congenital atrophy of one kidney, when the kidney is very small, but usually healthy in structure. These cases are of great importance, and must be duly taken into account when nephrectomy is contemplated. A more common malformation is where the two kidneys are fused together. They may be joined together only at their lower ends by means of a thick mass of renal tissue, so as to form a horseshoe-shaped body, or they may be completely united, forming a disc-like kidney, from which two ureters descend into the bladder. These fused kidneys are generally situated in the middle line of the abdomen, but may be displaced as well. In some mammals, for example ox and bear, the kidney consists of a number of distinct lobules. This lobulated condition is characteristic of the kidney of the human fetus, and traces of it may persist in the adult. Sometimes the pelvis is duplicated, while a double ureter is not uncommon. In some rare instances, a third kidney may be present. One or both kidneys may be misplaced as a congenital condition, and remain fixed in this abnormal position. They are then very often misshapen. They may be situated higher, though this is very uncommon, or lower than normal, 
or removed farther from the vertebral column than usual, or they may be displaced into the iliac fossa, over the sacroiliac joint, onto the promontory of the sacrum, or into the pelvis between the rectum and bladder, or by the side of the uterus. In these latter cases they may give rise to very serious trouble. The kidney may also be misplaced as a congenital condition, but may not be fixed. It is then known as a floating kidney. It is believed to be due to the fact that the kidney is completely enveloped by peritoneum, which then passes backward into the vertebral column as a double layer, forming a mesonephron which permits movement. The kidney may also be misplaced as an acquired condition. In these cases the kidney is mobile in the tissues by which it is surrounded, moving with the capsule in the perinephric tissues. This condition is known as movable kidney, and is more common in the female than in the male. It occurs in badly nourished people, or in those who have become emaciated from any cause. It must not be confounded with the floating kidney, which is a congenital condition due to the development of a mesonephron. The two conditions cannot, however, be distinguished until the abdomen is opened or the kidney explored from the loin. End of section 29「Gray's Anatomy」Part 5 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett Anatomy of the Human Body Part 5 by Henry Gray The Ureters 3b2 the ureters. The ureters are the two tubes which convey the urine from the kidneys to the urinary bladder. Each commences within the sinus of the corresponding kidney as a number of short cup-shaped tubes termed calyces, which encircle the renal papillae. Since a single calyx may enclose more than one papilla, the calyces are generally fewer in number than the pyramids the former varying from 7 to 13, the latter from 8 to 18. The calyces join to form two or three short tubes, and these unite to form a funnel-shaped dilatation, wide above and narrow below, named the renal pelvis, which is situated partly inside and partly outside the renal sinus. It is usually placed on a level with the spinous process of the first lumbar vertebra. The ureter proper measures from 25 to 30 centimeters in length and is a thick-walled, narrow, cylindrical tube which is directly continuous near the lower end of the kidney with the tapering extremity of the renal pelvis. It runs downward and medialward in front of the psoas major and, entering the pelvic cavity, finally opens into the fundus of the bladder. The abdominal part pars abdominalis, lies behind the peritoneum on the medial part of the psoas major, and is crossed obliquely by the internal spermatic vessels. It enters the pelvic cavity by crossing either the termination of the common or the commencement of the external iliac vessels. At its origin, the right ureter is usually covered by the descending part of the duodenum and in its course downward lies to the right of the inferior vena cava, and is crossed by the right colic and iliocolic vessels, while near the superior aperture of the pelvis it passes behind the lower part of the mesentery and the terminal part of the ilium. The left ureter is crossed by the left colic vessels, and near the superior aperture of the pelvis passes behind the sigmoid colon and its mesentery. The pelvic part, pars pelvina, runs at first downward on the lateral wall of the pelvic cavity, along the anterior border of the greater sciatic notch, and under cover of the peritoneum. It lies in front of the hypogastric artery medial to the obturator nerve, and the umbilical, obturator, inferior vesicle, and middle hemorrhoidal arteries. Opposite the lower part of the greater sciatic foramen, it inclines medialward, and reaches the lateral angle of the bladder, where it is situated in front of the upper end of the seminal vesicle, 
and at a distance of about five centimeters from the opposite ureter. Here the ductus deferens crosses to its medial side, and the vesicle veins surround it. Finally, the ureter is run obliquely for about two centimeters through the wall of the bladder, and opened by slit-like apertures into the cavity of the viscous at the lateral angles of the trigone. When the bladder is distended, the openings of the ureters are about five centimeters apart, but when it is empty and contracted, the distance between them is diminished by one half. Owing to their oblique course through the coats of the bladder, the upper and lower walls of the terminal portions of the ureters become closely applied to each other when the viscous is descended, and, acting as valves, prevent regurgitation of urine from the bladder. In the female, the ureter forms, as it lies in relation to the wall of the pelvis, the posterior boundary of a shallow depression named the ovarian fossa, in which the ovary is situated. It then runs medialward and forward on the lateral aspect of the cervix uteri and upper part of the vagina to reach the fundus of the bladder. In this part of its course it is accompanied for about 2.5 centimeters by the uterine artery, which then crosses in front of the ureter and ascends between the two layers of the broad ligament. The ureter is distant about 2 centimeters from the side of the cervix of the uterus. The ureter is sometimes duplicated on one or both sides, and the two tubes may remain distinct as far as the fundus of the bladder. On rare occasions they open separately into the bladder cavity. Structure The ureter is composed of three coats, fibrous, muscular, and mucous coats. The fibrous coat, tunica adventitia, is continuous at one end with the fibrous tunic of the kidney on the floor of the sinus, while at the other it is lost in the fibrous structure of the bladder. In the renal pelvis, the muscular coat, tunica muscularis, consists of two layers, longitudinal and circular. The longitudinal fibers become lost upon the sides of the papillae at the extremities of the calyces. The circular fibers may be traced surrounding the medullary substance in the same situation. In the ureter proper, the muscular fibers are very distinct, and are arranged in three layers, an external longitudinal, a middle circular, and an internal less distinct than the other two, but having a general longitudinal direction. According to Collicker, this internal layer is found only in the neighborhood of the bladder. The mucous coat, tunica mucosa, is smooth and presents a few longitudinal folds which become effaced by distension. It is continuous with the mucous membrane of the bladder below, while it is prolonged over the papillae of the kidney above. Its epithelium is of a transitional character and resembles that found in the bladder. It consists of several layers of cells, of which the innermost, that is to say, the cells in contact with the urine, are somewhat flattened, with concavities on their deep surfaces, into which the rounded ends of the cells of the second layer fit. These, the intermediate cells, more or less resemble columnar epithelium, and are pear-shaped, with rounded internal extremities, which fit into the concavities of the cells of the first layer, and narrow external extremities which are wedged in between the cells of the third layer. The external or third layer consists of conical or oval cells varying in number in different parts, and presenting processes which extend down into the basement membrane. Beneath the epithelium, and separating it from the muscular coats, is a dense layer of fibrous tissue containing many elastic fibers. Vessels and Nerves The arteries supplying the ureter are branches from the renal, internal spermatic, hypogastric, and inferior vesicle. The nerves are derived from the inferior mesenteric, spermatic, and pelvic plexuses. Variations The upper portion of the ureter is sometimes double, more rarely it is double the greater part of its extent, or even completely so. In such cases there are two openings into the bladder. Asymmetry in these variations is common. 
End of section 30. Recording by Leanne Howlett. Section 31 of Grey's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corrie Samuel. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Grey. The Urinary Bladder. Vesica Urinaria, Bladder. The urinary bladder is a muscular membranous sac, which acts as a reservoir for the urine, and as its size, position, and relations vary, according to the amount of fluid it contains, it is necessary to study it as it appears a when empty, and b when distended. In both conditions, the position of the bladder varies with the condition of the rectum, being pushed upward and forward when the rectum is distended. THE EMPTY BLADDER When hardened in situ, the empty bladder has the form of a flattened tetrahedron, with its vertex tilted forward. It presents a fundus, a vertex, a superior and an inferior surface. The fundus is triangular in shape, and is directed downward and backward toward the rectum, from which it is separated by the rectovesical fascia, the vesiculi seminales, and the terminal portions of the ductus deferentes. The vertex is directed forward, toward the upper part of the symphysis pubis, and from it the middle umbilical ligament is continued upward, on the back of the anterior abdominal wall, to the umbilicus. The peritoneum is carried by it from the vertex of the bladder, on to the abdominal wall, to form the middle umbilical fold. The superior surface is triangular, bounded on either side by a lateral border, which separates it from the inferior surface, and behind by a posterior border, represented by a line joining the two ureters, which intervenes between it and the fundus. The lateral borders extend from the ureters to the vertex, and from them the peritoneum is carried to the walls of the pelvis. On either side of the bladder, the peritoneum shows a depression, named the paravesical fossa, the superior surface is directed upward, is covered by peritoneum, and is in relation with the sigmoid colon, and some of the coils of the small intestine. When the bladder is empty, and firmly contracted, this surface is convex and the lateral and posterior borders are rounded, whereas if the bladder be relaxed it is concave, and the interior of the viscous, as seen in a median sagittal section, presents the appearance of a V-shaped slit, with a shorter posterior, and a longer anterior limb, the apex of the V corresponding with the internal orifice of the urethra. The inferior surface is directed downward, and is uncovered by peritoneum. It may be divided into a posterior, or prostatic area, and two inferolateral surfaces. The prostatic area is somewhat triangular. It rests upon, and is in direct continuity with, the base of the prostate and from it the urethra emerges. The infrolateral portions of the inferior surface are directed downward and lateralward. In front, they are separated from the symphysis pubis by a mass of fatty tissue, which is named the retropubic pad. Behind, they are in contact with the fascia, which covers the levatoris ani and obturatoris interni. When the bladder is empty, it is placed entirely within the pelvis, below the level of the obliterated hypogastric arteries, and below the level of those portions of the ductus deferentes which are in contact with the lateral wall of the pelvis. After they cross the ureters, the ductus deferentes come into contact with the fundus of the bladder. As the viscous fills, its fundus, being more or less fixed, is only slightly depressed, while its superior surface gradually rises into the abdominal cavity, carrying with it its peritoneal covering and, at the same time, rounding off the posterior and lateral borders. THE DISTENDED BLADDER When the bladder is moderately full, it contains about 0.5 litres, and assumes an oval form. The long diameter of the oval measures about 12 centimetres, and is directed upward and forward. In this condition it presents a posterior superior, 
an antero inferior, and two lateral surfaces, a fundus and a summit. The postero superior surface is directed upward and backward, and is covered by peritoneum. Behind it is separated from the rectum by the rectovesical excavation, while its anterior part is in contact with the coils of the small intestine. The antero inferior surface is devoid of peritoneum, and rests below, against the pubic bones, above which it is in contact with the back of the anterior abdominal wall. The lower parts of the lateral surfaces are destitute of peritoneum, and are in contact with the lateral walls of the pelvis. The line of peritoneal reflection from the lateral surface is raised to the level of the obliterated hypogastric artery. The fundus undergoes little alteration in position, being only slightly lowered. It exhibits, however, a narrow triangular area, which is separated from the rectum merely by the rectovesical fascia. This area is bounded below by the prostate, above by the rectovesical fold of peritoneum, and laterally by the ductus deferentes. The ductus deferentes frequently come into contact with each other above the prostate, and under such circumstances the lower part of the triangular area is obliterated. The line of reflection of the peritoneum from the rectum to the bladder appears to undergo little or no change when the latter is distended. It is situated about ten centimetres from the anus. The summit is directed upward and forward, above the point of attachment of the middle umbilical ligament, and hence the peritoneum which follows the ligament forms a pouch of varying depth between the summit of the bladder and the anterior abdominal wall. The Bladder in the Child In the newborn child, the internal urethral orifice is at the level of the upper border of the symphysis pubis. The bladder, therefore, lies relatively at a much higher level in the infant than in the adult. Its anterior surface is, in contact with about the lower two-thirds of that part of the abdominal wall which lies between the symphysis pubis and the umbilicus. Symington. Its fundus is clothed with peritoneum as far as the level of the internal orifice of the urethra. Although the bladder of the infant is usually described as an abdominal organ, Symington has pointed out that only about one half of it lies above the plane of the superior aperture of the pelvis. Dis maintains that the internal urethral orifice sinks rapidly during the first years, and then more slowly until the ninth year, after which it remains stationary until puberty, when it again slowly descends and reaches its adult position. THE FEMALE BLADDER In the female, the bladder is in relation behind with the uterus and the upper part of the vagina. It is separated from the anterior surface of the body of the uterus by the vesicuterine excavation, but below the level of this excavation it is connected to the front of the cervix uteri, and the upper part of the anterior wall of the vagina by areolar tissue. When the bladder is empty, the uterus rests upon its superior surface. The female bladder is said by some to be more capacious than that of the male, but probably the opposite is the case. Ligaments The bladder is connected to the pelvic wall by the fascia endopelvina. In front, this fascial attachment is strengthened by a few muscular fibres, the pubovesicales, which extend from the back of the pubic bones to the front of the bladder. Behind, other muscular fibres run from the fundus of the bladder to the sides of the rectum, in the sacrogenital folds, and constitute the rectovesicales. The vertex of the bladder is joined to the umbilicus by the remains of the urachus, which forms the middle umbilical ligament, a fibromuscular cord, broad at its attachment to the bladder, but narrowing as it ascends. From the superior surface of the bladder, the peritoneum is carried off in a series of folds, which are sometimes termed the false ligaments of the bladder. Anteriorly, there are three folds, the middle umbilical fold on the middle umbilical ligament, and two lateral umbilical folds on the obliterated hypogastric arteries. The reflections of the peritoneum onto the side walls of the pelvis form the lateral false ligaments, while the sacrogenital folds constitute posterior false ligaments. 
Interior of the bladder The mucous membrane lining the bladder is, over the greater part of the viscous, loosely attached to the muscular coat, and appears wrinkled or folded when the bladder is contracted. In the distended condition of the bladder, the folds are effaced. Over a small triangular area, termed the trigonum vesici, immediately above and behind the internal orifice of the urethra, the mucous membrane is firmly bound to the muscular coat, and is always smooth. The anterior angle of the trigonum vesici is formed by the internal orifice of the urethra, its posterolateral angles by the orifices of the ureters. Stretching behind the latter openings is a slightly curved ridge, the torus ureterocus, forming the base of the trigon, and produced by an underlying bundle of non-striped muscular fibres. The lateral parts of this ridge extend beyond the openings of the ureters, and are named the pleaky ureterici. They are produced by the terminal portions of the ureters, as they traverse obliquely the bladder wall. When the bladder is illuminated, the torus ureterocus appears as a pale band, and forms an important guide during the operation of introducing a catheter into the ureta. The orifices of the ureters are placed at the posterolateral angles of the trigonum vesici, and are usually slit-like in form. In the contracted bladder they are about 2.5 cm apart, and about the same distance from the internal urethral orifice. In the distended viscous these measurements may be increased to about 5 cm. The internal urethral orifice is placed at the apex of the trigonum vesici, in the most dependent part of the bladder, and is usually somewhat crescentic in form. The mucous membrane immediately behind it presents a slight elevation, the uvula vesici, caused by the middle lobe of the prostate. Structure The bladder is composed of the four coats, serous, muscular, submucous, and mucous coats. The serous coat, tunica serosa, is a partial one, and is derived from the peritoneum. It invests the superior surface and the upper parts of the lateral surfaces, and is reflected from these onto the abdominal and pelvic walls. The muscular coat, tunica muscularis, consists of three layers of unstriped muscular fibres, an external layer, composed of fibres having for the most part a longitudinal arrangement, a middle layer, in which the fibres are arranged more or less in a circular manner, and an internal layer, in which the fibres have a general longitudinal arrangement. The fibres of the external layer arise from the posterior surface of the body of the pubis in both sexes, musculi puba vesicales, and in the male from the adjacent part of the prostate and its capsule. They pass, in a more or less longitudinal manner, up the inferior surface of the bladder, over its vertex, and then descend along its fundus, to become attached to the prostate in the male, and to the front of the vagina in the female. At the sides of the bladder the fibres are arranged obliquely and intersect one another. This layer has been named the detrusor urinary muscle. The fibres of the middle circular layer are very thinly and irregularly scattered on the body of the organ, and, although to some extent placed transversely to the long axis of the bladder, are for the most part arranged obliquely. Toward the lower part of the bladder, around the internal urethral orifice, they are disposed in a thick circular layer, forming the sphincter vesici, which is continuous with the muscular fibres of the prostate. The internal longitudinal layer is thin, and its fasciculi have a reticular arrangement, but with a tendency to assume for the most part a longitudinal direction. Two bands of oblique fibres, originating behind the orifices of the ureters, converge to the back part of the prostate, and are inserted by means of a fibrous process into the middle lobe of that organ. They are the muscles of the ureters. Described by Sir C. Bell, who supposed that during the contraction of the bladder they serve to retain the oblique direction of the ureters, and so prevent the reflux of the urine into them. The submucous coat, tela submucosa, consists of a layer of areola tissue, connecting together the muscular and mucous coats, and intimately united to the latter. 
The mucus coat, tunica mucosa, is thin, smooth, and of a pale rose colour. It is continuous above through the ureters with the lining membrane of the renal tubules, and below with that of the urethra. The loose texture of the submucous layer allows the mucous coat to be thrown into folds or rugi when the bladder is empty. Over the trigonum vesici, the mucous membrane is closely attached to the muscular coat and is not thrown into folds, but is smooth and flat. The epithelium covering it is of the transitional variety, consisting of a superficial layer of polyhedral flattened cells, each with one, two, or three nuclei. Beneath these is a stratum of large club-shaped cells, with their narrow extremities directed downward and wedged in between smaller spindle-shaped cells containing oval nuclei. The epithelium varies according as the bladder is distended or contracted. In the former condition, the superficial cells are flattened, and those of the other layers are shortened. In the latter, they present the appearance described above. There are no true glands in the mucous membrane of the bladder, though certain mucous follicles which exist, especially near the neck of the bladder, have been regarded as such. Vessels and Nerves The arteries supplying the bladder are the superior, middle and inferior vesicle, derived from the anterior trunk of the hypogastric. The obturator and inferior gluteal arteries also supply small visceral branches to the bladder, and in the female additional branches are derived from the uterine and vaginal arteries. The veins form a complicated plexus on the inferior surface and fundus near the prostate, and end in the hypogastric veins. The lymphatics are described in Part 3 of Gray's Anatomy, Section 49. The nerves of the bladder are 1. Fine medulated fibres from the third and fourth sacral nerves, and 2. Non-medulated fibres from the hypogastric plexus. They are connected with ganglia in the outer and submucous coats, and are finally distributed, all as non-medulated fibres, to the muscular layer and epithelial lining of the viscous. Abnormalities A defect of development in which the bladder is implicated is known under the name of extraversion of the bladder. In this condition, the lower part of the abdominal wall and the anterior wall of the bladder are wanting, so that the fundus of the bladder presents on the abdominal surface and is pushed forward by the pressure of the viscera within the abdomen, forming a red vascular tumour on which the openings of the ureters are visible. The penis, except the glands, is rudimentary, and is cleft on its dorsal surface, exposing the floor of the urethra, a condition known as epispadius. The pelvic bones are also arrested in development. End of section 31 Section 32 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bologna Times. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. The Male Urethra, The Female Urethra. The Male Urethra, Urethra Virilis. The male urethra extends from the internal urethral orifice in the urinary bladder to the external urethral orifice at the end of the penis. It presents a double curve in the ordinary relaxed state of the penis. Its length varies from 17.5 to 20 centimeters, and it is divided into three portions, the prostatic, membranous, and cavernous the structure and relations of which are essentially different. Except during the passage of the urine or semen, the greater part of the urethral canal is a mere transverse cleft or slit, with its upper and under surfaces in contact. At the external orifice the slit is vertical. 
in the membranous portion irregular or stellate, and in the prostatic portion somewhat arched. The prostatic portion, pars prostatica, the widest and most dilatable part of the canal, is about three centimeters long. It runs almost vertically through the prostate from its base to its apex, lying nearer its anterior than its posterior surface. The form of the canal is spindle-shaped, being wider in the middle than at either extremity, and narrowest below, where it joins the membranous portion. A transverse section of the canal, as it lies in the prostate, is horseshoe-shaped, with the convexity directed forward. Upon the posterior wall, or floor, is a narrow longitudinal ridge. The urethral crest, veromontanum, formed by an elevation of the mucous membrane and its subjacent tissue. It is from 15 to 17 millimeters in length, and about 3 millimeters in height, and contains, according to Cobalt, muscular and erectile tissue. When distended, it may serve to prevent the passage of the semen backward into the bladder. On either side of the crest is a slightly depressed fossa, the prostatic sinus, the floor of which is perforated by numerous apertures. The orifices of the prostatic ducts from the lateral lobes of the prostate. The ducts of the middle lobe open behind the crest. At the forepart of the urethral crest, below its summit, is a median elevation, the colliculus seminalis, upon or within the margins of which are the orifices of the prostatic utricle and the slit-like openings of the ejaculatory ducts. The prostatic utricle, sinus pocularis, forms a cul-de-sac about six millimeters long, which runs upward and backward in the substance of the prostate behind the middle lobe. Its walls are composed of fibrous tissue, muscular fibers, and mucous membrane, and numerous small glands open on its inner surface. It was called by Weber the uterus masculinus, from its being developed from the united lower ends of the atrophied Mullerian ducts, and therefore homologous with the uterus and vagina in the female. The membranous portion, pars membranacea, is the shortest, least dilatable, and, with the exception of the external orifice, the narrowest part of the canal. It extends downward and forward, with a slight anterior concavity, between the apex of the prostate and the bulb of the urethra, perforating the urogenital diaphragm about 2.5 centimeters below and behind the pubic symphysis. The hinder part of the urethral bulb lies in apposition with the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm, but its upper portion diverges somewhat from this fascia. The anterior wall of the membranous urethra is thus prolonged for a short distance in front of the urogenital diaphragm. It measures about two centimeters in length, while the posterior wall, which is between the two fasciae of the diaphragm, is only 1.25 centimeters long. The membranous portion of the urethra is completely surrounded by the fibers of the sphincter urethrae membranaceae. In front of it, the deep dorsal vein of the penis enters the pelvis between the transverse ligament of the pelvis and the arcuate pubic ligament. On either side near its termination are the bulbal urethral glands. The cavernous portion, pars cavernosa, penile or spongy portion, is the longest part of the urethra and is contained in the corpus cavernosum urethra. It is about 15 centimeters long and extends from the termination of the membranous portion to the external urethral orifice. Commencing below the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm, it passes forward and upward to the front of the symphysis pubis, and then, in the flaccid condition of the penis, it bends downward and forward. It is narrow and of uniform size in the body of the penis, 
measuring about six millimeters in diameter. It is dilated behind, within the bulb, and again anteriorly within the glans penis, where it forms the fossa navicularis urethra. The external urethral orifice, orificium urethrae, externum, medis urinarius, is the most contracted part of the urethra. It is a vertical slit, about six millimeters long, bounded on either side by two small labia. The lining membrane of the urethra, especially on the floor of the cavernous portion, presents the orifices of numerous mucous glands and follicles situated in the submucous tissue, and named the urethral glands, litrae. Besides these are a number of small pit-like recesses, or lacunae, of varying sizes. Their orifices are directed forward, so that they may easily intercept the point of a catheter in its passage along the canal. One of these lacunae, larger than the rest, is situated on the upper surface of the fossus navicularis. It is called the lacuna magna. The bulbal urethral glands open into the cavernous portion about 2.5 centimeters in front of the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm. Structure The urethra is composed of mucous membrane supported by a submucous tissue which connects it with the various structures through which it passes. The mucous coat forms part of the genitourinary mucous membrane it is continuous with the mucous membrane of the bladder, ureters, and kidneys. Externally, with the integument covering the glans penis, and is prolonged into the ducts of the glands which open into the urethra, viz., the bulbal urethral glands and the prostate, and into the ductus deferentes and vesculae seminales, through the ejaculatory ducts. In the cavernous and membranous portions, the mucous membrane is arranged in longitudinal folds when the tube is empty. Small papillae are found upon it, near the external urethral orifice. Its epithelial lining is of the columnar variety, except near the external orifice, where it is squamous and stratified. The submucous tissue consists of a vascular erectile layer. Outside this is a layer of unstriped muscular fibers, arranged in a circular direction, which separates the mucous membrane and submucous tissue from the tissue of the corpus cavernosum urethrae. Congenital defects of the urethra occur occasionally. The one most frequently met with is where there is a cleft on the floor of the urethra owing to an arrest of union in the middle line. This is known as hypospadias, and the cleft may vary in extent. The simplest and by far the most common form is where the deficiency is confined to the glans penis. The urethra ends at the point where the extremity of the prepuce joins the body of the penis in a small valve-like opening. The prepuce is also cleft on its under surface and forms a sort of hood over the glands. There is a depression on the glands in the position of the normal metis. This condition produces no disability and requires no treatment. In more severe cases, the cavernous portion of the urethra is cleft throughout its entire length, and the opening of the urethra is at the point of junction of the penis and scrotum. The under surface of the penis, in the middle line, presents a furrow lined by a moist mucous membrane, on either side of which is often more or less dense fibrous tissue stretching from the glands to the opening of the urethra, which prevents complete erection taking place. Great discomfort is induced during mixturition, and sexual connection is impossible. The condition may be remedied by a series of plastic operations. The worst form of this condition is where the urethra is deficient as far back as the perineum, and the scrotum is cleft. The penis is small and bound down between the two halves of the scrotum, so as to resemble a hypertrophied clitoris. The testes are often retained. 
the condition of parts therefore very much resembles the external organs of generation of the female and many children the victims of this malformation have been brought up as girls the halves of the scrotum deficient of testes resemble the labia the cleft between them looks like the orifice of the vagina and the diminutive penis is taken for an enlarged clitoris there is no remedy for this condition a much more uncommon form of malformation is where there is an apparent deficiency of the upper wall of the urethra this is named epispadias the deficiency may vary in extent when it is complete the condition is associated with extraversion of the bladder in less extensive cases where there is no extraversion there is an infundibuliform opening into the bladder the penis is usually dwarfed and turned upward so that the glands lies over the opening congenital stricture is also occasionally met with and in such cases multiple strictures may be present throughout the whole length of the cavernous portion the female urethra urethra mulibris the female urethra is a narrow membranous canal about four centimeters long extending from the internal to the external urethral orifice it is placed behind the symphysis pubis embedded in the anterior wall of the vagina and its direction is obliquely downward and forward it is slightly curved with the concavity directed forward its diameter when undilated is about six millimeters it perforates the fascia of the urogenital diaphragm and its external orifice is situated directly in front of the vaginal opening and about two point five centimeters behind the glans clitoridis the lining membrane is thrown into longitudinal folds one of which placed along the floor of the canal is termed the urethral crest many small urethral glands open into the urethra structure the urethra consists of three coats muscular erectile and mucus the muscular coat is continuous with that of the bladder it extends the whole length of the tube and consists of circular fibers in addition to this between the superior and inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm the female urethra is surrounded by the sphincter urethrae membranicae as in the male a thin layer of spongy erectile tissue containing a plexus of large veins intermixed with bundles of unstriped muscular fibers lies immediately beneath the mucous coat the mucous coat is pale it is continuous externally with that of the vulva and internally with that of the bladder it is lined by stratified squamous epithelium which becomes transitional near the bladder its external orifice is surrounded by a few mucous follicles End of Section 32。Section 33 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dr. Valerie Ross. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part Five by Henry Gray, the male genital organs, Organa genitalia virilia. The male genitals include the testes, the ductus deferentes, the vesiculi seminalis, the ejaculatory ducts, and the penis, together with the following accessory structures, namely the prostate and the bulbourethral glands. The testes and their coverings. The testes are two glandular organs which secrete the semen. They are suspended in the scrotum by the spermatic cords. At an early period of fetal life, the testes are contained in the abdominal cavity behind the peritoneum. Before birth, they descend to the inguinal canal, along which they pass with the spermatic cord, and emerging at the subcutaneous inguinal ring, they descend into the scrotum, becoming invested in their course by coverings derived from the serous. Muscular and fibrous layers of the abdominal parietes, as well as by the scrotum. The coverings of the testes are the skin, cremaster, scrotum, dartos tunic, 
infundibuliform fascia, intercrural fascia, tunica vaginalis. The scrotum is a cutaneous pouch which contains the testes and parts of the spermatic cords. It is divided on its surface into two lateral portions by a ridge or raphe which is continued forward to the undersurface of the penis and backward along the middle line of the perineum to the anus. Of these two lateral portions, the left hangs lower than the right to correspond with the greater length of the left spermatic cord. Its external aspect varies under different circumstances. Thus, under the influence of warmth, and in old and debilitated persons, it becomes elongated and flaccid. But under the influence of cold, and in the young and robust, it is short, corrugated, and closely applied to the testes. The scrotum consists of two layers, the integument and the dartos tunic. The integument is very thin, of a brownish color, and generally thrown into folds or rugae. It is provided with sebaceous follicles, the secretion of which has a peculiar odor, and is beset with thinly scattered crisp hairs, the roots of which are seen through the skin. The dartos tunic, tunica dartos, is a thin layer of non-striped muscular fibers, continuous around the base of the scrotum, with the two layers of the superficial fascia of the groin and the perineum. It sends inward a septum, which divides the scrotal pouch into two cavities for the testes, and extends between the raphe and the undersurface of the penis as far as its root. The dartos tunic is closely united to the skin externally, but connected with the sub-adjacent parts by delicate areolar tissue, upon which it glides with the greatest facility. The intercrural fascia, intercolumnar or external spermatic fascia, is a thin membrane, prolonged downward around the surface of the cord and testis. It is separated from the dartos tunic by loose areolar tissue. The cremaster consists of scattered bundles of muscular fibers connected together into a continuous covering by intermediate areolar tissue. The infundibuliform fascia, tunica vaginalis communis, testis et funiculi spermatici, is a thin layer which loosely invests the cord. It is a continuation downward of the transversalis fascia. The tunica vaginalis is described with the testes. Vessels and nerves. The arteries supplying the coverings of the testes are the superficial and deep external pudendal branches of the femoral, the superficial perineal branch of the internal pudendal, and the cremasteric branch from the inferior epigastric. The veins follow the course of the corresponding arteries. The lymphatics end in the inguinal lymph glands. The nerves are the ilioinguinal and lumboinguinal branches of the lumbar plexus, the two superficial perineal branches of the internal pudendal nerve, and the pudendal branch of the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. The inguinal canal, canalis inguinalis, is described on page 418. The spermatic cord, funiculus spermaticus, extends from the abdominal inguinal ring, where the structures of which it is composed converge to the back part of the testis. In the abdominal wall, the cord passes obliquely along the inguinal canal, lying at first beneath the obliquus internus and upon the fascia transversalis, but nearer the pubis it rests upon the inguinal and lacunar ligaments, having the aponeurosis of the obliquus externus in front of it, and the inguinal falcs behind it. It then escapes at the subcutaneous ring and descends nearly vertically into the scrotum. The left cord is rather longer than the right, consequently the left testis hangs somewhat lower than its fellow. Structure of the spermatic cord. The spermatic cord is composed of arteries, veins, lymphatics, nerves, and the excretory duct of the testis. These structures are connected together by areolar tissue and invested by the layers brought down by the testis in its descent. The arteries of the cord are the internal and external spermatics and the artery to the ductus deferens. The internal spermatic artery, a branch of the abdominal aorta, escapes from the abdomen at the abdominal inguinal ring and accompanies the other constituents of the spermatic cord along the inguinal canal and through the subcutaneous inguinal ring into the scrotum. It then descends to the testis and, becoming tortuous, divides into several branches, two or three of which accompany the ductus deferens and supply the epididymis, anastomosing with the artery of the ductus deferens. The others supply the substance of the testis. 
The external spermatic artery is a branch of the inferior epigastric artery. It accompanies the spermatic cord and supplies the coverings of the cord, anastomosing with the internal sp spermatic artery. The artery of the ductus deferens, a branch of the superior vesicle, is a long slender vessel which accompanies the ductus deferens, ramifying upon its coats and anastomosing with the internal spermatic artery near the testis. The spermatic veins emerge from the back of the testis and receive tributaries from the epididymis. They unite and form a convoluted plexus, the plexus pampiniformis, which forms the chief mass of the cord. The vessels composing this plexus are very numerous and ascend along the cord in front of the ductus deferens. Below the subcutaneous inguinal ring, they unite to form three or four veins, which pass along the inguinal canal, and entering the abdomen through the abdominal inguinal ring, coalesce to form two veins. These again unite to form a single vein, which opens on the right side into the inferior vena cava at an acute angle, and on the left side into the left renal vein at a right angle. The lymphatic vessels are described on page 713. The nerves are the spermatic plexus from the sympathetic, joined by filaments from the pelvic plexus, which accompany the artery of the ductus deferens. The scrotum forms an admirable covering for the protection of the testes. These bodies, lying suspended and loose in the cavity of the scrotum and surrounded by serous membrane, are capable of great mobility and can therefore easily slip about within the scrotum and thus avoid injuries from blows or squeezes. The skin of the scrotum is very elastic and capable of great distension, and on account of the looseness and amount of subcutaneous tissue, the scrotum becomes greatly enlarged in cases of edema, to which this part is especially liable as a result of its dependent position. The testes are suspended in the scrotum by the spermatic cords, the left testis hanging somewhat lower than its fellow. The average dimensions of the testis are from 4 to 5 centimeters in length, 2.5 centimeters in breadth, and 3 centimeters in the antero-posterior diameter. Its weight varies from 10.5 to 14 grams. Each testis is of an oval form, compressed laterally, and having an oblique position in the scrotum. The upper extremity is directed forward and a little lateral word, the lower backward and a little medial word. The anterior convex border looks forward and downward the posterior or straight border to which the cord is attached, backward and upward. The anterior border and lateral surfaces, as well as both extremities of the organ, are convex, free, smooth, and invested by the visceral layer of the tunica vaginalis. The posterior border, to which the cord is attached, receives only a partial investment from that membrane. Lying upon the lateral edge of this posterior border is a long, narrow, flattened body named the epididymis. The epididymis consists of a central portion or body, an upper enlarged extremity, the head, globus major, and a lower pointed extremity, the tail, globus minor, which is continuous with the ductus deferens, the duct of the testis. The head is intimately connected with the upper end of the testis by means of the efferent ductules of the gland. The tail is connected with the lower end by cellular tissue and a reflection of the tunica vaginalis. The lateral surface, head and tail of the epididymis are free and covered by the serous membrane. The body is also completely invested by it, excepting along its posterior border, while between the body and the testis is a pouch named the sinus of the epididymis, digital fossa. The epididymis is connected to the back of the testis by a fold of the serous membrane. End of section 33. Recording by Dr. Valerie Ross. Section 34 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dr. Valerie Ross. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. The Testes and Their Coverings. Appendages of the Testis and Epididymis. 
On the upper extremity of the testis, just beneath the head of the epididymis, is a minute oval sessile body, the appendix of the testis, hydatid of morgagni. It is the remnant of the upper end of the mullerian duct. On the head of the epididymis is a second small stalked appendage, sometimes duplicated. It is named the appendix of the epididymis, pedunculated hydatid, and is usually regarded as a detached efferent duct. The testis is invested by three tunics, the tunica vaginalis, tunica albuginea, and tunica vasculosa. The tunica vaginalis, tunica vaginalis propria testis, is the serous covering of the testis. It is a pouch of serous membrane derived from the saccus vaginalis of the peritoneum, which in the fetus preceded the descent of the testis from the abdomen into the scrotum. After its descent, that portion of the pouch which extends from the abdominal inguinal ring to near the upper part of the gland becomes obliterated. The lower portion remains as a shut sac which invests the surface of the testis and is reflected on to the internal surface of the scrotum. Hence it may be described as consisting of a visceral and a parietal lamina. The visceral lamina, or lamina visceralis, covers the greater part of the testis and epididymis connecting the latter to the testis by means of a distinct fold. From the posterior border of the gland, it is reflected on to the internal surface of the scrotum. The parietal lamina, or lamina parietalis, is far more extensive than the visceral, extending upward for some distance in front and on the medial side of the cord and reaching below the testis. The inner surface of the tunica vaginalis is smooth and covered by a layer of endothelial cells. The interval between the visceral and parietal laminae con constitutes the cavity of the tunica vaginalis. The obliterated portion of the saccus vaginalis may generally be seen as a fibrocellular thread lying in the loose areolar tissue around the spermatic cord. Sometimes this may be traced as a distinct band from the upper end of the inguinal canal where it is connected with the peritoneum down to the tunica vaginalis. Sometimes it gradually becomes lost on the spermatic cord. Occasionally no trace of it can be detected. In some cases it happens that the pouch of peritoneum does not become obliterated, but the sac of the peritoneum communicates with the tunica vaginalis. This may give rise to one of the varieties of oblique inguinal hernia. In other cases, the pouch may contract, but not become entirely obliterated. It then forms a minute canal leading from the peritoneum to the tunica vaginalis. The tunica albuginea is the fibrous covering of the testis. It is a dense membrane of a bluish-white color composed of bundles of white fibrous tissue which interlace in every direction. It is covered by the tunica vaginalis, except at the points of attachment of the epididymis to the testis and along its posterior border, where the spermatic vessels enter the gland. It is applied to the tunica vasculosa over the glandular substance of the testis and, at its posterior border, is reflected into the interior of the gland, forming an incomplete vertical septum called the mediastinum testis, or corpus hymori. The mediastinum testis extends from the upper to near the lower extremity of the gland and is wider above than below. From its front and sides, numerous imperfect septa, or trabeculi, are given off, which radiate toward the surface of the organ and are attached to the tunica albuginea. They divide the interior of the organ into a number of incomplete spaces, which are somewhat cone-shaped, being broad at their base at the surface of the gland, and becoming narrower as they converge to the mediastinum. The mediastinum supports the vessels and duct of the testis in their passage to and from the substance of the gland. The tunica vasculosa is the vascular layer of the testis, consisting of a plexus of blood vessels held together by delicate areolar tissue. It clothes the inner surface of the tunica albuginea and the different septa in the interior of the gland, and therefore forms an internal investment to all the spaces of which the gland is composed. Structure The glandular structure of the testis consists of numerous lobules. Their number in a single testis is estimated by Barris at 250 and by Krauss at 400. They differ in size according to their position, those in the middle of the gland being larger and longer. 
The lobules are conical in shape, the base being directed toward the circumference of the organ, the apex toward the mediastinum. Each lobule is contained in one of the intervals between the fibrous septa, which extend between the mediastinum testis and the tunica albuginea, and consists of from one to three or more minute convoluted tubes, the tubuli seminiferi. The tubules may be separately unraveled by careful dissection under water, and may be seen to commence either by free cecal ends or by anastomotic loops. They are supported by loose connective tissue, which contains here and there groups of interstitial cells containing yellow pigment granules. The total number of tubules is estimated by Louth at 840, and the average length of each is 70 to 80 centimeters. Their diameter varies from 0.12 to 0.3 millimeters. The tubules are pale in color in early life, but in old age they acquire a deep yellow tinge from containing much fatty matter. Each tubule consists of a basement layer formed of laminated connective tissue containing numerous elastic fibers with flattened cells between the layers and covered externally by a layer of flattened epithelioid cells. Within the basement membrane are epithelial cells arranged in several irregular layers, which are not always clearly separated, but which may be arranged in three different groups. Among these cells may be seen the spermatozoa in different stages of development. Lining the basement membrane and forming the outer zone is a layer of cubical cells with small nuclei. Some of these enlarge to become spermatogonia. The nuclei of some of the spermatogonia may be seen to be in process of indirect division, or karyokinesis, and in consequence of this, daughter cells are formed, which constitute the second zone. Within this first layer is to be seen a number of larger polyhedral cells with clear nuclei arranged in two or three layers. These are the intermediate cells, or spermatocytes. Most of these cells are in a condition of karyokinetic division, and the cells which result from this division form those of the next layer, the spermatoblasts, or spermatids. The third layer of cells consists of the spermatoblasts, or spermatids, and each of these, without further subdivision, becomes a spermatozoan. The spermatids are small polyhedral cells, the nucleus of each of which contains half the usual number of chromosomes. In addition to these three layers of cells, others are seen, which are termed the supporting cells, or cells of Sertoli. They are elongated and columnar, and project inward from the basement membrane toward the lumen of the tube. As development of the spermatozoa proceeds, the latter group themselves around the inner extremities of the supporting cells. The nuclear portion of the spermatid, which is partly embedded in the supporting cell, is differentiated to form the head of the spermatozoan, while part of the cell protoplasm forms the middle piece, and the tail is produced by an outgrowth from the double centriole of the cell. Ultimately, the heads are liberated and the spermatozoa are set free. The structure of the spermatozoa is described on pages 42 and 43. In the apices of the lobules, the tubules become less convoluted, assume a nearly straight course, and unite together to form from 20 to 30 larger ducts of about 0.5 millimeters in diameter, and these, from their straight course, are called tubuli recti. The tubuli recti enter the fibrous tissue of the mediastinum and pass upward and backward, forming, in their ascent, a close network of anastomosing tubes which are merely channels in the fibrous stroma, lined by flattened epithelium and having no proper walls. This constitutes the rete testis. At the upper end of the mediastinum, the vessels of the rete testis terminate in from 12 to 15 or 20 ducts, the ductuli efferentes. They perforate the tunica albuginea and carry the seminal fluid from the testis to the epididymis. Their course is at first straight, they then become enlarged and exceedingly convoluted and form a series of conical masses, the coni vasculosi, which together constitute the head of the epididymis. Each cone consists of a single convoluted duct from 15 to 20 centimeters in length, the diameter of which gradually decreases from the testis to the epididymis. Opposite the bases of the cones, the efferent vessels open at narrow intervals into a single duct, which constitutes, by its complex convolutions, the body and tail of the epididymis. 
When the convolutions of this tube are unraveled, it measures upward of six meters in length. It decreases in diameter and thickness as it approaches the ductus deferens. The convolutions are held together by fine areolar tissue and by bands of fibrous tissue. The tubuli recti have very thin walls. Like the channels of the rete testis, they are lined by a single layer of flattened epithelium. The ductuli efferentes and the tube of the epididymis have walls of considerable thickness on account of the presence in them of muscular tissue, which is principally arranged in a circular manner. These tubes are lined by columnar ciliated epithelium. Peculiarities The testis developed in the lumbar region may be arrested or delayed in its transit to the scrotum, cryptorchism. It may be retained in the abdomen, or it may be arrested at the abdominal inguinal ring or in the inguinal canal, or it may just pass out of the subcutaneous inguinal ring without finding its way to the bottom of the scrotum. When retained in the abdomen, it gives rise to no symptoms other than the absence of the testis from the scrotum. But when it is retained in the inguinal canal, it is subjected to pressure and may become inflamed and painful. The retained testis is probably functionally useless, so that a man in whom both testes are retained, anorchism, is sterile, though he may not be impotent. The absence of one testis is termed monorchism. When a testis is retained in the inguinal canal, it is often complicated with a congenital hernia, the funicular process of the peritoneum not being obliterated. In addition to the cases above described, where there is some arrest in the descent of the testis, this organ may descend through the inguinal canal, but may miss the scrotum and assume some abnormal position. The most common form is where the testis, emerging at the subcutaneous inguinal ring, slips down between the scrotum and the thigh and comes to rest in the perineum. This is known as perineal ectopia testis. With each variety of abnormality in the position of the testis, it is very common to find concurrently a congenital hernia, or, if a hernia be not actually present, the funicular process is usually patent, and almost invariably so if the testis is in the inguinal canal. The testis, finally reaching the scrotum, may occupy an abnormal position in it. It may be inverted so that its posterior or attached border is directed forward and the tunica vaginalis is situated behind. Fluid collections of a serous character are very frequently found in the scrotum. To these the term hydrocele is applied. The most common form is the ordinary vaginal hydrocele in which the fluid is contained in the sac of the tunica vaginalis which is separated in its normal condition from the peritoneal cavity by the whole extent of the inguinal canal. In another form, the congenital hydrocele, the fluid is in the sac of the tunica vaginalis, but this cavity communicates with the general peritoneal cavity, its tubular process remaining pervious. A third variety, known as an infantile hydrocele, occurs in those cases where the tubular process becomes obliterated only at its upper part, at or near the abdominal inguinal ring. It resembles the vaginal hydrocele, except as regards its shape, the collection of fluid extending up to the cord into the inguinal canal. Fourthly, the funicular process may become obliterated both at the abdominal inguinal ring and above the epididymis, leaving a central unobliterated portion which may become distended with fluid, giving rise to a condition known as the encysted hydrocele of the cord. End of section 34. Recording by Dr. Valerie Ross. The ductus deferens, or the vas deferens, or the seminal duct. The ductus deferens, the excretory duct of the testis, is the continuation of the canal of the epididymis. Commencing at the lower part of the tail of the epididymis, it is at first very tortuous, but gradually becoming less twisted, it ascends along the posterior border of the testis and medial side of the epididymis, and, as a constituent of the spermatic cord, traverses the inguinal canal to the abdominal inguinal ring. Here it separates from the other structures of the cord, curves around the lateral side of the inferior epigastric artery, and ascends for about 2.5 centimeters in front of the external iliac artery. It is next directed backward and slightly downward, 
and, crossing the external iliac vessels obliquely, enters the pelvic cavity, where it lies between the peritoneal membrane and the lateral wall of the pelvis, and descends on the medial side of the obliterated umbilical artery and the obturator nerve and vessels. It then crosses in front of the ureter, and reaching the medial side of this tube, bends to form an acute angle, and runs medialward and slightly forward between the fundus of the bladder and the upper end of the seminal vesicle. Reaching the medial side of the seminal vesicle, it is directed downward and medialward in contact with it, gradually approaching the opposite ductus. Here it lies between the fundus of the bladder and the rectum, where it is enclosed, together with the seminal vesicle, in a sheath derived from the rectovesical portion of the fascia endopelvina. Lastly, it is directed downward to the base of the prostate, where it becomes greatly narrowed and is joined at an acute angle by the duct of the seminal vesicle to form the ejaculatory duct, which traverses the prostate behind its middle lobe and opens into the prostatic portion of the urethra, close to the orifice of the prostatic utricle. The ductus deferens presents a hard and cord-like sensation to the fingers and is of cylindrical form. Its walls are dense, and its canal is extremely small. At the fundus of the bladder it becomes enlarged and tortuous, and this portion is termed the ampulla. A small triangular area of the fundus of the bladder, between the ductus deferentes laterally and the bottom of the rectovesical excavation of peritoneum above, is in contact with the rectum. Ductuli aberrantes a long, narrow tube, the ductulus aberrans inferior, or vas aberrans of Haller, is occasionally found connected with the lower part of the canal of the epididymis, or with the commencement of the ductus deferens. Its length varies from 3.5 to 35 centimeters, and it may become dilated toward its extremity. More commonly, it retains the same diameter throughout. Its structure is similar to that of the ductus deferens. Occasionally it is found unconnected with the epididymis. A second tube, the ductulus aberrans superior, occurs in the head of the epididymis. It is connected with the rete testis. Paradidymis, or organ of Giraldis. This term is applied to a small collection of convoluted tubules situated in front of the lower part of the cord above the head of the epididymis. These tubes are lined with columnar ciliated epithelium and probably represent the remains of a part of the Wolfian body. Structure The ductus deferens consists of three coats. Number one, an external or areolar coat. Number two, a muscular coat, which in the greater portion of the tube consists of two layers of unstriped muscular fiber, an outer longitudinal in direction and an inner circular. But in addition to these, at the commencement of the ductus, there is a third layer, consisting of longitudinal fibers, placed internal to the circular stratum between it and the mucous membrane. Number three, an internal or mucous coat, which is pale and arranged in longitudinal folds. The mucous coat is lined by columnar epithelium, which is non-ciliated throughout the greater part of the tube. A variable portion of the testicular end of the tube is lined by two strata of columnar cells, and the cells of the superficial layer are ciliated. Next chapter, the vesiculi seminales, or seminal vesicles. The vesiculi seminales are two lobulated membranous pouches placed between the fundus of the bladder and the rectum, serving as reservoirs for the semen and secreting a fluid to be added to the secretion of the testes. Each sac is somewhat pyramidal in form, the broad end being directed backward, upward, and lateralward. It is usually about 7.5 centimeters long, but varies in size, not only in different individuals, but also in the same individual on the two sides. The anterior surface is in contact with the fundus of the bladder, extending from near the termination of the ureter to the base of the prostate. The posterior surface rests upon the rectum, from which it is separated by the rectovesical fascia. The upper extremities of the two vesicles diverge from each other, and are in relation with the ductus deferentes and the terminations of the ureters, and are partly covered by peritoneum. The lower extremities are pointed, and converge toward the base of the prostate, where each joins with the corresponding ductus deferens to form the ejaculatory duct. 
Along the medial margin of each vesicle runs the ampulla of the ductus deferens. Each vesicle consists of a single tube coiled upon itself and giving off several irregular cecal diverticula. The separate coils, as well as the diverticula, are connected together by fibrous tissue. When uncoiled, the tube is about the diameter of a quill and varies in length from 10 to 15 centimeters. It ends posteriorly in a cul-de-sac. Its anterior extremity becomes constricted into a narrow, straight duct, which joins with the corresponding ductus deferens to form the ejaculatory duct. Structure The vesiculi seminales are composed of three coats, an external or areolar coat, a middle or muscular coat thinner than in the ductus deferens and arranged in two layers, an outer longitudinal and an inner circular, an internal or mucous coat which is pale, of a whitish-brown color, and presents a delicate reticular structure. The epithelium is columnar, and in the diverticula goblet cells are present, the secretion of which increases the bulk of the seminal fluid. Vessels and Nerves The arteries supplying the vesiculi seminales are derived from the middle and inferior vesicle and middle hemorrhoidal. The veins and lymphatics accompany the arteries. The nerves are derived from the pelvic plexuses. The next chapter is the ejaculatory ducts, or ductus ejaculatorii. The ejaculatory ducts are two in number, one on either side of the middle line. Each is formed by the union of the duct from the vesicula seminalis with the ductus deferens and is about two centimeters long. They commence at the base of the prostate and run forward and downward between its middle and lateral lobes and along the sides of the prostatic utricle to end by separate slit-like orifices close to or just within the margins of the utricle. The ducts diminish in size and also converge toward their terminations. Structure The coats of the ejaculatory ducts are extremely thin. They are an outer fibrous layer which is almost entirely lost after the entrance of the ducts into the prostate, a layer of muscular fibers consisting of a thin outer circular and an inner longitudinal layer, and mucous membrane. End of section 35. Recording by Dr. Valerie Ross. Section 36 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. The Penis. The penis is a pendulous organ suspended from the front and sides of the pubic arch and containing the greater part of the urethra. In the flaccid condition it is cylindrical in shape, but when erect assumes the form of a triangular prism with rounded angles, one side of the prism forming the dorsum. It is composed of three cylindrical masses of cavernous tissue bound together by fibrous tissue and covered with skin. Two of the masses are lateral and are known as the corpora cavernosa penis. The third is median, and is termed the corpus cavernosum urethrae. The corpora cavernosa penis form the greater part of the substance of the penis. For their anterior three-fourths, they lie in intimate apposition with one another, but behind they diverge in the form of two tapering processes, known as the crora, which are firmly connected to the rami of the pubic arch. Trace from behind forward, each crust begins by a blunt pointed process in front of the tuberosity of the ischium. Just before it meets its fellow, it presents a slight enlargement, named by Cobalt the bulb of the corpus cavernosum penis. Beyond this point, the crust undergoes a constriction and merges into the corpus cavernosum proper, which retains a uniform diameter to its anterior end. Each corpus cavernosum penis ends abruptly in a rounded extremity some distance from the point of the penis. The corpora cavernosa penis are surrounded by a strong fibrous envelope consisting of superficial and deep fibers. 
the superficial fibers are longitudinal in direction and form a single tube which encloses both corpora the deep fibers are arranged circularly around each corpus and form by their junction in the median plane the septum of the penis this is thick and complete behind but it is imperfect in front where it consists of a series of vertical bands arranged like the teeth of a comb it is therefore named the septum pectiniforme the corpus cavernosum urethrae corpus spongiosum contains the urethra behind it is expanded to form the urethral bulb and lies in apposition with the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm from which it receives a fibrous investment the urethra enters the bulb nearer to the upper than to the lower surface on the latter there is a median sulcus from which a thin fibrous septum projects into the substance of the bulb and divides it imperfectly into two lateral lobes or hemispheres the portion of the corpus cavernosum urethra in front of the bulb lies in a groove on the under surface of the conjoined corpora cavernosa penis it is cylindrical in form and tapers slightly from behind forward its anterior end is expanded in the form of an obtuse cone flattened from above downward this expansion termed the glans penis is moulded on the rounded ends of the corpora cavernosa penis extending farther on their upper than on their lower surfaces at the summit of the glans is the slit-like vertical external urethral orifice the circumference of the base of the glans forms a rounded projecting border the corona glandus overhanging a deep retroglandular sulcus behind which is the neck of the penis for descriptive purposes it is convenient to divide the penis into three regions the root the body and the extremity the root radix penis of the penis is triradiate in form consisting of the diverging crura one on either side and the median urethral bulb each crust is covered by the ischiocavernosus while the bulb is surrounded by the bulbocavernosus the root of the penis lies in the perineum between the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm and the fascia of collis in addition to being attached to the fascia in the pubic rami it is bound to the front of the symphysis pubis by the fundiform and suspensory ligaments the fundiform ligament springs from the front of the sheath of the rectus abdominis and the linea alba it splits into two fasciculi which encircle the root of the penis the upper fibers of the suspensory ligament pass downward from the lower end of the linea alba and the lower fibers from the symphysis pubis together they form a strong fibrous band which extends to the upper surface of the root where it blends with the fascial sheath of the organ the body corpus penis extends from the root to the ends of the corpora cavernosa penis and in it these corpora cavernosa are intimately bound to one another a shallow groove which marks their junction on the upper surface lodges the deep dorsal vein of the penis while a deeper and wider groove between them on the under surface contains the corpus cavernosum urethrae the body is ensheathed by fascia which is continuous above the fascia of scarpa and below with the dortus tunic of the scrotum and the fascia of collis the extremity is formed by the glans penis the expanded anterior end of the corpus cavernosum urethrae it is separated from the body by the constricted neck which is overhung by the corona glandus the integument covering the penis is remarkable for its thinness its dark color its looseness of connection with the deeper parts of the organ and its absence of adipose tissue at the root of the penis it is continuous with that over the pubes scrotum and perineum at the neck it leaves the surface and becomes folded upon itself to form the prepuce or foreskin the internal layer of the prepuce is directly continuous along the line of the neck with the integument over the glands immediately behind the external urethral orifice it forms a small secondary reduplication 
attached along the bottom of a depressed median raffe, which extends from the medis to the neck. This fold is termed the frenulum of the prepuce. The integument covering the glands is continuous with the urethral mucous membrane at the orifice. It is devoid of hairies, but projecting from its free surface are a number of small, highly sensitive papillae. Scattered glands on the corona, neck, glands, and inner layer of the prepuce, the prepucial glands, have been described. They secrete a sebaceous material of very peculiar odor, which probably contains casein, and readily undergoes decomposition. When mixed with discarded epithelial cells, it is called smegma. The prepuce covers a variable amount of the glands, and is separated from it by a potential sac, the prepucial sac, which presents two shallow fossae, one on either side of the frenulum. Structure of the penis. From the internal surface of the fibrous envelope of the corpora cavernosa penis, as well as from the sides of the septum, numerous bands or cords are given off, which cross the interior of these corpora cavernosa in all directions subdividing them into a number of separate compartments and giving the entire structure a spongy appearance. These bands and cords are called trabeculae and consist of white fibrous tissue, elastic fibers, and plain muscular fibers. In them are contained numerous arteries and nerves. The component fibers which form the trabeculae are larger and stronger around the circumference than at the centers of the corpora cavernosa. They are also thicker behind than in front. The interspaces, cavernous spaces, on the contrary, are larger at the center than at the circumference, their long diameters being directed transversely. They are filled with blood, and are lined by a layer of flattened cells similar to the endothelial lining of veins. The fibrous envelope of the corpus cavernosum urethrae is thinner, whiter in color, and more elastic than that of the corpora cavernosa penis. The trabuculae are more delicate, nearly uniform in size, and the meshes between them smaller than in the corpora cavernosa penis, their long diameters for the most part corresponding with that of the penis. The external envelope or outer coat of the corpus cavernosum urethrae is formed partly of unstriped muscular fibers, and a layer of the same tissue immediately surrounds the canal of the urethra. Vessels and nerves. The arteries bringing the blood to the cavernous spaces are the deep arteries of the penis and branches from the dorsal arteries of the penis, which perforate the fibrous capsule along the upper surface, especially near the forepart of the organ. On entering the cavernous structure, the arteries divide into branches, which are supported and enclosed by the trabeculae. Some of these arteries end in capillary network, the branches of which open directly into the cavernous spaces. Others assume a tendril-like appearance, and form convoluted and somewhat dilated vessels, which were named by Muller Hellicene arteries. They open into the spaces, and from them are also given off small capillary branches to supply the trabecular structure. They are bound down in the spaces by fine fibrous processes, and are most abundant in the back part of the corpora cavernosa. The blood from the cavernous spaces is returned by a series of vessels, some of which emerge in considerable numbers from the base of the glans penis and converge on the dorsum of the organ to form the deep dorsal vein. Others pass out on the upper surface of the corpora cavernosa and join the same vein, some emerge from the undersurface of the corpora cavernosa penis, and receiving branches from the corpus cavernosum urethrae, wind around the sides of the penis to end in the deep dorsal vein, but the greater number pass out at the root of the penis and join the prostatic plexus. The lymphatic vessels of the penis are described on page 713. The nerves are derived from the pudendal nerve and the pelvic plexuses. On the glands and bulb, some filaments of the cutaneous nerves have pacinian bodies connected with them, and, according to Krauss, 
many of them end in peculiar end bulbs footnote one seventy eight staida comptes rendus du twelve congress international de medicine moscow eighteen ninety seven asserts that glands are never found on the corona glandus and that what have hitherto been mistaken for glands are really large papillae End footnote End of section thirty six Chapter thirty seven of Gray's Anatomy Part five This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lawrence. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. 37. The Prostate. Bulbo-urethral glands. 3C6. The Prostate. Prostata. Prostate gland. The prostate is a firm, partly glandular and partly muscular body which is placed immediately below the internal urethral orifice and around the commencement of the urethra it is situated in the pelvic cavity below the lower part of the symphysis pubis above the superior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm and in front of the rectum through which it may be distinctly felt especially when enlarged it is about the size of a chestnut and somewhat conical in shape and presents for examination a base an apex, an anterior, a posterior, and two lateral surfaces. The base, basis prostate, is directed upward and is applied to the inferior surface of the bladder. The greater part of this surface is directly continuous with the bladder wall. The urethra penetrates it nearer its anterior than its posterior border. The apex, apex prostate, is directed downward and is in contact with the superior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm. Surfaces The posterior surface, fasces posterior, is flattened from side to side and slightly convex from above downward. It is separated from the rectum by its sheath and some loose connective tissue, and is distant about 4 cm from the anus. Near its upper border, there is a depression through which the two ejaculatory ducts enter the prostate. This depression serves to divide the posterior surface into a lower, larger, and an upper, smaller part. The upper, smaller part constitutes the middle lobe of the prostate and intervenes between the ejaculatory ducts and the urethra. It varies greatly in size and in some cases is destitute of glandular tissue. The lower larger portion sometimes presents a shallow median furrow, which imperfectly separates it into a right and a left lateral lobe. These form the main mass of the gland, and are directly continuous with each other behind the urethra. In front of the urethra, they are connected by a band which is named the isthmus. This consists of the same tissues as the capsule and is devoid of glandular substance. The anterior surface, Facies anterior measures about 2.5 centimeters from above downward, but is narrow and convex from side to side. It is placed about 2 centimeters behind the pubic symphysis, from which it is separated by a plexus of veins and a quantity of loose fat. It is connected to the pubic bone on either side by the puboprostatic ligaments. The urethra emerges from this surface a little above and in front of the apex of the gland. The lateral surfaces are prominent and are covered by the anterior portions of the levatories ani, which are, however, separated from the gland by a plexus of veins. The prostate measures about 4 cm transversely at the base, 2 cm in its anteroposterior diameter, and 3 cm in its vertical diameter. Its weight is about 8 grams. It is held in its position by the puboprostatic ligaments by the superior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm, which invests the prostate and the commencement of the membranous portion of the urethra, and by the anterior portions of the levatories ani, which pass backwards from the pubis, and embrace the sides of the prostate. These portions of the levatories ani 
from the support they afford to the prostate are named the levatories prostatae. The prostate is perforated by the urethra and the ejaculatory ducts. The urethra usually lies along the junction of its anterior with its middle third. The ejaculatory ducts pass obliquely downward and forward through the posterior part of the prostate and open into the prostatic portion of the urethra. Structure the prostate is immediately enveloped by a thin but firm fibrous capsule, distinct from that derived from the fascia endopelvina and separated from it by a plexus of veins. This capsule is firmly adherent to the prostate and is structurally continuous with the stroma of the gland, being composed of the same tissues, viz. non-striped muscle and fibrous tissue. The substance of the prostate is of a pale reddish-gray color, of great density and not easily torn. It consists of glandular substance and muscular tissue. The muscular tissue, according to Krolliker, constitutes the proper stroma of the prostate, the connective tissue being very scanty and simply forming between the muscular fibers, thin trabecula in which the vessels and nerves of the gland ramify. The muscular tissue is arranged as follows. Immediately beneath the fibrous capsule is a dense layer, which forms an investing sheath for the gland. Secondly, around the urethra, as it lies in the prostate, is another dense layer of circular fibers, continuous above with the internal layer of the muscular coat of the bladder, and blending below with the fibers surrounding the membranous portion of the urethra. Between these two layers, strong bands of muscular tissue, which decussate freely, form meshes in which the glandular structure of the organ is embedded. In that part of the gland which is situated in front of the urethra, the muscular tissue is especially dense, and there is here little or no gland tissue, while in that part which is behind the urethra, the muscular tissue presents a wide meshed structure, which is densest at the base of the gland, that is, near the bladder, becoming looser and more sponge-like toward the apex of the organ. The glandular substance is composed of numerous follicular pouches, the lining of which frequently shows papillary elevations. The follicles open into elongated canals which join to form from twelve to twenty small excretory ducts. They are connected together by areolar tissue supported by prolongations from the fibrous capsule and the muscular stroma, and enclosed in a delicate capillary plexus. The epithelium which lines the canals and the terminal vesicles is of the columnar variety. The prostatic ducts open into the floor of the prostatic portion of the urethra and are lined by two layers of epithelium, the inner layer consisting of columnar and the outer of small cubical cells. Small colloid masses known as amyloid bodies are often found in the gland tubes. Vessels and Nerves the arteries supplying the prostate are derived from the internal pudental, inferior vesicle, and middle hemorrhoidal. Its veins form a plexus around the sides and base of the gland. They receive in front the dorsal vein of the penis, and end in the hypogastric veins. The nerves are derived from the pelvic plexus. 3C7. The Bubulurethral Glands. Glanduli bubulurethrales. Copers glands. The bulbo-euthreal glands are two small, rounded, and somewhat lobulated bodies of a yellow color about the size of peas, placed behind and lateral to the membranous portion of the urethra, between the two layers of the fascia of the urogenital diaphragm. They lie close above the bulb and are enclosed by the transverse fibers of the sphincter urethrae membranaceae. Their existence is said to be constant. They gradually diminish in size as age advances. The excretory duct of each gland, nearly 2.5 centimeters long, passes obliquely forward beneath the mucous membrane, and opens by a minute orifice on the floor of the cavernous portion of the urethra about 2.5 centimeters in front of the urogenital diaphragm. Structure The gland is made up of several lobules held together by a fibrous investment. Each lobule consists of a number of asini, 
lined by columnar epithelial cells, opening into one duct, which joins with the ducts of other lobules outside the gland to form the single excretory duct. End of chapter 37「Section 38 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. Female Genital Organs, Ovaries, Uterine Tube. Female Genital Organs, Ovaries, Uterine Tube. The female genital organs. Organa genitalia mulibria. The female genital organs consist of an internal and an external group. The internal organs are situated within the pelvis and consist of the ovaries, the uterine tubes, the uterus, and the vagina. The external organs are placed below the urogenital diaphragm and below and in front of the pubic arch. They comprise the mons pubis the labia majora et minora pudendi, the clitoris, the bulbous vestibuli, and the greater vestibular glands. The ovaries, ovaria. The ovaries are homologous with the testes in the male. They are two nodular bodies, situated one on either side of the uterus in relation to the lateral wall of the pelvis, and attached to the back of the broad ligament of the uterus behind and below the uterine tubes. The ovaries are of a grayish-pink color, and present either a smooth or a puckered uneven surface. They are each about four centimeters in length, two centimeters in width, and about eight millimeters in thickness, and weigh from two to three point five grams. Each ovary presents a lateral and a medial surface, an upper or tubal, and a lower or uterine extremity, and an anterior of or mesovarian, and a posterior free border. It lies in a shallow depression, named the ovarian fossa, on the lateral wall of the pelvis. This fossa is bounded above by the external iliac vessels, in front by the obliterated umbilical artery, and behind by the ureter. The exact position of the ovary has been the subject of considerable difference of opinion, and the description here given applies to the ovary of the noliparous woman. The ovary becomes displaced during the first pregnancy, and probably never again returns to its original position. In the erect posture, the long axis of the ovary is vertical. The tubal extremity is near the external iliac vein. To it are attached the ovarian fimbria of the uterine tube, and a fold of peritoneum, the suspensory ligament of the ovary, which is directed upward over the iliac vessels and contains the ovarian vessels. The uterine end is directed downward toward the pelvic floor. It is usually narrower than the tubal, and is attached to the lateral angle of the uterus, immediately behind the uterine tube, by a rounded cord termed the ligament of the ovary which lies within the broad ligament and contains some non-striped muscular fibers. The lateral surface is in contact with the parietal peritoneum, which lines the ovarian fossa. The medial surface is to a large extent covered by the fimbriated extremity of the uterine tube. The mesovarian border is straight and is directed toward the obliterated umbilical artery and is attached to the back of the broad ligament by a short fold named the mesovarium. Between the two layers of this fold, the blood vessels and nerves pass to reach the hilum of the ovary. The free border is convex and is directed toward the ureter. The uterine tube arches over the ovary, running upward in relation to its mesovarian border, then curving over its tubal pole and finally passing downward on its free border and medial surface. Epoupheron, paravarium, organ of Rosenmuller. The epoupheron lies in the mesosopanx between the ovary and the uterine tube, and consists of a few short tubules, ductuli transversi, 
which converge toward the ovary while their opposite ends open into a rudimentary duct the ductus longitudinalis epuphery duct of gartner perufuron the perufuron consists of a few scattered rudimentary tubules best seen in the child situated in the broad ligament between the epuphron and the uterus the ductuli transversi of the epuphron and the tubules of the perufuron are remnants of the tubules of the wolfian body or mesonephros the ductus longitudinalis epuphora epuphory is a persistent portion of the wolfian duct in the fetus the ovaries are situated like the testes in the lumbar region near the kidneys but they gradually descend into the pelvis structure the surface of the ovary is covered by a layer of columnar cells which constitutes the germinal epithelium of waldire the epithelium gives to the ovary a dull gray color as compared with the shining smoothness of the peritoneum and the transition between the squamous epithelium of the peritoneum and the columnar cells which cover the ovary is usually marked by a line around the anterior border of the ovary the ovary consists of a number of vesicular ovarian follicles embedded in the meshes of a stroma or framework the stroma is a peculiar soft tissue abundantly supplied with blood vessels consisting for the most part of spindle-shaped cells with a small amount of ordinary connective tissue these cells have been regarded by some anatomists as unstriped muscle cells which indeed they most resemble by others as connective tissue cells on the surface of the organ this tissue is much condensed and forms a layer tunica albogenia composed of short connective tissue fibers with fusiform cells between them the stroma of the ovary may contain interstitial cells resembling those of the testes vesicular ovarian follicles graphian follicles upon making a section of an ovary numerous round transparent vesicles of various sizes are to be seen they are the follicles or ovisacs containing the ova immediately beneath the superficial covering is a layer of stroma in which are a large number of minute vesicles of uniform size about o point twenty five millimeters in diameter these are the follicles in their earliest condition and the layer where they are found has been termed the cortical layer they are especially numerous in the ovary of the young child after puberty and during the whole of the childbearing period large and mature or almost mature follicles are also found in the cortical layer in small numbers and also corpora lutea the remains of follicles which have burst and are undergoing atrophy and absorption beneath this superficial stratum other large and more or less mature follicles are founded embedded in the ovarian stroma these increase in size as they recede from the surface toward a highly vascular stroma in the center of the organ termed the medullary substance zona vasculosa of waldire this stroma forms the tissue of the hilum by which the ovary is attached and through which the blood vessels enter it does not contain any follicles the larger follicles consist of an external fibrovascular coat connected with the surrounding stroma of the ovary by a network of blood vessels and an internal coat which consists of several layers of nucleated cells called the membrana granulosa at one part of the mature follicle the cells of the membrana granulosa are collected into a mass which projects into the cavity of the follicle this is termed the discus prolegeris and in it the ovum is embedded the follicle contains a transparent albuminous fluid the development and maturation of the follicles and ova continue uninterruptedly from puberty to the end of the fruitful period of woman's life while their formation commences before birth before puberty the ovaries are small and the follicles contained in them 
are disposed in a comparatively thick layer in the cortical substance. Here they present the appearance of a large number of minute closed vesicles constituting the early condition of the follicles. Many, however, never attain full development, but shrink and disappear. At puberty, the ovaries enlarge and become more vascular. The follicles are developed in greater abundance, and their ova are capable of fecundation. Discharge of the Ovum The follicles, after attaining a certain stage of development, gradually approach the surface of the ovary and burst. The ovum and fluid contents of the follicle are liberated on the exterior of the ovary and carried into the uterine tube by currents set up by the movements of the cilia covering the mucous membrane of the fimbriae. Corpus luteum. After the discharge of the ovum, the lining of the follicle is thrown into folds and vascular processes grow inward from the surrounding tissue. In this way, the space is filled up and the corpus luteum formed. It consists at first of a radial arrangement of yellow cells with blood vessels and lymphatic spaces, and later it merges with the surrounding stroma. Vessels and Nerves The arteries of the ovaries and uterine tubes are the ovarian from the aorta. Each anastomosis freely in the mesosalpinx, with the uterine artery giving some branches to the uterine tube, and others which traverse the mesovarium and enter the hilum of the ovary. The veins emerge from the hilum in the form of a plexus, the pampiniform plexus. The ovarian vein is formed from this plexus and leaves the pelvis in company with the artery. The nerves are derived from the hypogastric or pelvic plexus and from the ovarian plexus, the uterine tube receiving a branch from one of the uterine nerves. Footnote 179. For a description of the ovum, see page 38. End footnote. The uterine tube. Tuba uterina. Fallopian tube. Oviduct. The uterine tubes convey the ova from the ovaries to the cavity of the uterus. They are two in number, one on either side, situated in the upper margin of the broad ligament, and extending from the superior angle of the uterus to the side of the pelvis. Each tube is about ten centimeters long, and is described as consisting of three portions. One, the isthmus, or medial, constricted third. Two, the ampulla or intermediate dilated portion, which curves over the ovary, and three, the infundibulum, with its abdominal ostium, surrounded by fimbriae, one of which, the ovarium fimbriae, is attached to the ovary. The uterine tube is directed lateralward as far as the uterine pole of the ovary, and then ascends along the mesovarian border of the ovary to the tubal pole, over which it arches. Finally, it turns downward and ends in relation to the free border and medial surface of the ovary. The uterine opening is minute and will only admit a fine bristle. The abdominal opening is somewhat larger. In connection with the fimbriae of the uterine tube, or with the broad ligament close to them, there are frequently one or more small pedunculated vessels. These are termed the appendices vesculosae, hydatids of Morgani. Structure The uterine tube consists of three coats, serous, muscular, and mucus. The external or serous coat is peritoneal. The middle or muscular coat consists of an external, longitudinal, and an internal circular layer of non-striped muscular fibers continuous with those of the uterus. The internal or mucous coat is continuous with the mucous lining of the uterus and at the abdominal ostium of the tube with the peritoneum it is thrown into longitudinal folds which in the ampulla are much more extensive than in the isthmus the lining epithelium is columnar and ciliated this form of epithelium is also found on the inner surface of the fimbriae which while on the outer or serous surfaces of these processes, the epithelium gradually merges from the endothelium 
of the peritoneum. Fertilization of the ovum is believed to occur in the tube, and the fertilized ovum is then normally passed on into the uterus. The ovum, however, may adhere to and undergo development in the uterine tube, giving rise to the commonest variety of ectopic gestation. In such cases the amnion and chorion are formed, but a true vestigia is never present, and the gestation usually ends by extrusion of the ovum through the abdominal ostium, although it is not uncommon for the tube to rupture into the peritoneal cavity, this being accompanied by severe hemorrhage and needing surgical interference. End of section 38、section、39 39 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. The Uterus, Womb. The uterus is a hollow, thick walled, muscular organ situated deeply in the pelvic cavity between the bladder and rectum. Into its upper part, the uterine tubes open, one on either side. while below its cavity communicates with that of the vagina when the ova are discharged from the ovaries they are carried to the uterine cavity through the uterine tubes if an ovum be fertilized it embeds itself in the uterine wall and is normally retained in the uterus until prenatal development is completed the uterus undergoing changes in size and structure to accommodate itself to the needs of the growing embryo after parturition the uterus returns almost to its former condition but certain traces of its enlargement remain. s It is necessary, therefore, to describe as the type form the adult virgin uterus, and then to consider the modifications which are effected as a result of pregnancy. In the virgin state, the uterus is flattened antero posteriorly and is piriform in shape, with the apex directed downward and backward. It lies between the bladder in front and the pelvic or sigmoid colon and rectum behind. It is completely within the pelvis, so that its base is below the level of the superior pelvic aperture. Its upper part is suspended by the broad and the round ligaments, while its lower portion is embedded in the fibrous tissue of the pelvis. The long axis of the uterus usually lies approximately in the axis of the superior pelvic aperture, but as the organ is freely movable, its position varies with the state of distension of the bladder and rectum. Except when much displaced by a fully distended bladder, it forms a forward angle with the vagina, since the axis of the vagina corresponds to the axes of the cavity and inferior aperture of the pelvis. The uterus measures about 7.5 cm in length, 5 cm in breadth at its upper part, and nearly 2.5 cm in thickness. It weighs from 30 to 40 grams. It is divisible into two portions. On the surface, about midway between the apex and base, is a slight constriction known as the isthmus, and corresponding to this in the interior is a narrowing of the uterine cavity, the internal orifice of the uterus. The portion above the isthmus is termed the body, and that below the cervix. The part of the body which lies above a plane passing through the points of entrance of the uterine tubes is known as the fundus. Body, corpus uteri. The body gradually narrows from the fundus to the isthmus. The vesicle or anterior surface, fasciae vesicalis, is flattened and covered by peritoneum, which is reflected onto the bladder to form the vesico uterine excavation. The surface lies in apposition with the bladder. The intestinal or posterior surface, fasciae intestinalis, is convex transversely and is covered by peritoneum, which is continued down onto the cervix and vagina. It is in relation with the sigmoid colon, from which it is usually separated by some coils of small intestine. The fundus, fundus uteri, is convex in all directions, and covered by peritoneum, continuous with that on the vesicle and intestinal surfaces. On it rest some coils of small intestine, and occasionally the distended sigmoid colon. The lateral margins, margo lateralis, are slightly convex. At the upper end of each, the uterine tube pierces the uterine wall. 
Below and in front of this point, the round ligament of the uterus is fixed, while behind it is the attachment of the ligament of the ovary. These three structures lie within a fold of peritoneum, which is reflected from the margin of the uterus to the wall of the pelvis, and is named the broad ligament. Cervix. Cervix uteri. Neck. The cervix is the lower constricted segment of the uterus. It is somewhat conical in shape, with its truncated apex directed downward and backward, but is slightly wider in the middle than either above or below. Owing to its relationships, it is less freely movable than the body, so that the latter may bend on it. The long axis of the cervix is therefore seldom in the same straight line as the long axis of the body. The long axis of the uterus as a whole presents the form of a curved line, with its concavity forward, or in extreme cases may present an angular bend at the region of the isthmus. The cervix projects through the anterior wall of the vagina, which divides it into an upper supravaginal portion and a lower vaginal portion. The supravaginal portion, portio supravaginalis cervicis, is separated in front from the bladder by fibrous tissue, parametrium, which extends also onto its sides and lateralward between the layers of the broad ligaments. The uterine arteries reach the margins of the cervix in this fibrous tissue, while on either side the ureter runs downward and forward in it, at a distance of about two centimeters from the cervix. Posteriorly, the supravaginal cervix is covered by peritoneum, which is prolonged below onto the posterior vaginal wall, when it is reflected onto the rectum, forming the recto-uterine excavation. It is in relation with the rectum, from which it may be separated by coils of small intestine. The vaginal portion, portio vaginalis cervicis, of the cervix, projects free into the anterior wall of the vagina between the anterior and posterior fornices. On its rounded extremity is a small, depressed, somewhat circular aperture, the external orifice of the uterus, through which the cavity of the cervix communicates with that of the vagina. The external orifice is bounded by two lips, an anterior and a posterior, of which the anterior is the shorter and thicker although, on account of the slope of the cervix, it projects lower than the posterior. Normally, both lips are in contact with the posterior vaginal wall. Interior of the uterus The cavity of the uterus is small in comparison with the size of the organ. The cavity of the body, cavum uteri, is a mere slit, flattened anteroposteriorly. It is triangular in shape the base being formed by the internal surface of the fundus between the orifices of the uterine tubes, the apex by the internal orifice of the uterus through which the cavity of the body communicates with the canal of the cervix. The canal of the cervix, canalis cervicis uteri, is somewhat fusiform, flattened from before backward, and broader at the middle than at either extremity. It communicates above through the internal orifice with the cavity of the body, and below, through the external orifice, with the vaginal cavity. The wall of the canal presents an anterior and a posterior longitudinal ridge, from each of which proceed a number of small oblique columns, the palmate folds, giving the appearance of branches from the stem of a tree. To this arrangement the name arbor vitae uterina is applied. The folds on the two walls are not exactly opposed, but fit between one another so as to close the cervical canal. The total length of the uterine cavity from the external orifice to the fundus is about 6.25 cm. Ligaments The ligaments of the uterus are eight in number, one anterior, one posterior, two lateral or broad, two uterosacral, and two round ligaments. The anterior ligament consists of the vesico-uterine fold of peritoneum, which is reflected onto the bladder from the front of the uterus, at the junction of the cervix and body. The posterior ligament consists of the rectovaginal fold of peritoneum, which is reflected from the back of the posterior fornix of the vagina onto the front of the rectum. It forms the bottom of a deep pouch called the recto-uterine excavation, which is bounded in front by the posterior wall of the uterus, the supravaginal cervix, and the posterior fornix of the vagina, behind, by the rectum, 
and laterally by two crescentic folds of peritoneum which pass backward from the cervix uteri on either side of the rectum to the posterior wall of the pelvis. These folds are named the sacrogenital or rectouterine folds. They contain a considerable amount of fibrous tissue and non-striped muscular fibers, which are attached to the front of the sacrum and constitute the uterosacral ligaments. The two lateral or broad ligaments, ligamentum latum uteri, pass from the sides of the uterus to the lateral walls of the pelvis. Together with the uterus they form a septum across the female pelvis, dividing that cavity into two portions. In the anterior part is contained the bladder, in the posterior part the rectum, and in certain conditions some coils of the small intestine and a part of the sigmoid colon. Between the two layers of each broad ligament are contained 1. The uterine tube superiorly, 2. The round ligament of the uterus, 3. The ovary and its ligament, 4. The epiophoran and paraophoran. 5. Connective tissue. 6. Unstriped muscular fibers. and 7. Blood vessels and nerves. The portion of the broad ligament which stretches from the uterine tube to the level of the ovary is known by the name of the mesosalpinx. Between the fimbriated extremity of the tube and the lower attachment of the broad ligament is a concave rounded margin called the infundibulopelvic ligament. The round ligaments, ligamentum teres uteri, are two flattened bands between 10 and 12 centimeters in length, situated between the layers of the broad ligament in front of and below the uterine tubes. Commencing on either side at the lateral angle of the uterus, this ligament is directed forward, upward, and lateralward over the external iliac vessels. It then passes through the abdominal inguinal ring and along the inguinal canal to the labium magus, in which it becomes lost. The round ligaments consist principally of muscular tissue, prolonged from the uterus, also of some fibrous and areolar tissue, besides blood vessels, lymphatics, and nerves, enclosed in a duplicature of peritoneum, which, in the fetus, is prolonged in the form of a tubular process for a short distance into the inguinal canal. This process is called the canal of Nuck. It is generally obliterated in the adult, but sometimes remains pervious even in advanced life. It is analogous to the saccus vaginalis, which precedes the descent of the testis. In addition to the ligaments just described, there is a band named the ligamentum transversalis colli, Mackenrot, on each side of the cervix uteri. It is attached to the side of the cervix uteri and to the vault and lateral fornix of the vagina, and is continuous externally with the fibrous tissue which surrounds the pelvic blood vessels. The form, size, and situation of the uterus vary at different periods of life and under different circumstances. In the fetus, the uterus is contained in the abdominal cavity, projecting beyond the superior aperture of the pelvis. The cervix is considerably larger than the body. At puberty, the uterus is piriform in shape and weighs from 14 to 17 grams. It has descended into the pelvis the fundus being just below the level of the superior aperture of this cavity. The palmate folds are distinct and extend to the upper part of the cavity of the organ. The position of the uterus in the adult is liable to considerable variation, depending chiefly on the condition of the bladder and rectum. When the bladder is empty, the entire uterus is directed forward and is at the same time bent on itself at the junction of the body and cervix so that the body lies upon the bladder. As the latter fills, the uterus gradually becomes more and more erect, until with a fully distended bladder the fundus may be directed backward toward the sacrum. During menstruation the organ is enlarged, more vascular, and its surfaces rounder. The external orifice is rounded, its labia swollen, and the lining membrane of the body thickened, softer, and of a darker color. According to Sir J. Williams, at each recurrence of menstruation, a molecular disintegration of the mucous membrane takes place, which leads to its complete removal, only the bases of the glands embedded in the muscle being left. At the cessation of menstruation, a fresh mucous membrane is formed by a proliferation of the remaining structures. During pregnancy, the uterus becomes enormously enlarged, and in the eighth month reaches the epigastric region. The increase in size is partly due to growth of pre-existing muscle, 
and partly to development of new fibers. After parturition, the uterus nearly regains its usual size, weighing about 42 grams, but its cavity is larger than in the virgin state. Its vessels are tortuous, and its muscular layers are more defined. The external orifice is more marked, and its edges present one or more fissures. In old age, the uterus becomes atrophied and paler and denser in texture. A more distinct constriction separates the body and cervix. The internal orifice is frequently, and the external orifice occasionally, obliterated, while the lips almost entirely disappear. Structure The uterus is composed of three coats, an external or serous, a middle or muscular, and an internal or mucus. The serous coat, tunica serosa, is derived from the peritoneum. It invests the fundus and the whole of the intestinal surface of the uterus, but covers the vesicle surface only as far as the junction of the body and cervix. In the lower fourth of the intestinal surface, the peritoneum, though covering the uterus, is not closely connected with it, being separated from it by a layer of loose cellular tissue and some large veins. The muscular coat, tunica muscularis, forms the chief bulk of the substance of the uterus. In the virgin, it is dense, firm, of a grayish color, and cuts almost like cartilage. It is thick opposite the middle of the body and fundus, and thin at the orifices of the uterine tubes. It consists of bundles of unstriped muscular fibers, disposed in layers, intermixed with areolar tissue, blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and nerves. The layers are three in number, external, middle, and internal. The external and middle layers constitute the muscular coat proper, while the inner layer is a greatly hypertrophied muscularis mucosae. During pregnancy, the muscular tissue becomes more prominently developed, the fibers being greatly enlarged. The external layer, placed beneath the peritoneum, is disposed as a thin plane on the vesicle and intestinal surfaces. It consists of fibers which pass transversely across the fundus, and, converging at each lateral angle of the uterus, are continued on to the uterine tube, the round ligament, and the ligament of the ovary, some passing at each side into the broad ligament, and others running backward from the cervix into the sacro-uterine ligaments. The middle layer of fibers presents no regularity in its arrangement, being disposed longitudinally, obliquely, and transversely. It contains more blood vessels than either of the other two layers. The internal, or deep layer, consists of circular fibers arranged in the form of two hollow cones, the apices of which surround the orifices of the uterine tubes, their bases intermingling with one another on the middle of the body of the uterus. At the internal orifice, these circular fibers form a distinct sphincter. The mucous membrane, tunica mucosa, is smooth and closely adherent to the subjacent tissue. It is continuous through the fimbriated extremity of the uterine tubes with the peritoneum, and through the external uterine orifice with the lining of the vagina. In the body of the uterus, the mucous membrane is smooth, soft, of a pale red color, lined by columnar ciliated epithelium, and presents, when viewed with a lens, the orifices of numerous tubular follicles arranged perpendicularly to the surface. The structure of the corium differs from that of ordinary mucous membranes, and consists of an embryonic, nucleated, and highly cellular form of connective tissue, in which run numerous large lymphatics. In it are the tube-like uterine glands, lined by ciliated columnar epithelium. They are of small size in the unimpregnated uterus, but shortly after impregnation become enlarged and elongated, presenting a contorted or waved appearance. In the cervix, the mucous membrane is sharply differentiated from that of the uterine cavity. It is thrown into numerous oblique ridges, which diverge from an anterior and posterior longitudinal raphe. In the upper two-thirds of the canal, the mucous membrane is provided with numerous deep glandular follicles, which secrete a clear, viscid, alkaline mucus. And, in addition, extending through the whole length of the canal, is a variable number of little cysts, presumably follicles which have become occluded and distended with retained secretion. They are called the ovula nebothi. The mucous membrane covering the lower half of the cervical canal presents numerous papillae. The epithelium of the upper two-thirds is cylindrical and ciliated, 
but below this it loses its cilia, and gradually changes to stratified squamous epithelium, close to the external orifice. On the vaginal surface of the cervix, the epithelium is similar to that lining the vagina, that is, stratified squamous. Vessels and Nerves the arteries of the uterus are the uterine, from the hypogastric, and the ovarian, from the abdominal aorta. They are remarkable for their tortuous course in the substance of the organ, and for their frequent anastomoses. The termination of the ovarian artery meets that of the uterine artery, and forms an anastomotic trunk from which branches are given off to supply the uterus, their disposition being circular. The veins are of large size, and correspond with the arteries. They end in the uterine plexuses. In the impregnated uterus, the arteries carry the blood to, and the veins convey it away from, the intervillous space of the placenta. The lymphatics are described on page 714. The nerves are derived from the hypogastric and ovarian plexuses, and from the third and fourth sacral nerves. End of section 39. Section 40 of Grey's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Clifton. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5 by Henry Grey. Section 40. The Vagina. The vagina extends from the vestibule to the uterus and is situated behind the bladder and in front of the rectum. It is directed upward and backward, its axis forming with that of the uterus an angle of over 90 degrees, opening forward. Its walls are ordinarily in contact, and the usual shape of its lower part on transverse section is that of an H, the transverse limb being slightly curved forward or backward, while the lateral limbs are somewhat convex towards the median line. Its middle part has the appearance of a transverse slit. Its length is 6 to 7.5 centimetres along its anterior wall and 9 centimetres along its posterior wall. It is constricted at its commencement, dilated in the middle, and narrowed near its uterine extremity. It surrounds the vaginal portion of the cervix uteri, a short distance from the external orifice of the uterus, its attachment extending higher up on the posterior than on the anterior wall of the uterus. To the recess behind the cervix, the term posterior fornix is applied, while the smaller recesses in front and at the sides are called the anterior and lateral fornices. Relations The anterior surface of the vagina is in relation with the fundus of the bladder and with the urethra, its posterior surface is separated from the rectum by the recto-uterine excavation in its upper fourth and by the recto-vesical fascia in its middle two-fourths. The lower fourth is separated from the anal canal by the perineal body. Its sides are enclosed between the levatories ani muscles. As the terminal portions of the ureters pass forward and medial wood to reach the fundus of the bladder, they run close to the lateral fornices of the vagina and as they enter the bladder are slightly in front of the anterior fornix. Structure The vagina consists of an internal mucus lining and a muscular coat separated by a layer of erectile tissue. The mucous membrane, tunica mucosa, is continuous above with that lining the uterus. Its inner surface presents two longitudinal ridges, one on its anterior and one on its posterior wall. These ridges are called the columns of the vagina, and from them numerous transverse ridges or rugae extend outward on either side. These rugae are divided by furrows of variable depth, giving to the mucous membrane the appearance of being studded over with conical projections or papillae. They are most numerous near the orifice of the vagina, especially before parturition. The epithelium covering the mucous membrane is of the stratified squamous variety. The submucous tissue is very loose and contains numerous large veins which by their anastomoses form a plexus together with smooth muscular fibres derived from the muscular coat. It is regarded by Gussenbauer as an erectile tissue. 
It contains a number of mucous crypts, but no true glands. The muscular coat, tunica muscularis, consists of two layers, an external longitudinal, which is by far the stronger, and an internal circular layer. The longitudinal fibres are continuous with the superficial muscular fibres of the uterus. The strongest fasciculi are those attached to the recto-vesical fascia on either side. The two layers are not distinctly separable from each other, but are connected by oblique decussating fasciculi, which pass from the one layer to the other. In addition to this, the vagina at its lower end is surrounded by a band of striped muscular fibres, the bulbocavernosus. External to the muscular coat is a layer of connective tissue containing a large plexus of blood vessels. The erectile tissue consists of a layer of loose connective tissue situated between the mucous membrane and the muscular coat. Embedded in it is a plexus of large veins and numerous bundles of unstriped muscular fibres derived from the circular muscular layer. The arrangement of the veins is similar to that found in other erectile tissues. The external organs. Parties genitales externe muliebris. The external genital organs of the female are the mons pubis, the labia majora et minora pudendi, the clitoris, the vestibule of the vagina, the bulb of the vestibule, and the greater vestibular glands. The term pudendum or vulva, as generally applied, includes all these parts. The mons pubis, commissura labiorum anterior, mons veneris, the rounded eminence in front of the pubic symphysis, is formed by a collection of fatty tissue beneath the integument. It becomes covered with hair at the time of puberty. The labia majora, labia majora pudendi, are two prominent longitudinal cutaneous folds which extend downward and backward from the mons pubis and form the lateral boundaries of a fissure or cleft, the pudendal cleft or rima, into which the vagina and urethra open. Each labium has two surfaces, an outer, pigmented and covered with strong, crisp hairs, and an inner, smooth and beset with large, sebaceous follicles. Between the two there is considerable quantity of areolar tissue, fat, and a tissue resembling the dartos tunic of the scrotum, besides vessels, nerves, and glands. The labia are thicker in front, where they form by their meeting the anterior labial commissure. Posteriorly, they are not really joined, but appear to become lost in the neighbouring integument, ending close to and nearly parallel with each other. Together with the connecting skin between them, they form the posterior labial commissure or posterior boundary of the pudendum. The interval between the posterior commissure and the anus, from 2.5 to 3 centimetres in length, constitutes the perineum. The labia majora correspond to the scrotum in the male. The labia minora, labia minora pudendi, nymphae, are two small cutaneous folds situated between the labia majora and extending from the clitoris obliquely downward, lateralward, and backward for about four centimetres on either side of the orifice of the vagina, between which and the labia majora they end. In the virgin, the posterior ends of the labia minora are usually joined across the middle line by a fold of skin named the frenulum of the labia or fourchette. Anteriorly, each labium minus divides into two portions. The upper division passes above the clitoris to meet its fellow of the opposite side, forming a fold which overhangs the glans clitoridis and is named the prepucium clitoridis. The lower division passes beneath the clitoris and becomes united to its undersurface, forming, with its fellow of the opposite side, the frenulum of the clitoris. On the opposed surfaces of the labia minora are numerous sebaceous follicles. The clitoris is an erectile structure, homologous with the penis. It is situated beneath the anterior labial commissure, partially hidden between the anterior ends of the labia minora. It consists of two corpora cavernosa, composed of erectile tissue enclosed in a dense layer of fibrous membrane, united together along their medial surfaces 
by an incomplete fibrous pectiniform septum. Each corpus is connected to the rami of the pubis and ischium by a crus. The free extremity, glans clitoridis, is a small rounded tubercle consisting of spongy erectile tissue and highly sensitive. The clitoris is provided, like the penis, with a suspensory ligament and with two small muscles, the ischiocabinosi, which are inserted into the crura of the clitoris. The vestibule, vestibulum vaginae. The cleft between the labia minora and behind the glans clitoridis is named the vestibule of the vagina. In it are seen the urethral and vaginal orifices and the openings of the ducts of the greater vestibular glands. The external urethral orifice, orificium urethrae externum, urinary meatus, is placed about 2.5 cm behind the glans clitoridis and immediately in front of that of the vagina. It usually assumes the form of a short sagittal cleft with slightly raised margins. The vaginal orifice is a median slit below and behind the opening of the urethra. Its size varies inversely with that of the hymen. The hymen is a thin fold of mucous membrane situated at the orifice of the vagina. The inner edges of the fold are normally in contact with each other, and the vaginal orifice appears as a cleft between them. The hymen varies much in shape. When stretched, its commonest form is that of a ring, generally broadest posteriorly. Sometimes it is represented by a semilunar fold, with its concave margin turned towards the pubes. Occasionally it is cribriform, or its free margin forms a membranous fringe. It may be entirely absent, or may form a complete septum across the lower end of the vagina. The latter condition is known as an imperforate hymen. It may persist after copulation, so that its presence cannot be considered as a sign of virginity. When the hymen has been ruptured, small rounded elevations known as the carunculi hymenales are found at its remains. Between the hymen and the frenulum of the labia is a shallow depression named the navicular fossa. The bulb of the vestibule, bulbus vestibuli, vaginal bulb, is the homologue of the bulb and adjoining part of the corpus cavernosum urethrae of the male, and consists of two elongated masses of erectile tissue placed one on either side of the vaginal orifice and united to each other in front by a narrow median band termed the pars intermedia. Each lateral mass measures a little over 2.5 centimetres in length. Their posterior ends are expanded and are in contact with the greater vestibular glands. Their anterior ends are tapered and joined to one another by the pars intermedia. Their deep surfaces are in contact with the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm. Superficially, they are covered by the bulbocavernosus. The greater vestibular glands, glandulae vestibularis major, Bartolini, Bartolin's glands, are the homologues of the bulbo-urethral glands in the male. They consist of two small, roundish bodies of a reddish-yellow colour, situated one on either side of the vaginal orifice, in contact with the posterior end of each lateral mass of the bulb of the vestibule. Each gland opens by means of a duct, about two centimetres long, immediately lateral to the hymen, in the groove between it and the labium minus. End of section 40 Recording by Roger Clifton, St. Albans, England Section 41 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeannie Whitfield. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. Chapter 11, Splanchnology, Section 3D, The Female Genital Organs, Part 6, The Mammae. Mammary glands, breast. The mammae secrete milk and are accessory glands of the generative system. They exist in the male as well as in the female, but in the former only in the rudimentary state. 
unless their growth is excited by peculiar circumstances. In the female, they are two large hemispherical eminences lying within the superficial fascia and situated on the front and sides of the chest. Each extends from the second rib above to the sixth rib below, and from the side of the sternum to near the mid-axillary line. Their weight and dimensions differ at different periods of life and in different individuals. Before puberty, they are of small size but enlarge as the generative organs become more completely developed. They increase during pregnancy and especially after delivery, and become atrophied in old age. The left mamma is generally a little larger than the right. The deep surface of each is nearly circular, flattened, or slightly concave, and has its long diameter directed upward and lateralward toward the axilla. It is separated from the fascia covering the pectoralis major, serratus anterior, and obliquus externus abdominis by loose connective tissue. The subcutaneous surface of the mamma is convex and presents just below the center a small conical prominence, the papilla. The mammary papilla or nipple, papilla mammae, is a cylindrical or conical eminence situated above the level of the fourth intercostal space. It is capable of undergoing a sort of erection from mechanical excitement, a change mainly due to the contractions of its muscular fibers. It is of a pink or brownish hue its surface wrinkled and provided with secondary papillae, and it is perforated by from fifteen to twenty orifices, the apertures of the lactiferous ducts. The base of the mammary papilla is surrounded by an areola. In the virgin, the areola is of a delicate rosy hue. About the second month after impregnation, it enlarges and acquires a darker tinge, and as pregnancy advances, it may assume a dark brown or even black color. This color diminishes as soon as lactation is over but is never entirely lost throughout life. These changes in the color of the areola are of importance in forming a conclusion in a case of suspected first pregnancy. Near the base of the papilla and upon the surface of the areola are numerous large sebaceous glands, the areolar glands, which become much enlarged during lactation and present the appearance of small tubercles beneath the skin. These glands secrete a peculiar fatty substance, which serves as a protection to the integument of the papilla during the act of sucking. The mammillary papilla consists of numerous vessels, intermixed with plain muscular fibers, which are principally arranged in a circular manner around the base, some few fibers radiating from base to apex. Development the mamma is developed partly from mesoderm and partly from ectoderm, its blood vessels and connective tissues being derived from the former its cellular elements from the latter. Its first rudiment is seen about the third month, in the form of a number of small inward projections of the ectoderm, which invade the mesoderm. From these secondary tracts of cellular elements radiate and subsequently give rise to the epithelium of the glandular follicles and ducts. The development of the follicles, however, remains imperfect, except in the Paris female. Structure the mamma consists of gland tissue, of fibrous tissue connecting its lobes, and of fatty tissue in the intervals between the lobes. The gland tissue, when freed from fibrous tissue and fat, is of a pale reddish color, firm in texture, flattened from before, backward, and thicker in the center than in the circumference. The subcutaneous surface of the mamma presents numerous irregular processes which project toward the skin and are joined to it by bands of connective tissue. It consists of numerous lobes, and these are composed of lobules connected together by areolar tissue, blood vessels, and ducts. The smallest lobules consist of a cluster of rounded alveoli, which open into the smallest branches of the lactiferous ducts. These ducts unite to form larger ducts, and these end in a single canal corresponding with one of the chief subdivisions of the gland. The number of excretory ducts varies from 15 to 20. They are termed the tubuli lactiferi. They converge toward the areola, beneath which they form dilations of ampullae, which serve as reservoirs for the milk, and, in the base of the papillae, become contracted and pursue a straight course to its summit, perforating it by separate orifices considerably narrower than the ducts themselves. These ducts are composed of areolar tissue, containing longitudinal and transverse elastic fibers. Muscular fibers are entirely absent. They are lined by columnar epithelium resting on a basement membrane. The epithelium of the mamma differs according to the state of activity of the organ. In the gland of a woman who is not pregnant or suckling, the alveoli are very small and solid, 
being filled with a mass of granular polyhedral cells. During pregnancy, the alveoli change, and the cells undergo rapid multiplication at the commencement of lactation. The cells in the center of the alveolus undergo fatty degeneration and are eliminated in the first milk as colostrum corpuscles. The peripheral cells of the alveolus remains and form a single layer of granular short columnar cells with spherical nuclei lining the basement membrane. The cells, during the state of activity of the gland, are capable of forming in their interior oil globules, which are then ejected into the lumen of the alveolus and constitute the milk globules. When the acini are distended by the accumulation of the secretion, the lining epithelium becomes flattened. The fibrous tissue invests the entire surface of the mamma and sends down septa between its lobes connecting them together. The fatty tissue covers the surface of the gland and occupies the interval between its lobes. It usually exists in considerable abundance and determines the form and size of the gland. There is no fat immediately beneath the areola and papilla. Vessels and Nerves The arteries supplying the mammae are derived from the thoracic branches of the axillary, the intercostals, and the internal mammary. The veins described an anastomatic circle around the base of the papillae, called by Haller the circulus venosus. From this large branches transmit the blood to the circumference of the gland, and end in the axillary and internal mammary veins. The lymphatics are described on page 715. The nerves are derived from the anterior and lateral cutaneous branches of the 4th, 5th, and 6th thoracic nerves. End of chapter 11, Splanchnology, section 3D, the female genital organs, part 6, the mammae. Recording by Jeannie Whitfield. Section 42 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. The Ductless Glands. There are certain organs which are very similar to secreting glands, but differ from them in one essential particular. That is, they do not possess any ducts by which their secretion is discharged. These organs are known as ductless glands. They are capable of internal secretion, that is to say, of forming, from materials brought to them in the blood, substances which have a certain influence upon the nutritive and other changes going on in the body. This secretion is carried into the bloodstream, either directly by the veins or indirectly through the medium of the lymphatics. These glands include the thyroid, the parathyroids and the thymus, the pituitary body and the pineal body, the chromophyll and cortical systems to which belong the suprarenals, the paraganglia and aortic glands, the glomus caroticum, and perhaps the glomus coccygium. The spleen is usually included in this list, and sometimes the lymph and hemolymph nodes described with the lymphatic system. Other glands, as the liver, pancreas, and sexual glands, give off internal secretions, as do the gastric and intestinal mucous membranes. The thyroid gland, glandula, thyroidea, thyroid body. The thyroid gland is a highly vascular organ situated at the front and sides of the neck. It consists of right and left lobes connected across the middle line by a narrow portion, the isthmus. Its weight is somewhat variable, but is usually about 30 grams. It is slightly heavier in the female, in whom it becomes enlarged during menstruation and pregnancy. The lobes, lobuli, glanduli, thyroidea, are conical in shape, the apex of each being directed upward and lateralward, as far as the junction of the middle with the lower third of the thyroid cartilage. The base looks downward and is on a level with the fifth or sixth tracheal ring. Each lobe is about five centimeters long. Its greatest width is about three centimeters, and its thickness about two centimeters. The lateral or superficial surface is convex and covered by the skin, the superficial and deep fascia, the sternocleidomastoideus, the superior belly of the omohyoideus, the sternohyoideus and sternothyroideus, and beneath the last muscle by the pretracheal layer of the deep fascia, which forms a capsule for the gland. The deep or medial surface is molded over the underlying structures. These are the thyroid and cricoid cartilages, the trachea, the constrictor pharyngeus inferior and posterior part of the cricothyroideus, the esophagus, particularly on the left side of the neck, the superior and inferior thyroid arteries, and the recurrent nerves. 
The anterior border is thin, and inclines obliquely from above, downward, toward the middle line of the neck, while the posterior border is thick and overlaps the common carotid artery, and, as a rule, the parathyroids. The isthmus, isthmus glandulae thyroidea, connects together the lower thirds of the lobes. It measures about 1.25 centimeters in breadth, and the same in depth, and usually covers the second and third rings of the trachea. Its situation and size present, however, many variations. In the middle line of the neck, it is covered by the skin and fascia, and close to the middle line, on either side, by the sternothyroidus. Across its upper border runs an anastomotic branch uniting the two superior thyroid arteries. At its lower border are the inferior thyroid veins. Sometimes the isthmus is altogether wanting. A third lobe, of conical shape, called the pyramidal lobe, frequently arises from the upper part of the isthmus, or from the adjacent portion of either lobe, but most commonly the left, and ascends as far as the hyoid bone. It is occasionally quite detached, or may be divided into two or more parts. A fibrous or muscular band is sometimes found attached above to the body of the hyoid bone, and below to the isthmus of the gland, or its pyramidal lobe. When muscular, it is termed the levator glandulae thyroidae, Small detached portions of thyroid tissue are sometimes found in the vicinity of the lateral lobes or above the isthmus. They are called accessory thyroid glands, glandulae thyroidii accessorii. Development. The thyroid gland is developed from a median diverticulum, which appears about the fourth week on the summit of the tuberculum impar, but later is found in the furrow immediately behind the tuberculum. It grows downward and backward as a tubular duct, which bifurcates and subsequently subdivides into a series of cellular cords, from which the isthmus and lateral lobes of the thyroid gland are developed. The ultimobranchial bodies from the fifth pharyngeal pouches are enveloped by the lateral lobes of the thyroid gland. They undergo atrophy and do not form true thyroid tissue. The connection of the diverticulum with the pharynx is termed the thyroglossal duct, its continuity is subsequently interrupted, and it undergoes degeneration, its upper end being represented by the foramen cecum of the tongue, and its lower by the pyramidal lobe of the thyroid gland. Structure. The thyroid gland is invested by a thin capsule of connective tissue, which projects into its substance, and imperfectly divides it into masses of irregular form and size. When the organ is cut into, it is of a brownish-red color, and is seen to be made up of a number of closed vesicles containing a yellow, glary fluid, and separated from each other by intermediate connective tissue. The vesicles of the thyroid of the adult animal are generally closed spherical sacs, but in some young animals, for example young dogs, the vesicles are more or less tubular and branched. This appearance is supposed to be due to the mode of growth of the gland, and merely indicates that an increase in the number of vesicles is taking place. Each vesicle is lined by a single layer of cubical epithelium. There does not appear to be a basement membrane, so that the epithelial cells are in direct contact with the connective tissue reticulum which supports the acini. The vesicles are of various sizes and shapes, and contain as a normal product a viscid, homogeneous, semi-fluid, slightly yellowish, colloid material. Red corpuscles are found in it in various stages of disintegration and decolorization, the yellow tinge being probably due to the hemoglobin, which is thus set free from the colored corpuscles. The colloid material contains an iodine compound, iodothyrin, and is readily stained by eosin. According to Bensley, the thyroid gland prepares and secretes into the vascular channels a substance formed under normal conditions in the outer pole of the cell and excreted from it directly without passing by the indirect route through the follicular cavity. In addition to this direct mode of secretion, there is an indirect mode, which consists in the condensation of the secretion into the form of droplets, having high content of solids, and the extension of these droplets into the follicular cavity. These droplets are formed in the same zone of the cell as that in which the primary or direct secretion is formed. This internal secretion of the thyroid is supposed to contain a specific hormone which acts as a chemical stimulus to other tissues, increasing their metabolism. Vessels and Nerves The arteries supplying the thyroid gland are the superior and inferior thyroids, and sometimes an additional branch, thyroidia ema, from the innominate artery, or the arch of the aorta, 
which ascends upon the front of the trachea. The arteries are remarkable for their large size and frequent anastomoses. The veins form a plexus on the surface of the gland and on the front of the trachea. From this plexus the superior, middle, and inferior thyroid veins arise. The superior and middle end in the internal jugular, the inferior in the innominate vein. The capillary blood vessels form a dense plexus in the connective tissue around the vesicles, between the epithelium of the vesicles and the endothelium of the lymphatics, which surround a greater or smaller part of the circumference of the vesicle. The lymphatic vessels run in the interlobular connective tissue, not uncommonly surrounding the arteries which they accompany, and communicate with a network in the capsule of the gland. They may contain colloid material. They end in the thoracic and right lymphatic trunks. The nerves are derived from the middle and inferior cervical ganglia of the sympathetic. The parathyroid glands. The parathyroid glands are small brownish-red bodies situated, as a rule, between the posterior borders of the lateral lobes of the thyroid gland and its capsule. They differ from it in structure, being composed of masses of cells arranged in a more or less columnar fashion, with numerous intervening capillaries. They measure, on an average, about 6 mm in length, and from 3 to 4 mm in breadth, and usually present the appearance of flattened oval discs. They are divided, according to their situation, into superior and inferior. The superior, usually two in number, are the more constant in position, and are situated, one on either side, at the level of the lower border of the cricoid cartilage, behind the junction of the pharynx and esophagus. The inferior, also usually two in number, may be applied to the lower edge of the lateral lobes, or placed at some little distance below the thyroid glands, or found in relation to one of the inferior thyroid veins. In man they number four as a rule. Fewer than four were found in less than one percent of over a thousand persons, papyri, but more than four in over thirty-three percent of a hundred and twenty-two bodies examined by Sivaleri. In addition, numerous minute islands of parathyroid tissue may be found scattered in the connective tissue and fat of the neck around the parathyroid glands proper, and quite distinct from them. Development. The parathyroid bodies are developed as outgrowths from the third and fourth branchial pouches. A pair of diverticula arise from the fifth branchial pouch and formed what are termed the ultimobranchial bodies. These fuse with the thyroid gland, but probably contribute no true thyroid tissue. Structure. Microscopically, the parathyroids consist of intercommunicating columns of cells supported by connective tissue containing a rich supply of blood capillaries. Most of the cells are clear, but some, larger in size, contain oxyphil granules. Vesicles containing colloid have been described as occurring in the parathyroid, but the observation has not been confirmed. No doubt the parathyroid glands produce an internal secretion essential to the well-being of the human economy, but it is still a matter of dispute what symptoms of disease are produced by their removal and suppression of their secretion. Papari believes that they show signs of exceptional activity during pregnancy, and that parathyroid insufficiency is a main factor in the production of tetany in infants and adults, of eclampsia, and of certain sorts of fits. It is probable that the tetany following parathyroidectomy is due to the accumulation of ammonium carbonate, and Kendall has suggested that the function of the parathyroid is to convert ammonium carbonate into urea. End of section 42. Section 43 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeannie Whitfield. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5 by Henry Gray. Section 43. The Thymus. 4C. The Thymus. The thymus is a temporary organ attaining its largest size at the time of puberty. Haymar. When it ceases to grow, gradually dwindles and almost disappears. If examined when its growth is most active, it will be found to consist of two lateral lobes placed in close contact along the middle line situated partly in the thorax, partly in the neck, and extending from the fourth costal cartilage upward, as high as the lower border of the thyroid gland. It is covered by the sternum, and by the origins of the sternohyoidae, and the sternothyroidei, 
below it rests upon the pericardium being separated from the aortic arch and great vessels by a layer of fascia in the neck it lies on the front and sides of the trachea being the sternohyoidi and sternothyroidii the two lobes generally differ in size they are occasionally united so as to form a single mass and sometimes separated by an intermediate lobe the thymus is of a pinkish gray color soft and lobulated on its surfaces it is about five centimeters in length four centimeters in breadth below and about six millimeters in thickness at birth it weighs about fifteen grams at puberty its weight is about thirty five grams after this it gradually decreases to twenty five grams at twenty five years and less than fifteen grams at sixty and about six grams at seventy years development the thymus appears in the form of two flask shaped intodermal diverticula which arise one on either side from the third brachial pouch and extend lateralward and backward into the surrounding mesoderm in front of the ventral aorta here they meet and become joined to one another by connective tissue but there is never any fusion of the thymus tissue proper the pharyngeal opening of each diverticulum is soon obliterated but the neck of the flask persists for some time as a cellular cord by further proliferation of the cells lining the flask buds of cells are formed which become surrounded and isolated by invading mesoderm in the latter numerous lymphoid cells make their appearance and are aggregated to form lymphoid follicles these lymphoid cells are probably derivatives of the intodermal cells which line the original diverticula and their subdivisions additional portion of thymus tissues are sometimes developed from the fourth branchial pouches thymus continues to grow until the time of puberty and then begins to atrophy structure each lateral lobe is composed of numerous lobules held together by delicate areolar tissue the entire gland being enclosed in an investing capsule of similar but denser structure the primary lobules vary in size from that of a pin's head to that of a small pea and are made up of a number of small nodules or follicles which are irregular in shape and are more or less fused together especially toward the interior of the gland each follicle is from one to two millimeters in diameter and consists of a medullary and a cortical portion these differ in many essential particulars from each other the cortical portion is mainly composed of lymphoid cells supported by a network of finely branched cells which is continuous with a similar network in the medullary portion the network forms an adventia to the blood vessels in the medullary portion the reticulum is coarser than the cortex the lymphoid cells are relatively fewer in number and there are found peculiar nest-like bodies the concentric corpuscles of hassel these concentric corpuscles are composed of a central mass consisting of one or more glandular cells and of a capsule which is formed of epithelioid cells they are the remains of the epithelial tubes which grow out from the third branchial pouches of the embryo to form the thymus each follicle is surrounded by a vascular plexus from which vessels pass into the interior and radiate from the periphery toward the center forming a second zone just within the margin of the medullary portion in the center of the medullary portion there are very few vessels and they are of minute size watney has made the important observation that hemoglobin is found in the thymus either in cysts or in cells situated near to or forming part of the concentric corpuscles this hemoglobin occurs as granules or as circular masses exactly resembling colored blood corpuscles he has also discovered in the lymph in issuing from the thymus similar cells to those found in the gland and like them containing hemoglobin in the form of either granules or masses from these facts he arrives at the conclusion that the gland is one source of the colored blood corpuscles more recently schaefer has observed actual nucleated red blood corpuscles in the thymus the function of the thymus is obscure it seems to furnish during the period of growth an internal secretion concerned with some phases of body metabolism especially that of the sexual glands vessels and nerves 
The arteries supplying the thymus are derived from the internal mammary and from the superior inferior thyroids. The veins end in the left innominate vein and in the thyroid veins. The lymphatics are described on page 698. The nerves are exceedingly minute. They are derived from the vagi and sympathetic. Branches of the descendants hypoglossy and phrenic reach the investing capsule but do not penetrate into the substance of the gland. End of section 43. Recording by Jeannie Whitfield. Section 44 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. The Hypothesis Cerebri. The hypothesis, pituitary body, is a small reddish-gray body, about one centimeter in diameter, attached to the end of the infundibulum of the brain and resting in the hypotheseal fossa. The hypothesis consists of an anterior and a posterior lobe, which differ from one another in their mode of development and in their structure. The anterior lobe is the larger and is somewhat kidney-shaped, the concavity being directed backward and embracing the posterior lobe. It consists of a pars anterior and a pars intermedia, separated from each other by a narrow cleft, the remnant of the pouch or diverticulum. The pars anterior is extremely vascular and consists of epithelial cells of varying size and shape, arranged in cord-like trabeculae or alveoli, and separated by large, thin-walled blood vessels. The pars intermedia is a thin lamina closely applied to the body and neck of the posterior lobe, and extending onto the neighboring parts of the brain. It contains few blood vessels, and consists of finely granular cells, between which are small masses of colloid material. The pars intermedia, in spite of the fact that it arises in common with the pars anterior from the ectoderm of the primitive buccal cavity, is often considered as a part of the posterior lobe which arises from the floor of the third ventricle of the brain. Although of nervous origin, the posterior lobe contains no nerve cells or fibers. It consists of neuroglia cells and fibers, and is invaded by columns which grow into it from the pars intermedia. Embedded in it are large quantities of a colloid substance histologically similar to that found in the thyroid gland. In certain of the lower vertebrates, for example fishes, nervous structures are present, and the lobe is of large size. From the pars intermedia, a substance, no doubt an internal secretion, causes constriction of the blood vessels with rise of arterial blood pressure. This substance seems to have a stimulating effect on most of the smooth muscles, acting directly upon the muscle causing contraction. It also increases the secretion of the urine, of the mammary glands when in functional activity, and of the cerebrospinal fluid. Extracts of this lobe also influence the general metabolism of the carbohydrates by accelerating the process of glycogenolysis in the liver. The pars anterior exercises a stimulating effect on the growth of the skeleton and probably on connective tissues in general. Enlargement of the hypothesis and of the cavity of the cella tersica are found in the rare disease acromegaly, which is characterized by a gradual enlargement of the face, hands, and feet with headache and often a peculiar type of blindness. This blindness is due to the pressure of the enlarging hypothesis on the optic chiasma. Development of the hypothesis cerebri. This in the adult consists of a large anterior, consisting of the pars anterior and the pars intermedia, and a small posterior lobe. The former is derived from the ectoderm of the stomadium, the latter from the floor of the forebrain. About the fourth week, there appears a pouch-like diverticulum of the ectodermal lining of the roof of the stomadium. This diverticulum, pouch of Rathke, is the rudiment of the anterior lobe of the hypothesis. It extends upward in front of the cephalic end of the notochord and the remnant of the buccopharyngeal membrane, and comes into contact with the under surface of the forebrain. It is then constricted off to form a closed vesicle but remains, for a time, connected to the ectoderm of the stomadium by a solid cord of cells. Masses of epithelial cells form on either side and in the front wall of the vesicle, and by the growth between these of a stroma from the mesoderm, the development of the anterior lobe is completed. 
the upwardly directed hypotheseal involution becomes applied to the anterolateral aspect of a downwardly directed diverticulum from the base of the forebrain. This diverticulum constitutes the future infundibulum in the floor of the third ventricle, while its inferior extremity becomes modified to form the posterior lobe of the hypothesis. In some of the lower animals, the posterior lobe contains nerve cells and nerve fibers, but in man and the higher vertebrates, these are replaced by connective tissue. A canal, craniopharyngeal canal, is sometimes found extending from the anterior part of the fossa hypophyseos of the sphenoid bone to the undersurface of the skull, and marks the original position of Rathke's pouch, while at the junction of the septum of the nose with the palate, traces of the stomadial end are occasionally present. Fraser. The pineal body. The pineal body, epiphysis, is a small reddish-gray body about 8 millimeters in length, which lies in the depression between the superior colliculi. It is attached to the roof of the third ventricle near its junction with the midbrain. It develops as an outgrowth from the third ventricle of the brain. In early life, it has a glandular structure which reaches its greatest development at about the seventh year. Later, especially after puberty, the glandular tissue gradually disappears and is replaced by connective tissue. Structure the pineal body is destitute of nervous substance, and consists of follicles lined by epithelium and enveloped by connective tissue. These follicles contain a variable quantity of gritty material composed of phosphate and carbonate of calcium, phosphate of magnesium and ammonia, and a little animal matter. It contains a substance which, if injected intravenously, causes fall of blood pressure. It seems probable that the gland furnishes an internal secretion in children that inhibits the development of the reproductive glands, since the invasion of the gland in children by pathological growths which practically destroy the glandular tissue results in accelerated development of the sexual organs, increased growth of the skeleton, and precocious mentality. End of section 44「Section 45 of Gray's Anatomy Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. The Chromophyll and Cortical Systems. Chromophyll, or chromophyn cells, so-called because they stain yellow or brownish with chromium salts, are associated with the ganglia of the sympathetic nervous system. Development. They arise in common with the sympathetic cells from the neural crest, and are therefore ectodermal in origin. The chromophyll and sympathetic cells are indistinguishable from one another at the time of their migration from the spinal ganglia to the regions occupied in the adult. Differentiation of chromophyll cells begins in embryos about 18 millimeters in length, but is not complete until about birth. The chromophylloblasts increase in size more than the sympathoblasts and stain less intensely with ordinary dyes. Later, the chrome reaction develops. The aortic bodies differentiate first and are prominent in 20 millimeter embryos. The paraganglia of the sympathetic plexuses differentiate next and last of all the paraganglia of the sympathetic trunk. The carotid body is completely differentiated in 30 millimeter embryos. After birth, the chromophyll organs degenerate, but the paraganglia can be recognized with the microscope in sites ordinarily occupied by them. The paraganglia are small groups of chromophyll cells connected with the ganglia of the sympathetic trunk and the ganglia of the celiac, renal, suprarenal, aortic, and hypogastric plexuses. They are sometimes found in connection with the ganglia of other sympathetic plexuses. None have been found with the sympathetic ganglia associated with the branches of the trigeminal nerve. The aortic glands, or bodies, are the largest of these groups of chromophyll cells, and measure, in the newborn, about one centimeter in length. They lie one on either side of the aorta in the region of the inferior mesenteric artery. They decrease in size with age and after puberty are only visible with the microscope. About forty they disappear entirely. Other groups of chromophyll cells have been found associated with the sympathetic plexuses of the abdomen, independently of the ganglia. The medullary portions of the suprarenal glands and the glomus carotacum belong to the chromophyll system. 
the suprarenal glands, glandulae suprarenalis, adrenal capsule. The suprarenal glands are two small flattened bodies of a yellowish color, situated at the back part of the abdomen, behind the peritoneum, and immediately above and in front of the upper end of each kidney, hence their name. The right one is somewhat triangular in shape, bearing a resemblance to a cocked hat. The left is more semilunar, usually larger, and placed at a higher level than the right. They vary in size in different individuals, being sometimes so small as to be scarcely detected. Their usual size is from three to five centimeters in length, rather less in width, and from four to six millimeters in thickness. Their average weight is from 1.5 to 2.5 grams each. Development. Each suprarenal gland consists of a cortical portion derived from the salomic epithelium and a medullary portion originally composed of sympathochromaffin tissue. The cortical portion is first recognizable about the beginning of the fourth week as a series of buds from the salomic cells at the root of the mesentery. Later it becomes completely separated from the salomic epithelium and forms a suprarenal ridge projecting into the coelom between the mesonephrus and the root of the mesentery. Into this cortical portion, cells from the neighboring masses of sympathochromaffin tissue migrate along the line of its central vein to reach and form the medullary portion of the gland. Relations The relations of the suprarenal gland differ on the two sides of the body. The right suprarenal is situated behind the inferior vena cava and right lobe of the liver and in front of the diaphragm and upper end of the right kidney. It is roughly triangular in shape. Its base, directed downward, is in contact with the medial and anterior aspects of the upper end of the right kidney. It presents two surfaces for examination, an anterior and a posterior. The anterior surface looks forward and lateralward, and has two areas, a medial, narrow, and non-peritoneal, which lies behind the inferior vena cava, and a lateral, somewhat triangular, in contact with the liver. The upper part of the latter surface is devoid of peritoneum, and is in relation with the bare area of the liver near its lower and medial angle, while its inferior portion is covered by peritoneum, reflected onto it from the inferior layer of the coronary ligament. Occasionally the duodenum overlaps the inferior portion. A little below the apex, and near the anterior border of the gland, is a short furrow termed the helum, from which the suprarenal vein emerges to join the inferior vena cava. The posterior surface is divided into upper and lower parts by a curved ridge. The upper, slightly convex, rests upon the diaphragm. The lower, concave, is in contact with the upper end and the adjacent part of the anterior surface of the kidney. The left suprarenal, slightly larger than the right, is crescentic in shape its concavity being adapted to the medial border of the upper part of the left kidney. It presents a medial border which is convex, and a lateral which is concave. Its upper end is narrow, and its lower rounded. Its anterior surface has two areas, an upper one, covered by the peritoneum of the omental bursa, which separates it from the cardiac end of the stomach, and sometimes from the superior extremity of the spleen, and a lower one, which is in contact with the pancreas and lienal artery, and is therefore not covered by the peritoneum. On the anterior surface, near its lower end, is a furrow or helum, directed downward and forward, from which the suprarenal vein emerges. Its posterior surface presents a vertical ridge, which divides it into two areas. The lateral area rests on the kidney, the medial and smaller on the left crust of the diaphragm. The surface of the suprarenal gland is surrounded by areolar tissue containing much fat and closely invested by a thin fibrous capsule, which is difficult to remove on account of the numerous fibrous processes and vessels entering the organ through the furrows on its anterior surface and base. Small accessory suprarenals, glandulae suprarenales accessoriae, are to be found in the connective tissue around the suprarenals. The smaller of these, on section, show a uniform surface, but in some of the larger, a distinct medulla can be made out. Structure On section, the suprarenal gland is seen to consist of two portions, an external or cortical, and an internal or medullary. 
The former constitutes the chief part of the organ, and is of a deep yellow color. The medullary substance is soft, pulpy, and of a dark red or brown color. The cortical portion, substantia corticalis, consists of a fine connective tissue network in which is embedded the glandular epithelium. The epithelial cells are polyhedral in shape and possess rounded nuclei. Many of the cells contain coarse granules, others lipoid globules. Owing to differences in the arrangement of the cells, three distinct zones can be made out. 1. The zona glomerulosa, situated beneath the capsule, consists of cells arranged in rounded groups, with here and there indications of an alveolar structure. The cells of this zone are very granular and stain deeply. 2. The zona fasciculata, continuous with the zona glomerulosa, is composed of columns of cells arranged in a radial manner. These cells contain finer granules and, in many instances, globules of lipoid material. 3. The zona reticularis, in contact with the medulla, consists of cylindrical masses of cells irregularly arranged. These cells often contain pigment granules, which give this zone a darker appearance than the rest of the cortex. The medullary portion, substantia medullaris, is extremely vascular and consists of large chromophyll cells arranged in a network. The irregular polyhedral cells have a finely granular cytoplasm that are probably concerned with the secretion of adrenaline. In the meshes of the cellular network are large anastomosing venous sinuses, sinusoids, which are in close relationship with the chromophyll or medullary cells. In many places, the endothelial lining of the blood sinuses is in direct contact with the medullary cells. Some authors consider the endothelium absent in places, and here the medullary cells are directly bathed by the blood. This intimate relationship between the chromophyll cells and the bloodstream undoubtedly facilitates the discharge of the internal secretion into the blood. There is a loose meshwork of supporting connective tissue containing non-striped muscle fibers. This portion of the gland is richly supplied with non-medulated nerve fibers, and here and there sympathetic ganglia are found. Vessels and Nerves The arteries supplying the suprarenal glands are numerous and of comparatively large size. They are derived from the aorta, the inferior phrenic, and the renal. They subdivide into minute branches previous to entering the cortical part of the gland, where they break up into capillaries, which end in the venous plexus of the medullary portion. The suprarenal vein returns the blood from the medullary venous plexus and receives several branches from the cortical substance. It emerges from the helum of the gland and on the right side opens into the inferior vena cava, on the left into the renal vein. The lymphatics end in the lumbar glands. The nerves are exceedingly numerous and are derived from the celiac and renal plexuses, and according to Bergman from the phrenic and vagus nerves. They enter the lower and medial part of the capsule, traverse the cortex, and end around the cells of the medulla. They have numerous small ganglia developed upon them in the medullary portion of the gland. In connection with the development of the medulla from the sympathochromaffin tissue, it is to be noted that this portion of the gland secretes a substance, adrenaline, which has a powerful influence on those muscular tissues which are supplied by sympathetic fibers. Glomus carotidum, carotid glands, carotid bodies. The carotid bodies, two in number, are situated one on either side of the neck, behind the common carotid artery at its point of bifurcation into the external and internal carotid trunks. They are reddish-brown in color and oval in shape, the long diameter measuring about five millimeters. Each is invested by a fibrous capsule and consists largely of spherical or irregular masses of cells the masses being more or less isolated from one another by septa, which extend inward from the deep surface of the capsule. The cells are polyhedral in shape, and each contains a large nucleus embedded in finely granular protoplasm, which is stained yellow by chromic salts. Numerous nerve fibers, derived from the sympathetic plexus on the carotid artery, are distributed throughout the organ, and a network of large sinusoidal capillaries ramifies among the cells. Glomus coccygium, coccygeal gland or body, Lushka's gland. The glomus coccygium is placed in front of, or immediately below, the tip of the coccyx. 
It is about 2.5 millimeters in diameter and is irregularly oval in shape. Several smaller nodules are found around or near the main mass. It consists of irregular masses of round or polyhedral cells, the cells of each mass being grouped around a dilated sinusoidal capillary vessel. Each cell contains a large round or oval nucleus, the protoplasm surrounding which is clear and is not stained by chromic salts. End of section 45. Section 46 of Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. The Spleen. Lion. The spleen is situated principally in the left hypochondriac region, but its superior extremity extends into the epigastric region. It lies between the fundus of the stomach and the diaphragm. It is the largest of the ductless glands, and is of an oblong, flattened form, soft, a very friable consistence, highly vascular, and of a dark purplish color. Development The spleen appears about the fifth week as a localized thickening of the mesoderm in the dorsal mesogastrium above the tail of the pancreas. With the change in position of the stomach, the spleen is carried to the left, and comes to lie behind the stomach and in contact with the left kidney. The part of the dorsal mesogastrium which intervene between the spleen and the greater curvature of the stomach forms the gastrosplenic ligament. Relations The diaphragmatic surface, facies diaphragmatica, external or phrenic surface, is convex, smooth, and is directed upward, backward, and to the left, except at its upper end, where it is directed slightly medialward. It is in relation with the under surface of the diaphragm, which separates it from the ninth, tenth, and eleventh ribs on the left side, and the intervening lower border of the left lung and pleura. The visceral surface is divided by a ridge into an anterior or gastric and a posterior or renal portion. The gastric surface, facies gastrica, which is directed forward, upward, and medialward, is broad and concave, and is in contact with the posterior wall of the stomach and below this with the tail of the pancreas. It presents near its medial border a long fissure, termed the hilum. This is pierced by several irregular apertures, for the entrance and exit of vessels and nerves. The renal surface, facies renalis, is directed medialward and downward. It is somewhat flattened, is considerably narrower than the gastric surface, and is in relation with the upper part of the anterior surface of the left kidney, and occasionally with the left suprarenal gland. The superior extremity, extremitus superior, is directed toward the vertebral column, where it lies on a level with the eleventh thoracic vertebra. The lower extremity, or colic surface, extremitus inferior, is flat, triangular in shape, and rests upon the left flexure of the colon and the phrenico-colic ligament, and is generally in contact with the tail of the pancreas. The anterior border, margo anterior, is free, sharp, and thin, and is often notched, especially below. It separates the diaphragmatic from the gastric surface. The posterior border, margo posterior, more rounded and blunter than the anterior, separates the renal from the diaphragmatic surface. It corresponds to the lower border of the eleventh rib and lies between the diaphragm and the left kidney. The intermediate margin is the ridge which separates the renal and gastric surfaces. The inferior border, internal border, separates the diaphragmatic from the colic surface. The spleen is almost entirely surrounded by peritoneum, which is firmly adherent to its capsule. It is held in position by two folds of this membrane. One, the phrenicolienal ligament, is derived from the peritoneum, where the wall of the general peritoneal cavity comes into contact with the omental bursa, between the left kidney and the spleen. The lienal vessels pass between its two layers. The other fold, the gastrolienal ligament, is also formed of two layers, derived from the general cavity and the omental, respectively, where they meet between the spleen and the stomach. The short gastric and left gastroepiploic branches of the lienal artery run between its two layers. The lower end of the spleen is supported by the phrenico-colic ligament. The size and weight of the spleen are liable to very extreme variations at different periods of life. 
in different individuals and in the same individual under different conditions. In the adult, it is usually about 12 centimeters in length, 7 centimeters in breadth, and 3 or 4 centimeters in thickness, and weighs about 200 grams. At birth, its weight, in proportion to the entire body, is almost equal to what is observed in the adult, being as 1 to 350, while in the adult it varies from 1 to 320 and 400. In old age, the organ not only diminishes in weight, but decreases considerably in proportion to the entire body, being as 1 to 700. The size of the spleen is increased during and after digestion, and varies according to the state of nutrition of the body, being large and highly fed and small and starved animals. In malarial fever it becomes much enlarged, weighing occasionally as much as nine kilos. Frequently in the neighborhood of the spleen, and especially in the gastrolyenal ligament and greater omentum, small nodules of splenic tissue may be found, either isolated or connected to the spleen by thin bands of splenic tissue. They are known as accessory spleens, lion accessorius, supernumerary spleen. They vary in size from that of a pea to that of a plum. Structure The spleen is invested by two coats, an external serous and an internal fibroelastic coat. The external or serous coat, tunica serosa, is derived from the peritoneum. It is thin, smooth, and in the human subject intimately adherent to the fibroelastic coat. It invests the entire organ, except at the hilum and along the lines of reflection of the phrenico and gastro ligaments. The fibroelastic coat, tunica albuginea, invests the organ, and at the hilum is reflected inward upon the vessels in the form of sheaths. From these sheaths, as well as from the inner surface of the fibroelastic coat, numerous small fibrous bands, trabriculi, are given off in all directions. These uniting constitute the framework of the spleen. The spleen, therefore, consists of a number of small spaces, or areoli, formed by the trabriculi. In these areoli is contained the splenic pulp. The fibroelastic coat, the sheaths of the vessels, and the trabriculi are composed of white and yellow elastic fibrous tissues, the latter predominating. It is owing to the presence of the elastic tissue that the spleen possesses a considerable amount of elasticity, which allows of the very great variations in size that it presents under certain circumstances. In addition to these constituents of this tunic, there is found in man a small amount of non-striped muscular fiber, and in some mammalia, for example dog, pig, and cat, a large amount, so that the trabriculi appear to consist chiefly of muscular tissue. The splenic pulp, pulpa lainis, is a soft mass of dark reddish-brown color, resembling grumous blood. It consists of a fine reticulum of fibers, continuous with those of the trabriculi, to which are applied flat, branching cells. The meshes of the reticulum are filled with blood, in which, however, the white corpuscles are found to be in larger proportion than they are in ordinary blood. Large, rounded cells, termed splenic cells, are also seen. These are capable of amoeboid movement, and often contain pigment and red blood corpuscles in their interior. The cells of the reticulum each possess a round or oval nucleus, and like the splenic cells, they may contain pigment granules in their cytoplasm. They do not stain deeply with carmine, and in this respect differ from the cells of the Malpighian bodies. In the young spleen, giant cells may also be found, each containing numerous nuclei, or one compound nucleus. Nucleated red blood corpuscles have also been found in the spleen of young animals. Blood Vessels of the Spleen The lienal artery is remarkable for its large size in proportion to the size of the organ, and also for its torturous course. It divides into six or more branches, which enter the hilum of the spleen and ramify throughout its substance, receiving sheaths from an involution of the external fibrous tissue. Similar sheaths also invest the nerves and veins. Each branch runs in the transverse axis of the organ, from within outward, diminishing in size during its transit, and giving off in its passage smaller branches, some of which pass to the anterior, others to the posterior part. These ultimately leave the trabricular sheaths and terminate in the proper substance of the spleen in small tufts or pencils of minute arterioles, which open into the interstices of the reticulum formed by the branch sustenticular cells. Each of the larger branches of the artery supplies chiefly that region of the organ in which the branch ramifies, 
having no anastomosis with the majority of the other branches. The arterioles, supported by the minute trabriculi, traverse the pulp in all directions in bundles, pencili, of straight vessels. Their trabricular sheaths gradually undergo a transformation, become much thickened, and converted into adenoid tissue, the bundles of connective tissue becoming looser and their fibrils more delicate, and containing in their interstices an abundance of lymph corpuscles. W. Mueller. The altered coat of the arterioles, consisting of adenoid tissue, presents here and there thickenings of a spheroidal shape, the lymphatic nodules, malpighian bodies of the spleen. These bodies vary in size from about 0.25 mm to 1 mm in diameter. They are merely local expansions or hypoplasia of the adenoid tissue, of which the external coat of the smaller arteries of the spleen is formed. They are most frequently found surrounding the arteriole, which thus seems to tunnel them, but occasionally they grow from one side of the vessel only, and present the appearance of a sessile bud growing from the arterial wall. In transverse sections, the artery, in the majority of cases, is found in an eccentric position. These bodies are visible to the naked eye on the surface of a fresh section of the organ, appearing as minute dots of a semi-opaque whitish color in the dark substance of the pulp. In minute structure they resemble the adenoid tissue of lymph glands, consisting of a delicate reticulum, in the meshes of which lie ordinary lymphoid cells. The reticulum is made up of extremely fine fibrils, and is comparatively open in the center of the corpuscle, becoming closer at its periphery. The cells which it encloses are possessed of amoeboid movement. When treated with carmine they become deeply stained, and can be easily distinguished from those of the pulp. The arterioles end by opening freely into the splenic pulp. Their walls become much attenuated, they lose their tubular character, and the endothelial cells become altered, presenting a branched appearance, and acquiring processes which are directly connected with the processes of the reticular cells of the pulp. In this manner the vessels end, and the blood flowing through them finds its way into the interstices of the reticulated tissue of the splenic pulp. Thus the blood passing through the spleen is brought into intimate relation with the elements of the pulp, and no doubt undergoes important changes. After these changes have taken place, the blood is collected from the interstices of the tissue by the rootlets of the veins, which begin much in the same way as the arteries end. The connective tissue corpuscles of the pulp arrange themselves in rows, in such a way as to form an elongated space or sinus. They become elongated and spindle-shaped, and overlap each other at their extremities, and thus form a sort of endothelial lining of the path or sinus, which is the radical of a vein. On the outer surfaces of these cells are seen delicate transverse lines or markings, which are due to minute elastic fibrillae, arranged in a circular manner around the sinus. Thus the channel obtains an external investment, and gradually becomes converted into a small vein, which, after a short course, acquires a coat of ordinary connective tissue, lined by a layer of flattened epithelial cells, which are continuous with the supporting cells of the pulp. The smaller veins unite to form larger ones. These do not accompany the arteries, but soon enter the trabricular sheaths of the capsule, and by their junction form six or more branches, which emerge from the hilum and, uniting, constitute the lienal vein, the largest radical of the portal vein. The veins are remarkable for their numerous anastomoses, while the arteries hardly anastomose at all. The lymphatics are described on page 711. The nerves are derived from the celiac plexus and are chiefly non-modulated. They are distributed to the blood vessels and to the smooth muscle of the capsule and trabiculi. End of section 46「Section 47 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John K. Thomas, also known as Vern, or John Coos. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. 12. Surface Anatomy and Surface Markings. 1. Surface anatomy of the head and neck. Bones, figure 1193. 
Various bony surfaces and prominences on the skull can be easily identified by palpation. The external occipital protuberance is situated behind, in the middle line, at the junction of the skin of the neck with that of the head. The superior neutral line runs lateralward from it on either side, while extending downward from it the median neutral crest, situated deeply at the bottom of the neutral furrow. Above the superior neutral lines, the vault of the cranium is thinly covered with soft structures, so that the form of this part of the head is almost that of the upper portion of the occipital, the parietal, and the frontal bones. The superior neutral line can be followed lateralward to the mastoid portion of the temporal bone from which the mastoid process projects downward and forward behind the ear. The anterior and posterior borders, the apex, and the external surface of this process are all available for superficial examination. The anterior border lies immediately behind the concha and the apex is on a level with the lobule of the auricula, about one centimeter below and in front of the apex of the mastoid process. The transverse process of the atlas can be distinguished. In front of the ear, the zygomatic arch can be felt throughout its entire length. Its posterior end is narrow and is situated a little above the level of the tragus. Its anterior end is broad and is continued into the zygomatic bone. The lower border of the arch is more distinct than the upper, which is obscured by the attachment of the temporal fascia. fascia. In front and behind, the upper border of the arch can be followed into the superior temporal line. In front, this line begins at the zygomatic process of the frontal bone as a curved ridge which runs at first forward and upward on the frontal bone and then curving backward separates the forehead into the temporal fossa. It can be traced across the parietal bone where, though less marked, it can generally be recognized. Finally, it curves downward and forward and passing above the external acoustic meatus ends in the posterior root of the zygomatic arch. Near the line of the greatest transverse diameter of the head are the parietal eminences on either side of the middle line. Further forward on the forehead are the frontal eminences, which vary in prominence in different individuals and are frequently unsymmetrical. Below the frontal eminences, the superciliary arches, which indicate the position of the frontal sinuses, can be recognized. As a rule, they are small in the female and absent in children. In some cases, the prominence of the superciliary arches is related to the size of the frontal sinuses, but frequently there is no such relationship. Situated between and connecting the superciliary ridges is a smooth, somewhat triangular area, the glabella, below which the nation, the frontal nasal suture, can be felt as a slight depression at the root of the nose. Below the nation, the nasal bones, scantily covered by soft tissues, can be traced to their junction with the nasal cartilages, and on either side of the nasal bone, the complete outline of the orbital margin can be made out. At the junction of the medial and intermediate thirds of the supraorbital margin, the supraorbital notch, when present, can be felt. Close to the medial end of the infraorbital margin is a little tubercle which serves as a guide to the position of the lacrimal sac. Low and lateral to the orbit, on either side, is the zygomatic bone forming the prominence of the cheek. Its posterior margin is easily palpable, and on it, just above the level of the lateral palpebral commissure, is the zygomatic tubercle. A slight depression about one centimeter above this tubercle indicates the position of the zygomaticofrontal suture. 
directly below the orbit is a considerable part of the anterior surface of the maxilla, and the whole of its alveolar process can be palpated. The outline of the mandible can be recognized throughout practically its entire extent. In front of the tragus and below the zygomatic arch is the condyle, and from this posterior border of the ramus can be followed to the angle. From the angle to the symphysis, the lower rounded border of the mandible can be easily traced. The lower part of the anterior border of the ramus and the alveolar process can be made out without difficulty. In the receding angle below the chin is the hyoid bone, and the finger can be carried along the bone to the tip of the greater cornu, which is on level with the angle of the mandible. The greater cornu is most readily appreciated by making pressure on one side, when the cornu of the opposite side will be rendered prominent and can be felt distinctly beneath the skin. Joints and Muscles the temporal mandibular articulation is quite superficial and is situated below the posterior end of the zygomatic arch in front of the external acoustic meatus. Its position can be ascertained by defining the condyle of the mandible. When the mouth opens, the condyle advances out of the mandibular fossa onto the articular tubercle and a depression is felt in the situation of the joint. The outlines of the muscles of the head and face cannot be traced on the surface except in the case of the masseter and temporalis. The muscles of the scalp are so thin that the outline of the bone is perceptible beneath them. Those of the face are small, covered by soft skin and often by a considerable layer of fat, and their outlines are therefore concealed. They serve, however, to round off and smooth prominent borders, and to fill up what would otherwise be unsightly angular depressions. Thus, the orbicularis oculi rounds off the prominent margin of the orbit, and the procerus fills in the sharp depression below the glabella. In like manner, the labial muscles converging to the lips, and assisted by the superimposed fat, fill up the sunken hollow of the lower part of the face. When in action, the facial muscles produce the various expressions, and in addition throw the skin into numerous folds and wrinkles. The masseter imparts fullness to hinder part of the cheek. If firmly contracted, as when the teeth are clenched, its quadrilateral outline is plainly visible. The anterior border forms a prominent vertical ridge, behind which is a considerable fullness, especially marked at the lower part of the muscle. The temporalis is fan-shaped and fills the temporal fossa, substituting for the concavity a somewhat convex swelling, the anterior part of which, on account of the absence of hair on the overlying skin, is more marked than the posterior and stands out in strong relief when the muscle is in action. In the neck, the platysma, when contracted, throws the skin into oblique ridges parallel with the fasci culi of the muscle. The sternocleidomastoides has the most important influence on the surface form of the neck. When the muscle is at rest, its anterior border forms an oblique, rounded edge ending below on the sharp outline of the sternal head. The posterior border is only distinct for about two or three centimeters, above the middle of the clavicle. During contraction, the sternal head stands out as a sharply defined ridge, while the clavicular head is flatter and less prominent. Between the two heads is a slight depression. The fleshy middle portion of the muscle appears as an oblique elevation, with a thick, rounded anterior border best marked in its lower part. The sternal heads of the two muscles are separated by a V-shaped depression, in which are the sternohyoides and sternothyroides. 
Above the hyoid bone, near the middle line, the anterior belly of the didrasticus produces a slight convexity. The anterior border of the trapezius presents as a faint ridge running from the superior neutral line downward and forward to the junction of the intermediate and lateral thirds of the clavicle. Between the sternocleidomastoides and the trapezius is the posterior triangle of the neck, the lower part of which appears as a shallow concavity, the supraclavicular fossa. In this fossa, the inferior belly of the omohyoideus, when in action, presents as a round cord-like elevation a little above and almost parallel to the clavicle. Figure 1195, front view of the neck. Arteries. The positions of several of the larger arteries can be ascertained from their pulsations. The subclavian artery can be felt by making pressure downward, backward, and medialward behind the clavicular head of the sternocleidomastoideus. Its transverse cervical branch may be detected parallel to and about a finger's breadth above the clavicle. The common and external carotid arteries can be recognized immediately beneath the anterior edge of the sternocleidomastoideus. The external maxillary artery can be traced over the border of the mandible just in front of the anterior border of the masseter, then about one centimeter, lateral to the angle of the mouth, and finally as it runs up the side of the nose. The pulsation of the occipital artery can be distinguished about three or four centimeters lateral to the external occipital protuberance, that of the posterior auricular, in the groove between the mastoid process and the auricula. The course of the superficial temporal artery can be readily followed across the posterior end of the zygomatic arch to a point about three to five centimeters above this where it divides into its frontal and parietal branches. The pulsation of the frontal branch is frequently visible on the side of the forehead. The supraorbital artery can usually be detected immediately above the supraorbital notch or foramen. End of section 47. Recording by John K. Thomas, also known as Vern or John Coos. Web address www.validateyourlife.com or www.oneandthesamerecordings.com. Section 48 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. Surface Markings of Special Regions of the Head and Neck, Part 1. The Cranium, Scalp. The soft parts covering the upper surface of the skull form the scalp and comprise the following layers. 1. Skin. 2. Subcutaneous tissue. 3. Occipitalis frontalis and gallia aponeurotica. 4. Subaponeurotic tissue. 5. Pericranium. The subcutaneous tissue consists of a close meshwork of fibers, the meshes of which contain fatty tissue. The fibers bind the skin and galea aponeurotica firmly together, so that when the occipitalis or the frontalis is in action, the skin moves with the aponeurosis. The subaponeurotic tissue, which intervenes between the galea aponeurotica and the pericranium, is much looser in texture and permits the movement of the aponeurosis over the underlying bones. Bony Landmarks In addition to the bony points already described, which can be determined by palpation, the following are utilized for surface markings. Auricular point, the center of the orifice of the external acoustic meatus. Pre-auricular point, a point on the posterior root of the zygomatic arch immediately in front of the external acoustic meatus. Asterion. The point of meeting of the lambdoidal, masto-occipital, and masto-parietal sutures 
It lies four centimeters behind and twelve millimeters above the level of the auricular point. Terion, the point where the great wing of the sphenoid joins the sphenoidal angle of the parietal. It is situated thirty-five millimeters behind and twelve millimeters above the level of the frontozygomatic suture. Ineon, the external occipital protuberance. Lambda, the point of meeting of the lambdoidal and sagittal sutures. It is in the middle line, about 6.5 centimeters above the ineon. Bregma, the meeting point of the coronal and sagittal sutures. It lies at the point of intersection of the middle line of the scalp, with a line drawn vertically upward through the preauricular point. A line passing through the inferior margin of the orbit and the auricular point is known as Reed's base line. The lambdoidal suture can be indicated on either side by the upper two-thirds of a line from the lambda to the tip of the mastoid process. The sagittal suture is in the line joining the lambda to the bregma. The position of the coronal suture on either side is sufficiently represented by a line joining the bregma to the center of the zygomatic arch. The floor of the middle fossa of the skull is at the level of the posterior three-fourths of the upper border of the zygomatic arch. The articular eminence of the temporal bone is opposite the foramen spinosum and the semilunar ganglion. Brain. The general outline of the cerebral hemisphere on either side may be mapped out on the surface in the following manner. Starting from the nasion, a line drawn along the middle of the scalp to the ineon represents the superior border. The line of the lower margin behind is that of the transverse sinus, or, more roughly, a line convex upward from the ineon to the posterior root of the zygomatic process of the temporal bone, thence along the posterior two-thirds of the upper border of the zygomatic arch, where the line turns up to the terion. The front part of the lower margin extends from the terion to the glabella, about one centimeter above the supraorbital margin. The cerebellum is so deeply situated that there is no reliable surface marking for it. A point four centimeters behind and 1.5 centimeters below the level of the auricular point is situated directly over it. The relations of the principal fissures in gyri of the cerebral hemispheres to the surface of the scalp are of considerable practical importance, and several methods of indicating them have been devised. Necessarily, these methods can only be regarded as approximately correct, yet they are all sufficiently accurate for surgical purposes. The longitudinal fissure corresponds to the medial line of the scalp between the nasion and ineon. In order to mark out the lateral cerebral sylvian fissure, a point, termed the sylvian point, which practically corresponds to the terion, is defined 35 millimeters behind and 12 millimeters above the level of the frontozygomatic suture. This point marks the spot where the lateral fissure divides. Another method of defining the sylvian point is to divide the distance between the nasion and ineon into four equal parts. From the junction of the third and fourth parts, reckoning from the front, draw a line to the frontozygomatic suture. From the junction of the first and second parts, a line to the auricular point. These two lines intersect at the sylvian point, and the portion of the first line behind this point overlies the posterior ramus of the lateral cerebral fissure. The position of the posterior ramus can otherwise be obtained by joining the sylvian point to a point two centimeters below the summit of the parietal eminence. The anterior ascending ramus can be marked out by drawing a line upward at right angles to the line of the posterior ramus for two centimeters, and the anterior horizontal ramus by a line of the same length drawn horizontally forward, both from the sylvian point. To define the central sulcus, fissure of Rolando, two points are taken. One is situated 1.25 centimeters behind the center of the line joining the nasion and ineon. The second is at the intersection of the line of the posterior ramus of the lateral cerebral fissure with a line through the preauricular point at right angles to Reed's base line. The upper nine centimeters of the line joining these two points overlies the central sulcus and forms an angle opening forward of about 70 degrees with the middle line of the scalp. An alternative method is to draw two perpendicular lines from Reed's base line to the top of the head, one from the preauricular point and the other from the posterior border of the mastoid process at its root. 
a line from the upper end of the posterior line to the point where the anterior intersects the line of the posterior ramus of the lateral fissure indicates the position of the central sulcus the precentral and postcentral sulci are practically parallel to the central sulcus they are situated respectively about fifteen millimeters in front of and behind it the superior frontal sulcus can be mapped out by a line drawn from the junction of the upper and middle thirds of the precentral sulcus in a direction parallel with the longitudinal sulcus to a point midway between the middle line of the forehead and the temporal line four centimeters above the supraorbital notch the inferior frontal sulcus begins at the junction of the middle and lower thirds of the precentral sulcus and follows the course of the superior temporal line the horizontal limb of the intraparietal sulcus begins from the junction of the lower with the middle third of the postcentral sulcus and curves backward parallel to the longitudinal fissure midway between it and the parietal eminence it then curves downward to end midway between the lambda and the parietal eminence the external part of the parieto occipital fissure runs lateralward at right angles to the longitudinal fissure for about two point five centimeters from a point five millimeters in front of the lambda if the line of the posterior ramus of the lateral cerebral fissure be continued back to the longitudinal fissure the last two point five centimeters of it will indicate the position of the parieto occipital fissure the lateral ventricle may be circumscribed by a quadrilateral figure the upper limit is a horizontal line five centimeters above the zygomatic arch this defines the roof of the ventricle the lower limit is a horizontal line one centimeter above the zygomatic arch it indicates the level of the end of the inferior horn two vertical lines one through the junction of the anterior and middle thirds of the zygomatic arch and the other five centimeters behind the tip of the mastoid process indicate the extent of the anterior horn in front and the posterior horn behind vessels the line of the anterior division of the middle meningeal artery is equidistant from the frontozygomatic suture and the zygomatic arch it is obtained by joining up the following points one two point five centimeters two four centimeters and three five centimeters from these two landmarks the posterior division can be reached two point five centimeters above the auricular point the position of the transverse sinus is obtained by taking two lines, the first from the enion to a point 2.5 cm behind the auricular point, the second from the anterior end of the first to the tip of the mastoid process. The second line corresponds roughly to the line of reflection of the skin of the auricula behind, and its upper two-thirds represents the sigmoid part of the sinus. The first part of the sinus has a slight upward convexity, and its highest point is about four centimeters behind and one centimeter above the level of the auricular point. The width of the sinus is about one centimeter. The face, air sinuses. The frontal and maxillary sinuses vary so greatly in form and size that their surface markings must be regarded as only roughly approximate. To mark out the position of the frontal sinus, three points are taken. One, the nasion. 2. A point in the middle line 3 cm above the nasion. 3. A point at the junction of the lateral and intermediate thirds of the supraorbital margin. By joining these, a triangular field is described which overlies the greater part of the sinus. The outline of the maxillary sinus is irregularly quadrilateral and is obtained by joining up the following points. 1. The lacrimal tubercle. 2. A point on the zygomatic bone at the level of the inferior and lateral margins of the orbit. 3 and 4. Points on the alveolar process above the last molar and the second premolar teeth, respectively. External maxillary artery. The course of this artery on the face may be indicated by a line starting from the lower border of the mandible at the anterior margin of the masseter and running at first forward and upward to a point one centimeter lateral to the angle of the mouth, thence to the ala of the nose, and upward to the medial commissure of the eye. Trigeminal nerve. Terminal branches of this nerve, namely the supraorbital branch of the ophthalmic, the infraorbital of the maxillary, and the mental of the mandibular, emerge from corresponding foramina on the face. The supraorbital foramen is situated at the junction of the medial and intermediate thirds of the supraorbital margin. 
a line drawn from this foramen to the lower border of the mandible, through the interval between the two lower premolar teeth, passes over the infraorbital and mental foramina. The former lies about one centimeter below the margin of the orbit, while the latter varies in position according to the age of the individual. In the adult, it is midway between the upper and lower borders of the mandible. In the child, it is nearer the lower border, while in the edentulous jaw of old age, it is close to the upper margin. The position of the sphenopalatine ganglion is indicated from the side by a point on the upper border of the zygomatic arch, six millimeters from the margin of the zygomatic bone. Parotid gland. The upper border of the parotid gland corresponds to the posterior two-thirds of the lower border of the zygomatic arch, the posterior border to the front of the external acoustic meatus, the mastoid process, and the anterior border of sternocleidomastoideus. The inferior border is indicated by a line from the tip of the mastoid process to the junction of the body and greater cornu of the hyoid bone. In front, the anterior border extends for a variable distance on the superficial surface of the masseter. The surface marking for the parotid duct is a line drawn across the face about a finger's breadth below the zygomatic arch, that is, from the lower margin of the concha to midway between the red margin of the lip and the ala of the nose. The duct ends opposite the second upper molar tooth and measures about five centimeters in length. The nose. The outlines of the nasal bones and the cartilages forming the external nose can be easily felt. The mobile portion of the nasal septum, formed by the medial crura of the greater alar cartilages and the skin, is easily distinguished between the nares. When the head is tilted back and a speculum introduced through the nares, the floor of the nasal cavity, the lower part of the nasal septum, and the anterior ends of the middle and inferior nasal conchi can be examined. The opening of the nasolacrimal duct, which lies under cover of the front of the inferior nasal concha, is situated about 2.5 centimeters behind the naris and 2 centimeters above the level of the floor of the nasal cavity. End of section 48. Section 49 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. Surface Markings and Special Regions of the Head and Neck, Part 2. The Mouth. The orifice of the mouth is bounded by the lips, which are covered externally by the whitish skin and internally by the red mucous membrane. The size of the orifice varies considerably in different individuals but seems to bear a close relationship to the size and prominence of the teeth. Its angles usually correspond to the lateral borders of the canine teeth. Running down the center of the outer surface of the upper lip is a shallow groove, the philtrum. If the lips be everted, there could be seen, in the middle line of each, a small fold of mucous membrane, the frenulum, passing from the lip to the gum. By pulling the angle of the mouth outward, the mucous membrane of the cheek can be inspected, and on this, opposite the second molar tooth of the maxilla, is the little papilla which marks the orifice of the parotid duct. In the floor of the mouth is the tongue. Its upper surface is convex and is marked along the middle line by a shallow sulcus. The anterior two-thirds are rough and studded with papillae. The posterior third is smooth and tuberculated. The division between the anterior two-thirds and the posterior third is marked by a V-shaped furrow, the sulcus terminalis, which is situated immediately behind the line of the valate papillae. On the undersurface of the tongue, the mucous membrane is smooth and devoid of papillae. In the middle line, the mucous membrane extends to the floor of the mouth as a distinct fold, the frenulum, the free edge of which runs forward to the symphysis menti. Sometimes the ranine vein can be seen immediately beneath the mucous membrane, a little lateral to the frenulum. Close to the attachment of the frenulum to the floor of the mouth, the slit-like orifice of the submaxillary duct is visible on either side. Running backward and lateralward from the orifice of the submaxillary duct is the plica sublingualis, produced by the projection of the sublingual gland, which lies immediately beneath the mucous membrane. The plica serves also to indicate the line of the submaxillary duct and of the lingual nerve. At the back of the mouth is the isthmus falsium, bounded above by the palatine velum, 
from the free margin of which the uvula projects downward in the middle line. On either side of the isthmus are the two palatine arches, the anterior formed by the glossopalatinus and the posterior by the pharyngopalatinus. Between the two arches of either side is the palatine tonsil, above which is the small supertonsillar recess. The position of the tonsil corresponds to the angle of the mandible. When the mouth is opened widely, a tense band, the pterygomandibular raphae, can be seen and felt lateral to the glossopalatine arch. Its lower end is attached to the mandible behind the last molar tooth, and immediately below and in front of this the lingual nerve can be felt. The upper end of the ligament can be traced to the pterygoid hamulus. About one centimeter in front of the hamulus, and one centimeter medial to the last molar tooth of the maxilla, is the greater palatine foramen, through which the descending palatine vessels and the anterior palatine nerve emerge. Behind the last molar tooth of the maxilla, the carinoid process of the mandible is palpable. By tilting the head well back, a portion of the posterior pharyngeal wall, corresponding to the site of the second and third cervical vertebrae, can be seen through the isthmus falcium. On introducing the finger, the anterior surfaces of the upper cervical vertebrae can be felt through the thin muscular wall of the pharynx. If the finger be hooked round the palatine velum, the coani can be distinguished in front, and the pharyngeal ostium of the auditory tube on either side. The level of the coani is that of the atlas, while the palatine velum is opposite the body of the axis. With a laryngoscope, many other structures can be seen. In the nasal part of the pharynx, the coani, the nasal septum, the nasal conchi, and the pharyngeal ostia of the auditory tubes can all be examined. Further down, the base of the tongue, the anterior surface of the epiglottis, with the glossoepiglottic and pharyngoepiglottic folds bounding the voleculi and the piriform sinuses, are readily distinguished. Beyond these is the entrance to the larynx, bounded on either side by the epiglottic folds, in each of which are two rounded eminences corresponding to the corniculate and cuneiform cartilages. Within the larynx on either side are the ventricular and vocal folds, false and true vocal cords, with the ventricle between them. Still deeper are seen the cricoid cartilage and the anterior parts of some of the cartilaginous rings of the trachea, and sometimes, during deep inspiration, the bifurcation of the trachea. The eye. The palpebral fissure is elliptical in shape, and varies in form in different individuals and in different races of mankind. Normally it is oblique, in a direction upward and lateralward, so that the lateral commissure is on a slightly higher level than the medial. When the eyes are directed forward, as in ordinary vision, the upper part of the cornea is covered by the upper eyelid, and its lower margin corresponds to the level of the free margin of the lower eyelid so that usually the lower three-fourths are exposed. At the medial commissure are the caruncula lacrimalis and the plica semilunaris. When the lids are averted, the tarsal glands appear as a series of nearly straight parallel rows of light yellow granules. On the margins of the lids, about five millimeters from the medial commissure, are two small openings, the lacrimal puncta. In the natural condition, they are in contact with the conjunctiva of the bulb of the eye, so that it is necessary to avert the eyelids to expose them. The position of the lacrimal sac is indicated by a little tubercle which can be plainly felt on the lower margin of the orbit. The sac lies immediately above and medial to the tubercle. If the eyelids be drawn lateralward so as to tighten the skin at the medial commissure, a prominent core can be felt beneath the tightened skin. This is the medial palpebral ligament, which lies over the junction of the upper with the lower two-thirds of the sac, thus forming a useful guide to its situation. The direction of the nasolacrimal duct is indicated by a line from the lacrimal sac to the first molar tooth of the maxilla. The length of the duct is about 12 or 13 millimeters. On looking into the eye, the iris with its opening, the pupil, and the front of the lens can be examined. But for investigation of the retina, an ophthalmoscope is necessary. With this, the lens, the vessels of the retina, the optic disc, and the macula lutea can all be inspected. On the lateral surface of the nasal part of the frontal bone, the pulley of the obliquus superior can be easily reached by pushing the finger backward along the roof of the orbit. 
The tendon of the muscle can be traced for a short distance backward and lateralward from the pulley. The ear. The various prominences and fossae of the auricula are visible. The opening of the external acoustic meatus is exposed by drawing the tragus forward. At the orifice are a few short, crisp hairs which serve to prevent the entrance of dust or of small insects. Beyond this, the secretion of the ceruminous glands serves to catch any small particles which may find their way into the meatus. The interior of the meatus can be examined through a speculum. At the line of junction of its bony and cartilaginous portions, an obtuse angle is formed, which projects into the antero-inferior wall, and produces a narrowing of the lumen in this situation. The cartilaginous part, however, is connected to the bony part by fibrous tissue, which renders the outer part of the meatus very movable, and therefore by drawing the auricula upward, backward, and slightly outward, the canal is rendered almost straight. In children, the meatus is very short, and this should be remembered in introducing the speculum. Through the speculum, the greater part of the tympanic membrane is visible. It is a pearly gray membrane, slightly glistening in the adult, placed obliquely so as to form with the floor of the meatus an angle of about 55 degrees. At birth, it is more horizontal and situated in almost the same plane as the base of the skull. The membrane is concave outward, and the point of deepest concavity, the umbo, is slightly below the center. Running upward and slightly forward from the umbo is a reddish-yellow streak produced by the manubrium of the malleus. This streak ends above, just below the roof of the meatus, at a small, white, rounded prominence, which is caused by the lateral process of the malleus projecting against the membrane. The anterior and posterior malleolar folds extend from the prominence to the circumference of the membrane and enclose the pars flaccida. Behind the streak caused by the manubrium of the malleus, a second streak, shorter and very faint, can be distinguished. This is the long crust of the incus. A narrow triangular patch, extending downward and forward from the umbo, reflects the light more brightly than any other part, and is usually described as the cone of light. Tympanic antrum. The site of the tympanic antrum is indicated by the supramiatal triangle. This triangle is bounded above by the posterior root of the zygomatic arch, behind by a vertical line from the posterior border of the external acoustic meatus, in front and below by the upper margin of the meatus. The neck, larynx and trachea. In the receding angle below the chin, the hyoid bone, situated opposite the fourth cervical vertebra, can easily be made out. A finger's breadth below it is the laryngeal prominence of the thyroid cartilage. The space intervening between the hyoid bone and the thyroid cartilage is occupied by the hyothyroid membrane. The outlines of the thyroid cartilage are readily palpated. Below its lower border is a depression corresponding to the middle cricothyroid ligament. The level of the vocal folds corresponds to the middle of the anterior margin of the thyroid cartilage. The anterior part of the cricoid cartilage forms an important landmark on the front of the neck. It lies opposite the sixth cervical vertebra and indicates the junctions of pharynx with esophagus and larynx with trachea. Below the cricoid cartilage, the trachea can be felt, though it is only in thin subjects that the separate rings can be distinguished. As a rule, there are seven or eight rings above the jugular notch of the sternum, and of these, the second, third, and fourth are covered by the isthmus of the thyroid gland. Muscles. The posterior belly of digastricus is marked out by a line from the tip of the mastoid process to the junction of the greater cornu and body of the hyoid bone. A line from this latter point to a point just lateral to the symphysis menti indicates the position of the anterior belly. The line of omohyoideus begins at the lower border of the hyoid bone, curves downward and lateralward to cross sternocleidomastoideus at the junction of its middle and lower thirds, that is, opposite the cricoid cartilage, and then runs more horizontally to the acromial end of the clavicle. Arteries. The position of the common carotid artery in the neck is indicated by a line drawn from the upper part of the sternal end of the clavicle to a point midway between the tip of the mastoid process and the angle of the mandible. From the clavicle to the upper border of the thyroid cartilage, 
this line overlies the common carotid artery. Beyond this, it is over the external carotid. The external carotid artery may otherwise be marked out by the upper part of a line from the side of the cricoid cartilage to the front of the external acoustic meatus, arching the line slightly forward. The points of origin of the main branches of the external carotid in the neck are all related to the tip of the greater cornu of the hyoid bone as follows. 1. The superior thyroid, immediately below it. 2. The lingual, on a level with it. 3. The facial and 4. The occipital, a little above and behind it. The subclavian artery is indicated on the surface by a curved line, convex upward, from the sternoclavicular articulation to the middle of the clavicle. The highest point of the convexity is from 1 to 3 centimeters above the clavicle. Veins. The surface marking for the internal jugular vein is slightly lateral and parallel to that for the common carotid artery. The position of the external jugular vein is marked out by a line from the angle of the mandible to the middle of the clavicle. A point on this line about 4 cm above the clavicle indicates the spot where the vein pierces the deep fascia. The line of the anterior jugular vein begins close to the symphysis menti, runs downward parallel with and a little to one side of the middle line, and, at a variable distance above the jugular notch, turns lateralward to the external jugular. Nerves. The facial nerve, at its exit from the stylomastoid foramen, is situated about 2.5 cm from the surface, opposite the middle of the anterior border of the mastoid process. A horizontal line from this point to the ramus of the mandible overlies the stem of the nerve. To mark the side of the accessory nerve, a line is drawn from the angle of the mandible to a point on the anterior border of sternocleidomastoideus, about 3 to 4 cm below the apex of the mastoid process, or to the midpoint of the posterior border of the muscle. The line is continued across the posterior triangle to trapezius. The cutaneous branches of the cervical plexus, as they emerge from the posterior border of sternocleidomastoideus, may be indicated as follows. The lesser occipital begins immediately above the midpoint of the border and runs along the border to the scalp. The great auricular and cervical cutaneous both start from the middle of the border, the former running upward toward the lobule of the auricula, the latter crossing sternocleidomastoideus at right angles to its long axis. The supraclavicular nerves emerge from immediately below the middle of the posterior border and run down over the clavicle. The phrenic nerve begins at the level of the middle of the thyroid cartilage and runs behind the clavicle about midway between the anterior and posterior borders of sternocleidomastoideus. The upper border of the brachial plexus is indicated by a line from the side of the cricoid cartilage to the middle of the clavicle. Submaxillary gland. On either side of the neck, the superficial portion of the submaxillary gland, as it lies partly under cover of the mandible, can be palpated. End of section 49. Section 50 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lawrence. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. 50. Surface anatomy. Surface markings of back. 3. Surface anatomy of the back. Bones. The only subcutaneous parts of the vertebral column are the apices of the spinous processes. These are distinguishable at the bottom of a furrow which runs down the middle line of the back from the external occipital protuberance to the middle of the sacrum. In the cervical region, the furrow is broad and ends below in a conspicuous projection caused by the spinous processes of the seventh cervical and first thoracic vertebrae. Above this, the spinous process of the six cervical vertebra sometimes form a projection. The other cervical spinous processes are sunken, but that of the axis can be felt. In the thoracic region, the furrow is shallow and during stooping, disappears, and then the spinous processes become more or less visible. 
the markings produced by them are small and close together. In the lumbar region, the furrow is deep, and the situations of the spinous processes are frequently indicated by little pits or depressions, especially when the muscles in the loins are well developed. In the sacral region, the furrow is shallower, presenting a flattened area which ends below at the most prominent part of the dorsal surface of the sacrum, i.e., the spinous process of the third sacral vertebra. At the bottom of the sacral furrow, the irregular dorsal surface of the bone may be felt, and below this, in the deep groove running to the anus, the coccyx. The only other portions of the vertebral column which can be felt from the surface are the transverse processes of the first, sixth, and seventh cervical vertebrae. Muscles the muscles proper of the back are so obscured by those of the upper extremity that they have very little influence on surface form. The splenei, by their divergence, serve to broaden out the upper part of the back of the neck, and produce a fullness in this situation. In the loin, the sacrospinales, bound down by the lumbodorsal fascia, form rounded vertical eminences which determine the depth of the spinal furrow and taper below to a point on the dorsal surface, the sacrum. The continuations of the sacrospinales in the lower thoracic region form flattened planes which are gradually lost on passing upward. Bony Landmarks In order to identify any particular spinous process, it is customary to count from the prominence caused by the seventh cervical and first thoracic. Of these the latter is the most prominent. The root of the spine of the scapula is on a level with the tip of the spinous process of the third thoracic vertebrae, and the inferior angle with that of the seventh. The highest point of the iliac crest is on a level with the spinous process of the fourth lumbar, and the posterior superior iliac spine with that of the second sacral. The transverse process of the atlas is about one centimeter below and in front of the apex of the mastoid process. The transverse process of the sixth cervical vertebra is opposite the cricoid cartilage. Below it is the transverse process of the seventh and occasionally a cervical rib, medulla spinalis. The position of the lower end of the medulla spinalis varies slightly with the movements of the vertebral column. But, in the adult, in the upright posture, it is usually at the level of the spinous process of the second lumbar vertebra. At birth, it lies at the level of the fourth lumbar. The subdural and subarachnoid cavities end below opposite the spinous process of the third sacral vertebra. End of section 50 Recording by David Lawrence March 2010 in Brampton, Ontario. Section 51 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. Surface Anatomy and Surface Markings of Thorax. 5. Surface Anatomy of the Thorax Bones The skeleton of the thorax is to a very considerable extent covered by muscles, so that in the strongly developed muscular subject it is for the most part concealed. In the emaciated subject, however, the ribs, especially in the lower and lateral regions, stand out as prominent ridges with the sunken intercostal spaces between them. In the middle line, in front, the superficial surface of the sternum can be felt throughout its entire length at the bottom of a furrow, the sternal furrow, situated between the pectoralis majoris. These muscles overlap the anterior surface somewhat, so that the whole width of the sternum is not subcutaneous, and this overlapping is greatest opposite the middle of the bone. The furrow, therefore, is wide at its upper and lower parts, but narrow in the middle. At the upper border of the manubrium sterni is the jugular notch. The lateral parts of this notch are obscured by the tendinous origins of the 
sternocleidomastoidi, which appear as oblique cords narrowing and deepening the notch. Lower down on the subcutaneous surface is a well-defined transverse ridge, the sternal angle. It denotes the junction of the manubrium and body. From the middle of the sternum, the sternal furrow spreads out and ends at the junction of the body with the xiphoid process. Immediately below this is the infrasternal notch. Between the sternal ends of the seventh costal cartilages and below the notch is a triangular depression, the epigastric fossa, in which the xiphoid process can be felt. On either side of the sternum, the costal cartilages and ribs on the front of the thorax are partly obscured by the pectoralis major, through which, however, they can be felt as ridges with yielding intervals between them, corresponding to the intercostal spaces. Of these spaces, that between the second and third ribs is the widest, the next two are somewhat narrower, and the remainder, with the exception of the last two, are comparatively narrow. Below the lower border of the pectoralis major, on the front of the chest, the broad flat outlines of the ribs as they descend, and the more rounded outlines of the costal cartilages are often visible. The lower boundary of the front of the thorax, which is most plainly seen by bending the body backward, is formed by the xiphoid process, the cartilages of the seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth ribs, and the ends of the cartilages of the eleventh and twelfth ribs. On either side of the thorax, from the axilla downward, the flattened external surfaces of the ribs may be defined. Although covered by muscles, all the ribs, with the exception of the first, can generally be followed without difficulty over the front and sides of the thorax. The first rib, being almost completely covered by the clavicle, can only be distinguished in a small portion of its extent. At the back, the angles of the ribs lie on a slightly marked oblique line on either side of, and some distance from, the spinous processes of the vertebrae. The line diverges somewhat as it descends, and lateral to it is a broad convex surface caused by the projection of the ribs beyond their angles. Over this surface, except where covered by the scapula, the individual ribs can be distinguished. Muscles the surface muscles covering the thorax belong to the musculature of the upper extremity and will be described in that section there is however an area of practical importance bounded by these muscles it is limited above by the lower border of trapezius below by the upper border of latissimus dorsi and laterally by the vertebral border of the scapula the floor is partly formed by rhomboideus major if the scapula be drawn forward by folding the arms across the chest and the trunk bent forward parts of the sixth and seventh ribs and the interspace between them become subcutaneous and available for osculation the space is therefore known as the triangle of osculation mamma the size of the mamma is subject to great variations in the adult nulliparous female it extends vertically from the second to the sixth rib, and transversely from the side of the sternum to the mid-axillary line. In the male, and in the nulliparous female, the mammary papilla is situated in the fourth interspace about nine or ten centimeters from the middle line, or two centimeters from the costochondral junction. 6. Surface Markings of the Thorax Bony Landmarks the second costal cartilage, corresponding to the sternal angle, is so readily found that it is used as a starting point from which to count the ribs. The lower border of the pectoralis major at its attachment corresponds to the fifth rib. The uppermost visible digitation of serratus anterior indicates the sixth rib. The jugular notch is in the same horizontal plane as the lower border of the body of the second thoracic vertebra. The sternal angle is at the level of the fifth thoracic vertebra, while the junction between the body and xiphoid process of the sternum corresponds to the fibrocartilage between the ninth and tenth thoracic vertebrae. The influence 
of the obliquity of the ribs on horizontal levels in the thorax is well shown by the following line Quote, if a horizontal line be drawn around the body at the level of the inferior angle of the scapula while the arms are at the sides the line would cut the sternum in front between the fourth and fifth ribs the fifth rib in the nipple line and the ninth rib at the vertebral column Unquote. Treves. Diaphragm. The shape and variations of the diaphragm, as seen by skiography, have already been described. Page 407. Surface lines. For clinical purposes, and for convenience of description, the surface of the thorax has been mapped out by arbitrary lines. On the front of the thorax, the most important vertical lines are the midsternal, the middle line of the sternum, and the mammary, or better, midclavicular, which runs vertically downward from a point midway between the center of the jugular notch and the tip of the acromion. This latter line, if prolonged, is practically continuous with the lateral line on the front of the abdomen. Other vertical lines on the front of the thorax are the lateral sternal along the sternal margin and the parasternal midway between the lateral sternal and the mammary. On either side of the thorax, the anterior and posterior axillary lines are drawn vertically from the corresponding axillary folds. The mid-axillary line runs downward from the apex of the axilla. On the posterior surface of the thorax, the scapular line is drawn vertically through the inferior angle of the scapula. Pleurae. The lines of reflection of the pleurae can be indicated on the surface. On the right side, the line begins at the sternoclavicular articulation and runs downward and medialward to the midpoint of the junction between the manubrium and body of the sternum. It then follows the midsternal line to the lower end of the body of the sternum or on to the xiphoid process, where it turns lateralward and downward across the seventh sternocostal articulation. It crosses the eighth costochondral junction in the mammary line, the tenth rib in the mid-axillary line, and is prolonged thence to the spinous process of the twelfth thoracic vertebra. On the left side, beginning at the sternoclavicular articulation, it reaches the midpoint of the junction between the manubrium and body of the sternum, and extends down the midsternal line in contact with that of the opposite side to the level of the fourth costal cartilage. It then diverges lateral word and is continued downward slightly lateral to the sternal border as far as the sixth costal cartilage. Running downward and lateral word, from this point it crosses the seventh costal cartilage, and from this onward it is similar to the line on the right side, but at a slightly lower level. Lungs. The apex of the lung is situated in the neck above the medial third of the clavicle. The height to which it rises above the clavicle varies very considerably, but is generally about 2.5 centimeters. It may, however, extend as high as 4 or 5 centimeters, or, on the other hand, may scarcely project above the level of this bone. In order to mark out the anterior borders of the lungs, a line is drawn from each apex point, 2.5 centimeters above the clavicle and rather nearer the anterior than the posterior border of sternocleidomastoideus, downward and medialward across the sternoclavicular articulation and manubrium sterni until it meets, or almost meets, its fellow of the other side at the midpoint of junction between the manubrium and body of the sternum. From this point, the two lines run downward, practically along the midsternal line, as far as the level of the fourth costal cartilages. The continuation of the anterior border of the right lung is marked by a prolongation of its line vertically downward to the level of the sixth costal cartilage, and then it turns lateralward and downward. The line on the left side curves lateralward and downward across the fourth sternocostal articulation to reach the parasternal line at the fifth costal cartilage, and then turns medialward and downward to the sixth sternocostal articulation. 
in the position of expiration the lower border of the lung may be marked by a slightly curved line with its convexity downward from the sixth sternocostal junction to the tenth thoracic spinous process this line crosses the mid-clavicular line at the sixth and the mid-axillary line at the eighth rib the posterior borders of the lungs are indicated by lines drawn from the level of the spinous process of the seventh cervical vertebra down either side of the vertebral column across the costal vertebral joints as low as the spinous process of the tenth thoracic vertebra the position of the oblique fissure in either lung can be shown by a line drawn from the spinous process of the second thoracic vertebra around the side of the thorax to the sixth rib in the mid-clavicular line. This line corresponds roughly to the line of the vertebral border of the scapula when the hand is placed on the top of the head. The horizontal fissure in the right lung is indicated by a line drawn from the midpoint of the preceding, or from the position where it cuts the mid-axillary line to the mid-sternal line at the level of the fourth costal cartilage. Trachea this may be marked out on the back by a line from the spinous process of the sixth cervical to that of the fourth thoracic vertebra where it bifurcates. From its bifurcation, the two bronchi are directed downward and lateralward. In front, the point of bifurcation corresponds to the sternal angle. Esophagus the extent of the esophagus may be indicated on the back by a line from the sixth cervical to the level of the ninth thoracic spinous process, 2.5 centimeters to the left of the middle line. Heart. The outline of the heart in relation to the front of the thorax can be represented by a quadrangular figure. The apex of the heart is first determined either by its pulsation or as a point in the fifth interspace nine centimeters to the left of the midsternal line. The other three points are a the seventh right sternocostal articulation, b a point on the upper border of the third right costal cartilage one centimeter from the right lateral sternal line, c a point on the lower border of the second left costal cartilage two point five centimeters from the left lateral sternal line, a line joining the apex point a and traversing the junction of the body of the sternum with the xiphoid process represents the lowest limit of the heart, its acute margin. The right and left borders are represented respectively by lines joining A to B and the apex to C. Both lines are convex lateral word, but the convexity is more marked on the right where its summit is four centimeters distant from the midsternal line opposite the fourth costal cartilage. A portion of the area of the heart thus mapped out is uncovered by lung and therefore gives a dull note on percussion. The remainder being overlapped by lung gives a more or less resonant note. The former is known as the area of superficial cardiac dullness, the latter as the area of deep cardiac dullness. The area of superficial cardiac dullness is somewhat triangular. From the apex of the heart, two lines are drawn to the midsternal line, one to the level of the fourth costal cartilage, the other to the junction between the body and xiphoid process. The portion of the midsternal line between these points is the base of the triangle. Latham lays down the following rule as a sufficient practical guide for the definition of the area of superficial dullness. Quote, Make a circle of two inches in diameter around a point midway between the nipple and the end of the sternum. Unquote. The coronary sulcus can be indicated by a line from the third left to the sixth right sternocostal joint. The anterior longitudinal sulcus is a finger's breadth to the right of the left margin of the heart. The position of the various orifices is as follows. The pulmonary orifice is situated in the upper angle of the third left sternocostal articulation. The aortic orifice is a little below and medial to this, close to the articulation. The left atrial ventricular opening is opposite the fourth costal cartilage and rather to the left of the midsternal line. 
the right atrioventricular opening is a little lower opposite the fourth interspace of the right side the lines indicating the atrioventricular openings are slightly below and parallel to the line of the coronary sulcus arteries the line of the ascending aorta begins slightly to the left of the midsternal line opposite the third costal cartilage and extends upward and to the right to the upper border of the second right costal cartilage the beginning of the aortic arch is indicated by a line from this latter point to the midsternal line about two point five centimeters below the jugular notch the point on the midsternal line is opposite the summit of the arch and a line from it to the right sternoclavicular articulation represents the site of the innominate artery while another line from a point slightly to the left of it and passing through the left sternoclavicular articulation indicates the position of the left common carotid artery in the thorax the internal mammary artery descends behind the first six costal cartilages about one centimeter from the lateral sternal line veins the line of the right innominant vein crosses the right sternoclavicular joint and the upper border of the first right costal cartilage about one centimeter from the lateral sternal line that of the left innominant vein extends from the left sternoclavicular articulation to meet the right at the upper border of the first right costal cartilage the junction of the two lines indicates the origin of the superior vena cava the line of which is continued vertically down to the level of the third right costal cartilage the end of the inferior vena cava is situated opposite the upper margin of the sixth right costal cartilage about two centimeters from the midsternal line end of section fifty one Section 52 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lawrence. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5 by Henry Gray. Surface Anatomy of Abdomen. Skin. The skin of the front of the abdomen is thin. In the male it is often thickly hair-clad, especially toward the lower part of the middle line. In the female the hairs are confined to the pubes. Just below the line of the iliac crest, especially marked in fat subjects, is a shallow groove termed the iliac furrow, while in the site of the inguinal ligament a sharper fold known as the fold of the groin is easily distinguishable after distension of the abdomen from pregnancy or other causes the skin commonly presents transverse white lines which are quite smooth being destitute of papillae these are known as the strata gravidarum or strata albicantes the linea nigra of pregnancy is often seen as a pigmented brown streak in the middle line between the umbilicus and symphysis pubis in the middle line of the front of the abdomen is a shallow furrow which extends from the junction between the body of the sternum with the xiphoid process to a short distance between the umbilicus it corresponds to the linea alba the umbilicus is situated in the middle line but varies in position as regards to its height in an adult subject it is always placed above the middle point of the body and in a normal well-nourished subject it is from two to two point five centimeters above the level of the tubercles of the iliac crests bones the bones in relation with the surface of the abdomen are one the lower part of the vertebral column and the lower ribs and two the pelvis the former having already been described the latter will be considered with the lower limb muscles the only muscles of the abdomen which have any considerable influence on surface form are the obliquus externus and the rectus the upper digitations of origin of obliquus externus are well marked in a muscular subject interdigitating with those in serratus anterior 
the lower digitations are covered by the border of latissimus dorsi and are not visible. The attachment of the obliqui externus and internus to the crest of the ilium forms a thick oblique roll which determines the iliac furrow. Sometimes on the front of the lateral region of the abdomen an undulating line marks the passing of the muscular fibers of the obliquus externus, marks the passing of the muscular fibers of the obliquus externus into its aponeurosis. The lateral markings of the obliquus externus is separated from that of the latissimus dorsi by a small triangular interval, the lumbar triangle, the base of which is formed by the iliac crest, and its floor by obliquus externus. The lateral margin of rectus abdominis is indicated by the linea semilunaris, which may be exactly defined by putting the muscle into action. The surface of the rectus presents three transverse furrows, the tendinous inscriptions, the upper two of these, viz., one opposite, or a little below, the tip of the ziphoid process, and the other midway between this point and the umbilicus, are usually well marked. The third, opposite the umbilicus, is not so distinct. Between the two recti, the linea alba can be palpitated from the ziphoid process to a point just below the umbilicus. It is represented by a distinct dip between the muscles. Beyond this, the muscles are in apposition. Vessels. In thin subjects, the pulsation of the abdominal aorta can be readily felt by making deep pressure in the middle line above the umbilicus. Viscera. Under normal conditions, the various portions of the digestive tube cannot be identified by simple palpitation. Peristalsis of the coils of small intestine can be observed in some persons with extremely thin abdominal walls when some degree of constipation exists. In cases of constipation, it is sometimes possible to trace portions of the great intestine by feeling the fecal masses within the gut. In thin persons with relaxed abdominal walls, the iliac colon can be felt in the left iliac region, rolling under the fingers when empty, and forming a distinct tumor when distended. The greater part of the liver lies under cover of the lower ribs and their cartilages, but in the epigastric fossa it comes in contact with the abdominal wall. The position of the liver varies according to the posture of the body. In the erect posture in the adult male, the edge of the liver projects about one centimeter below the lower margin of the right costal cartridges, and its inferior margin can often be felt in this situation if the abdominal wall is thin. In the supine position, the liver recedes above the margin of the ribs and cannot then be detected by the finger. In the prone position, it falls forward and is then generally palpable in a patient with loose and lax abdominal walls. Its position varies with the respiratory movements. During a deep inspiration, it descends below the ribs. In expiration, it is raised. Pressure from without, as in tight lacing, by compressing the lower part of the chest, displaces the liver considerably, its interior edge frequently extending as low as the crest of the ilium. Again, its position varies greatly with the state of the stomach and intestines. When these are empty, the liver descends. When they are distended, it is pushed upward. The pancreas can sometimes be felt in emaciated subjects when the stomach and colon are empty by making deep pressure in the middle line about seven or eight centimeters above the umbilicus. The kidneys, being situated at the back of the abdominal cavity and deeply placed, cannot be palpitated unless enlarged or misplaced. End of chapter 52 Recording by David Lawrence In Brampton, Ontario, March 2010section 53 of gray's anatomy part 5 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by john t coos john k thomas Vern. 
Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. 8. Surface Markings of the Abdomen. Bony Landmarks. Above, the chief bony markings are the xiphoid process, the lower six costal cartilages, and the anterior ends of the lower six ribs. The junction between the body of the sternum and the xiphoid process is on the level of the 10th thoracic vertebra. Below, the main landmarks are the symphysis pubis and the pubic crest and tubercle, the anterior superior iliac spine and the iliac crest. Muscles. The rectus lies between the linea alba and the linea semilunaris. The former is indicated by the middle line, the latter by a curved line convex lateralward from the tip of the cartilage of the ninth rib to the pubic tubercle. At the level of the umbilicus, the linea semilunaris is about seven centimeters from the middle line. The line indicating the junction of the muscular fibers of obliquus externus with its aponeurosis extends from the tip of the ninth costal cartilage to a point just medial to the anterior superior iliac spine. The umbilicus is at the level of the fibrocartilage between the third and fourth lumbar vertebrae. The subcutaneous inguinal ring is situated one centimeter above and lateral to the pubic tubercle. The abdominal inguinal ring lies one to two centimeters above the middle of the inguinal ligament. The position of the inguinal canal is indicated by a line joining these two points. Surface lines. For convenience of description of the viscera and of reference to morbid conditions of the contained parts, the abdomen is divided into nine regions by imaginary planes, two horizontal and two sagittal, the edge of the planes being indicated by lines drawn on the surface of the body. In the older method, the upper or subcostal horizontal line encircles the body at the level of the lowest points of the tenth costal cartilages. The lower or intertubercular is a line carried through the highest points of the iliac crest seen from the front i.e. through the tubercles on the iliac crests about 5 cm behind the anterior superior spines. An alternative method is that of Addison, who adopts the following lines. 1. An upper transverse, the transpyloric, halfway between the jugular notch and the upper border of the symphysis pubis. This indicates the margin of the transpyloric plane, which in most cases cuts through the pylorus, the tips of the ninth costal cartilages, and the lower border of the first lumbar vertebra. 2. A lower transverse line midway between the upper transverse and the upper border of the symphysis pubis. This is termed the transtubercular, since it practically corresponds to that passing through the iliac tubercles. Behind, its plane cuts the body of the fifth lumbar vertebra. By means of these horizontal planes, the abdomen is divided into three zones named from above, the subcostal, umbilical, and hypogastric zones. Each of these is further subdivided into three regions by the two sagittal planes, which are indicated on the surface by a right and left lateral line drawn vertically through points halfway between the anterior superior iliac spines and the middle line. The middle region of the upper zone is called epigastric, and the two lateral regions, the right and left hypochondriac. The central region of the middle zone is the umbilical, and the two lateral regions, the right and left lumbar. The middle region of the lower zone is the hypogastric or pubic, and the lateral are the right and left iliac or inguinal. The middle regions, viz. 
epigastric, umbilical, and pubic, can each be divided into right and left portions by the middle line. In the following description of the viscera, the regions marked out by Addison's lines are those referred to. Stomach. The shape of the stomach is constantly undergoing alteration. It is affected by the particular phase of the process of gastric digestion, by the state of the surrounding viscera, and by the amount and character of its contents. Its position also varies with that of the body, so that it is impossible to indicate it on the surface with any degree of accuracy. The measurements given refer to a moderately filled stomach with the body in the supine position. The cardiac orifice is opposite the seventh costal cartilage, about 2.5 centimeters, from the side of the sternum. It corresponds to the level of the tenth thoracic vertebra. The pyloric orifice is on the transpyloric line, about one centimeter to the right of the middle line, or alternately five centimeters below the seventh right sternocostal articulation. It is at the level of the first lumbar vertebra. A curved line, convex downward and to the left, joining these points indicates the lesser curvature. In the left lateral line, the fundus of the stomach reaches as high as the fifth interspace, or the sixth costal cartilage, a little below the apex of the heart. To indicate the greater curvature, a curved line is drawn from the cardiac orifice to the summit of the fundus, thence downward and to the left, finally turning medialward to the pyloric orifice, but passing on its way through the intersection of the left lateral with the transpyloric line. The portion of the stomach which is in contact with the abdominal wall can be represented roughly by a triangular area the base of which is formed by a line drawn from the tip of the tenth left costal cartilage to the tip of the ninth right cartilage, and the sides by two lines drawn from the end of the eighth left costal cartilage to the ends of the base line. A space of some cl clinical importance, the space of Traub, overlies the stomach and may be thus indicated. It is, it is semi-lunar in outline and lies within the following boundaries. The lower edge of the left lung, the anterior border of the spleen, the left costal margin and the inferior margin of the left lobe of the liver. Duodenum. The superior part is horizontal and extends from the pylorus to the right lateral line. The descending part is situated medial to the right lateral line, from the transpyloric line to a point midway between the transpyloric and transtubercular lines. The horizontal part runs with a slight upward slope from the end of the descending part to the left of the middle line. The ascending part is vertical and reaches the transpyloric line, where it ends in the duodeno-jejunal flexure about 2.9 centimeters to the left of the middle line. Small intestine. The coils of the small intestine occupy the front of the abdomen. For the most part, the coils of the jejunum are situated on the left side, i.e. in the left lumbar and iliac regions, and in the left half of the umbilical region. The coils of the ilium lie toward the right in the right lumbar and iliac regions, in the right half of the umbilical region, and in the hypogastric region, a portion of the ilium is within the pelvis. The end of the ilium, i.e. the iliocolic junction, is slightly below and medial to the intersection of the right lateral and transtubercular lines. Cecum and vermiform process. The cecum is in the right iliac and hypogastric regions. Its position varies with its degree of distension, but the midpoint of a line draws from the right anterior superior iliac spine 
to the upper margin of the symphysis pubis will mark approximately the middle of its lower border. The position of the base of the vermiform process is indicated by a point on the lateral line on a level with the anterior superior iliac spine. Ascending colon. The ascending colon passes upward through the right lumbar region, lateral to the right lateral line. The right colic flexure is situated in the upper and right angle of intersection of the subcostal and right lateral lines. Transverse colon. The transverse colon crosses the abdomen on the confines of the umbilical and epigastric regions, its lower border being on a level slightly above the umbilicus, its upper border just below the great curvature of the stomach. Descending colon. The left colic flexure is situated in the upper left angle of the intersection between the left lateral and transpyloric lines. The descending colon courses down through the left lumbar region, lateral to the left lateral line, as far as the iliac crest. Iliac colon. The line of the iliac colon is from the end of the descending colon to the left lateral line at the left of the anterior superior iliac spine. Liver. The upper limit of the right lobe of the liver in the middle line is at the level of the junction between the body of the sternum and the xiphoid process. On the right side, the line must be carried upward as far as the fifth costal cartilage in the mammary line, and then downward to reach the seventh rib at the side of the thorax. The upper limit of the left lobe can be defined by continuing this line downward and to the left to the sixth costal cartilage, five centimeters from the middle line. The lower limit can be indicated by a line drawn one centimeter below the lower margin of the thorax on the right side as far as the ninth costal cartilage, thence obliquely upward to the eighth left costal cartilage, crossing to the middle line just above the transpyloric plane, and finally, with a slight left convexity, to the end of the line indicating the upper limit. According to Birmingham, the limits of the normal liver may be marked out on the surface of the body in the following manner. Take three points. A. 1.25 cm below the right nibble. B. 1.25 cm below the tip of the tenth rib. C. 2.5 cm below the left nibble. Join A and C by a line slightly convex upward. A and B by a line slightly convex lateral word, and B and C by a line slightly convex downward. The fundus of the gallbladder approaches the surface behind the anterior end of the ninth right costal cartilage close to the lateral margin of the rectus abdominis. Pancreas, figure 12.25. The pancreas lies in front of the second lumbar vertebra. Its head occupies the curve of the duodenum and is therefore indicated by the same lines as that viscous. Its neck corresponds to the pylorus. Its body extends along the transpyloric line, the bulk of it lying above this line to the tail, which is in the left hypochondriac region slightly to the left of the lateral line and above the transpyloric. Spleen. To map out the spleen, the tenth rib is taken as representing its long axis. Vertically, it is situated between the upper border of the ninth and the lower border of the eleventh ribs. The highest point is four centimeters from the middle line of the back at the level of the tip of the ninth thoracic spinous process. The lowest point is in the mid-axillary line at the level of the first lumbar spinous process. Kidneys. The right kidney usually lies about one centimeter lower than the left, but for practical purposes, similar surface markings are taken for each. On the front of the abdomen, 
the upper pole lies midway between the plane of the lower end of the body of the sternum and the transpyloric plane, five centimeters from the middle line. The lower pole is situated between the transpyloric and intertubular planes, seven centimeters from the middle line. The hilum is on the transpyloric plane, five centimeters from the middle line. Round these three points, a kidney-shaped figure, four centimeters to five centimeters broad, is drawn two-thirds of which lies medial to the lateral line. To indicate the position of the kidney from the back, the parallelogram of Morris is used. Two vertical lines are drawn. The first 2.5 centimeters, the second 9.5 centimeters from the middle line. The parallelogram is completed by two horizontal lines drawn respectively at the levels of the tips of the spinous process of the 11th thoracic and the lower border of the spinous process of the third lumbar vertebra. The hilum is five centimeters from the middle line at the level of the spinous process of the first lumbar vertebra. Ureters. On the front of the abdomen, the line of the ureter runs from the hilum of the kidney to the pubic tubercle. On the back, from the hilum vertically downward, passing practically through the posterior superior iliac spine. Vessels. The inferior epigastric artery can be marked out by a line from a point midway between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic symphysis to the umbilicus. This line also indicates the lateral boundary of Hesselbach's triangle an area of importance in connection with inguinal hernia. The other boundaries are the lateral edge of rectus abdominis and the medial half of the inguinal ligament. The line of the abdominal aorta begins in the middle line about 4 centimeters above the transpyloric line and extends to a point 2 centimeters below and to the left of the umbilicus or more accurately, to a point two centimeters to the left of the middle line, on a line which passes through the highest points of the iliac crests. The point of termination of the abdominal aorta corresponds to the level of the fourth lumbar vertebra, a line drawn from it to a point midway between the anterior superior iliac spine and the symphysis pubis, indicates the common and external iliac arteries. The common iliac is represented by the upper third of this line, the external iliac by the remaining two-thirds. Of the larger branches of the abdominal aorta, the celiac artery is four centimeters, the superior mesenteric two centimeters above the transpyloric line. The renal arteries are two centimeters below the same line. The inferior mesenteric artery is four centimeters above the bifurcation of the abdominal aorta. Nerves. The thoracic nerves on the anterior abdominal wall are represented by lines continuing those of the bony ribs. The termination of the seventh nerve is at the level of the xiphoid process. The tenth reaches the vicinity of the umbilicus. The twelfth ends about midway between the umbilicus and the upper border of the symphysis pubis. The first lumbar is parallel to the thoracic nerves. Its iliohypogastric branch becomes cutaneous above the subcutaneous inguinal ring, its ilioinguinal branch at the ring. End of section 53. Section 54 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John K. Thomas, John Coos, Vern. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5.
by Henry Gray. 9. Surface anatomy of the perineum. Skin. In the middle line of the posterior part of the perineum, and about 4 centimeters in front of the tip of the coccyx, is the anal orifice. The junction of the mucous membrane of the anal canal with the skin of the perineum is marked by a white line, which indicates also the line of contact of the external and internal sphincters. In the anterior part of the perineum, the external genital organs are situated. The skin covering the scrotum is rough and corrugated, but over the penis it is smooth. Extending forward from the anus on to the scrotum and penis is a median ridge, which indicates the scrotal raphe. In the female are seen the skin reduplications forming the labia majora and minora laterally, the frenulum of the labia behind, and the pupus of the clitoris in front, still more anteriorly is the mons pubis. Bones. In the anterolateral boundaries of the perineum, the whole outline of the pubic arch can be readily traced, ending in the ischial tuberosities. Behind, in the middle line, is the tip of the coccyx. Muscles and ligaments. The margin of the gluteus maximus forms the posterolateral boundary, and in thin subjects, by pressing deeply, the sacrotuberous ligament can be felt through the muscle. The only other muscles influencing surface form are the ischiocavernosus, covering the crust penis, which lies on the side of the pubic arch, and the sphincter ani externus, which, in action, closes the anal orifice and causes a puckering of the skin around it. 10. Surface markings of the perineum. A line drawn transversely across in front of the ischial tuberosities divides the perineum into a posterior or rectal, and an anterior or urogenital triangle. This line passes through the central point of the perineum, which is situated about 2.5 centimeters in front of the center of the anal aperture, or, in the male, midway between the anus and the reflection of the skin onto the scrotum. Rectum and anal canal. A finger inserted through the anal orifice is grasped by the sphincter ani externus, passes into the region of the sphincter ani internus, and higher up encounters the resistance of the puborectalis. Beyond this, it may reach the lowest of the transverse rectal folds. In front, the urethral bulb and membranous part of the urethra are first identified, and then about 4 centimeters above the anal orifice, the prostate is felt. Beyond this, the vesiculae seminals, if enlarged, and the fundus of the bladder, when distended, can be recognized. On either side is the ischiorectal fossa. Behind are the anococcygeal body, the pelvic surfaces of the coccyx and lower end of the sacrum, and the sacrospinous ligaments. In the female, the posterior wall and fornix of the vagina and the cervix and body of the uterus can be felt in front, while somewhat laterally the ovaries can just be reached. Male urogenital organs. The corpora cavernosa penis can be followed backward to the crura, which are attached to the sides of the pubic arch. The glans penis, covered by the pupus, and the external urethral orifice can be examined, and the course of the urethra traced along the undersurface of the penis to the bulb, which is situated immediately in front of the central point of the perineum. Through the wall of the scrotum on either side of the testis can be palpated. It lies toward the back of the scrotum, and along its posterior border the epididymis can be felt. Passing upward along the medial side of the epididymis is the spermatic cord, 
which can be traced upward to the subcutaneous inguinal ring. By means of a sound, the general topography of the urethra and bladder can be investigated. With the urethroscope, the interior of the urethra can be illuminated and viewed directly. With the cystoscope, the interior of the bladder is in a similar manner illuminated for visual examination. In the bladder, the main points to which attention is directed are the trigone, the torus uretericus, the plicae ureterice, and the openings of the ureters and urethra. Female urogenital organs. In the pudental cleft between the labia minora and the openings of the vagina and urethra. In the virgin, the vaginal opening is partly closed by the hymen. After coitus, the remains of the hymen are represented by the carunculae hymenals. Between the hymen and the frenulum of the labia is the fossa navicularis, while in the groove between the hymen and the labium minus on either side, the small opening of the greater vestibular Bartholin's gland can be seen. These glands, when enlarged, can be felt on either side of the posterior part of the vaginal orifice. By inserting a finger into the vagina, the following structures can be examined through its wall. Behind, from below upward, are the anal canal, the rectum, and the rectuterine excavation. Projecting into the roof of the vagina is the vaginal portion of the cervix uteri with the external uterine orifice. In front of and behind the cervix, the anterior and posterior vaginal thornices respectively can be examined. With the finger in the vagina and the other hand on the abdominal wall, the whole of the cervix and body of the uterus, the uterine tubes, and the ovaries can be palpated. If a speculum be introduced into the vagina, the walls of the passage, the vaginal portion of the cervix, and the external uterine orifice can be exposed for visual examination. The external urethral orifice lies in front of the vaginal opening. The angular gap in which it is situated between the two converging labia minora is termed the vestibule. The urethral canal in the female is very dilatable and can be explored with the finger. About 2.5 centimeters in front of the external orifice of the urethra are the glands and prepuce of the clitoris, and still farther forward is the mons pubis. End of section 54. Recording by John T.K http www.validateyourlife.com Section 55 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. Surface Anatomy of Upper Extremity, Part 1 Skin The skin covering the shoulder and arm is smooth and very movable on the underlying structures. In the axilla there are numerous hairs and many sudoriferous and sebaceous glands. Over the medial side and front of the forearm, the skin is thin and smooth, and contains few hairs but many sudoriferous glands. Over the lateral side and back of the arm and forearm, it is thicker, denser, and contains more hairs but fewer sudoriferous glands. In the region of the olecranon, it is thick and rough, and is very loosely connected to the underlying tissue, so that it falls into transverse wrinkles when the forearm is extended. At the front of the wrist, there are three transverse furrows in the skin. They correspond, respectively, from above downward, to the positions of the styloid process of the ulna, the wrist joint, and the midcarpal joint. The skin of the palm of the hand differs considerably from that of the forearm. At the wrist it suddenly becomes hard and dense and covered with a thick layer of epidermis. On the thenar eminence these characteristics are less marked than elsewhere. In spite of its hardness and density the skin of the palm is exceedingly sensitive and very vascular, 
but it is destitute of hairs and sebaceous glands. It is tied down by fibrous bands along the lines of flexion of the digits, exhibiting certain furrows of a permanent character. One of these, starting in front of the wrist at the tuberosity of the navicular bone, curves around the thenar eminence and ends on the radial border of the hand a little above the metacarpophalangeal joint of the index finger. A second line begins at the end of the first and extends obliquely across the palm to reach the ulnar border about the middle of the fifth metacarpal bone. A third line begins at the ulnar border about 2.5 centimeters distal to the end of the second and extends across the heads of the fifth, fourth, and third metacarpal bones. The proximal segments of the fingers are joined to one another on the volar aspect by folds of skin constituting the web of the fingers. These folds extend across about the level of the centers of the proximal phalanges, and their free margins are continuous with the transverse furrows at the roots of the fingers. Since the web is confined to the volar aspect, the fingers appear shorter when viewed from in front than from behind. Over the fingers and thumb, the skin again becomes thinner, especially at the flexures of the joints where it is crossed by transverse furrows and over the terminal phalanges. It is disposed on numerous ridges in consequence of the arrangement of the papillae in it. These ridges form in different individuals distinctive and permanent patterns which can be used for purposes of identification. The superficial fascia in the palm of the hand is made up of dense fibro fatty tissue which binds the skin so firmly to the palmar aponeurosis that very little movement is permitted between the two. On the back of the hand and fingers the subcutaneous tissue is lax so that the skin is freely movable on the underlying parts. Over the interphalangeal joints the skin is very loose and is thrown into transverse wrinkles when the fingers are extended. Bones The clavicle can be felt throughout its entire length. The enlarged sternal extremity projects above the upper margin of the sternum at the side of the jugular notch, and from this the body of the bone can be traced lateralward immediately under the skin. The medial part is convex forward, but the surface is partially obscured by the attachments of the sternocleida mastoideus and pectoralis major. The lateral third is concave forward and ends at the acromion of the scapula in a slight enlargement. The clavicle is almost horizontal when the arm is lying by the side, although in muscular subjects it may incline a little upward at its acromial end, which is on a plane posterior to the sternal end. The only parts of the scapula that are truly subcutaneous are the spine and acromion, but the coracoid process, the vertebral border, the inferior angle, and to a lesser extent the axillary border can also be readily defined. The acromion and spine are easily recognizable throughout their entire extent, forming with the clavicle the arch of the shoulder. The acromion forms the point of the shoulder. It joins the clavicle at an acute angle, the acromial angle, slightly medial to and behind the tip of the acromion. The spine can be felt as a distinct ridge, marked on the surface as an oblique depression which becomes less distinct and ends in a slight dimple, a little lateral to the spinous processes of the vertebrae. Below this point, the vertebral border can be traced downward and lateralward to the inferior angle, which can be identified although covered by latissimus dorsi. From the inferior angle, the axillary border can usually be traced upward through its thick muscular covering, forming with its enveloping muscles the posterior fold of the axilla. The coracoid process is situated about two centimeters below the junction of the intermediate and lateral thirds of the clavicle. It is covered by the anterior border of deltoideus and thus lies a little lateral to the infraclavicular fossa or depression which marks the interval between the pectoralis major and deltoideus. The humerus is almost entirely surrounded by muscles and the only parts which are strictly subcutaneous are small portions of the medial and lateral epicondyles. In addition to these, however, the tubercles and a part of the head of the bone can be felt under the skin and muscles by which they are covered. Of these, the greater tubercle forms the most prominent bony point of the shoulder, extending beyond the acromion. It is best recognized when the arm is lying passive by the side, for if the arm be raised, it recedes under the arch of the shoulder. The lesser tubercle, directed forward, is medial to the greater and separated from it by the intertubercular groove, which can be made out by deep pressure. When the arm is abducted, the lower part of the head of the humerus can be examined by pressing deeply in the axilla. On either side of the elbow joint and just above it are the medial and lateral epicondyles. Of these, the former is the more prominent, but the medial supracondylar ridge passing upward from it is much less marked than the lateral, and as a rule is not palpable. Occasionally, however, the hook-shaped supracondylar process is found on this border. 
The position of the lateral epicondyle is best seen during semiflexion of the forearm and is indicated by a depression. From it, the strongly marked lateral supracondylar ridge runs upward. The most prominent part of the ulna, the olecranon, can always be identified at the back of the elbow joint. When the forearm is flexed, the upper quadrilateral surface is palpable, but during extension it recedes into the olecranon fossa. During extension, the upper border of the olecranon is slightly above the level of the medial epicondyle and nearer to this than to the lateral. When the forearm is fully flexed, the olecranon and the epicondyles form the angles of an equilateral triangle. On the back of the olecranon is a smooth triangular subcutaneous surface, and running down the back of the forearm from the apex of this triangle, the prominent dorsal border of the ulna can be felt in its whole length. It has a sinuous outline and is situated in the middle of the back of the limb above, but below, where it is rounded off, it can be traced to the small subcutaneous surface of the styloid process on the medial side of the wrist. The styloid process forms a prominent tubercle continuous above with the dorsal border and ending below in a blunt apex at the level of the wrist joint. It is most evident when the hand is in a position midway between supination and pronation. When the forearm is pronated, another prominence, the head of the ulna, appears behind and above the styloid process. Below the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, a portion of the head of the radius is palpable. Its position is indicated on the surface by a little dimple, which is best seen when the arm is extended. If the finger be placed in this dimple and the semi-flexed forearm be alternately pronated and supinated, the head of the radius will be felt distinctly rotating in the radial notch. The upper half of the body of the bone is obscured by muscles. The lower half, though not subcutaneous, can be readily examined, and if traced downward is found to end in a lozenge-shaped convex surface on the lateral side of the base of the styloid process. This is the only subcutaneous part of the bone, and from its lower end the apex of the styloid process bends medialward toward the wrist. About the middle of the dorsal surface of the lower end of the radius is the dorsal radial tubercle, best perceived when the wrist is slightly flexed. It forms the lateral boundary of the oblique groove for the tendon of the extensor pollicis longus. On the front of the wrist are two subcutaneous eminences, one on the radial side, the larger and flatter, produced by the tuberosity of the navicular and the ridge on the greater multangular, the other on the ulnar side by the pisiform. The tuberosity of the navicular is distal and medial to the styloid process of the radius and is most clearly visible when the wrist joint is extended. The ridge on the greater multangular is about one centimeter distal to it. The pisiform is about one centimeter distal to the lower end of the ulna and just distal to the level of the styloid process of the radius. It is crossed by the uppermost crease which separates the front of the forearm from the palm of the hand. The rest of the volar surface of the bony carpus is covered by tendons and the transverse carpal ligament and is entirely concealed, with the exception of the hamulus of the hamate bone, which, however, is difficult to define. On the dorsal surface of the carpus, only the triangular bone can be clearly made out, Distal to the carpus, the dorsal surfaces of the metacarpal bones, covered by the extensor tendons, except the fifth, are visible only in very thin hands. The dorsal surface of the fifth is, however, subcutaneous throughout almost its whole length. Slightly lateral to the middle line of the hand is a prominence, frequently well marked but occasionally indistinct, formed by the styloid process of the third metacarpal bone. It is situated about four centimeters distal to the dorsal radial tubercle. The heads of the metacarpal bones can be plainly seen and felt, rounded in contour and standing out in bold relief under the skin when the fist is clenched. The head of the third is the most prominent. In the palm of the hand, the metacarpal bones are covered by muscles, tendons, and aponeuroses, so that only their heads can be distinguished. The base of the metacarpal bone of the thumb, however, is prominent dorsally distal to the styloid process of the radius. The body of the bone is easily palpable, ending at the head in a flattened prominence, in front of which are the sesamoid bones. The enlarged ends of the phalanges can be easily felt. When the digits are bent, the proximal phalanges form prominences, which in the joints between the first and second phalanges are slightly hollow, but flattened and square-shaped in those between the second and third. Articulations 
The sternoclavicular joint is subcutaneous, and its position is indicated by the enlarged sternal extremity of the clavicle, lateral to the long cord-like sternal head of sternocleidomastoideus. If this muscle be relaxed, a depression between the end of the clavicle and the sternum can be felt, defining the exact position of the joint. The position of the acromioclavicular joint can generally be ascertained by determining the slightly enlarged acromial end of the clavicle, which projects above the level of the acromion. Sometimes this enlargement is so considerable as to form a rounded eminence. The shoulder joint is deeply seated and cannot be palpated. If the forearm be slightly flexed, a curved crease or fold with its convexity downward is seen in front of the elbow, extending from one epicondyl to the other. The elbow joint is slightly distal to the center of the fold. The position of the radiohumeral joint can be ascertained by feeling for a slight groove or depression between the head of the radius and the capitulum of the humerus at the back of the elbow joint. The position of the proximal radio ulnar joint is marked on the surface at the back of the elbow by the dimple which indicates the position of the head of the radius. The site of the distal radio ulnar joint can be defined by feeling for the slight groove at the back of the wrist between the prominent head of the ulna and the lower end of the radius when the forearm is in a state of almost complete pronation. Of the three transverse skin furrows on the front of the wrist, the middle corresponds fairly accurately with the wrist joint, while the most distal indicates the position of the midcarpal articulation. The metacarpophalangeal and interphalangeal joints are readily available for surface examination. The former are situated just distal to the prominences of the knuckles. The latter are sufficiently indicated by the furrows on the volar and the wrinkles on the dorsal surfaces. End of section 55《Section 56 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeanne Luft. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5 by Henry Gray. Surface Anatomy of Upper Extremity, Part 2. Muscles. The anterior border of the trapezius presents as a slight ridge running downward and forward from the superior neutral line of the occipital bone to the junction of the intermediate and lateral thirds of the clavicle. The inferior border of the muscle forms an undulating ridge passing downward and medialward from the root of the spine of the scapula to the spinous process of the twelfth thoracic vertebra. The lateral border of the latissimus dorsi may be traced when the muscle is in action as a rounded edge starting from the iliac crest and slanting obliquely forward and upward to the axilla, where it takes part with a teres major in forming the posterior axillary fold. The pectoralis major conceals a considerable part of the thoracic wall in front. Its sternal organ presents a border which bounds and determines the width of the sternal furrow. The upper margin is generally well marked medially and forms the medial boundary of a triangular depression, the infraclavicular fossa, which separates the pectoralis major from the deltoideus. It gradually becomes less marked as it approaches the tendon of insertion and is closely blended with the deltoideus. The lower border of pectoralis major forms the rounded anterior axillary fold. Occasionally, a gap is visible between the clavicular and sternal parts of the muscle. When the arm is raised, the lowest slip of origin of pectoralis minor produces a fullness just below the anterior axillary fold and serves to break the sharp outline of the lower border of pectoralis major. The origin of the serratus anterior causes a very characteristic surface marking. When the arm is abducted, the lower five or six serrations form a zigzag line with a general convexity forward. When the arm is by the side, the highest visible serration is that attached to the fifth rib. The deltoideus, with the prominence of the upper end of the humerus, produces the rounded contour of the shoulder. It is rounded and fuller in front than behind, where it presents a somewhat flattened form. 
Above, its anterior border presents a slightly curved eminence, which forms the lateral boundary of the infraclavicular fossa. Below, it is closely united with the pectoralis major. Its posterior border is thin, flattened, and scarcely marked above, but is thicker and more prominent below. The insertion of deltoideus is marked by a depression on the lateral side of the middle of the arm. Of the scapular muscles, the only one which influences surface form is the teres major. It assists the latissimus dorsi in forming the thick, rounded posterior axillary fold. When the arm is raised, the cora cobrachialis reveals itself as a narrow elevation emerging from under cover of the anterior axillary fold and running medial to the body of the humerus. On the front and medial aspects of the arm is the prominence of the biceps brachii, bounded on either side by an interior muscular depression. It determines the contour of the front of the arm and extends from the anterior axillary fold to the bend of the elbow. Its upper tendons are concealed by the pectoralis major and deltoideus, and its lower tendon sinks into the anticubital fossa. When the muscle is fully contracted, it presents a globular form, and the lacertus fibrosus attached to its tendon of insertion becomes prominent as a sharp ridge running downward and medialward. On either side of the biceps brachii at the lower part of the arm, the brachialis is discernible. Laterally, it forms a narrow eminence, extending some distance up the arm. Medially, it exhibits only a little fullness above the elbow. On the back of the arm, the long head of the triceps brachii may be seen as a longitudinal eminence, emerging from under cover of deltoideus and gradually passing into the flattened plane of the tendon of the muscle at the lower part of the back of the arm. When the muscle is in action, the medial and lateral heads become prominent. On the front of the elbow are two muscular elevations, one on either side, separate above but converging below, so as to form the medial and lateral boundaries of the anti-cubital fossa. The medial elevation consists of the pronator teres and the flexors and forms a fusiform mass pointed above at the medial epicondyle and gradually tapering off below. The pronator teres is the most lateral of the group, while the flexor carpi radialis, lying to its medial side, is the most prominent and may be traced downward to its tendon, which is situated nearer to the radial than to the ulnar border of the front of the wrist and medial to the radial artery. The palmaris longus presents no surface marking above but below, its tendon stands out when the muscle is in action as a sharp tense cord in front of the middle of the wrist. The flexor digitorum sublimus does not directly influence surface form. The position of its four tendons on the front of the lower part of the forearm is indicated by an elongated depression between the tendons of palmaris longus and flexor carpi ulnaris. The flexor carpi ulnaris determines the contour of the medial border of the forearm and is separated from the extensor group of muscles by the ulnar furrow produced by the subcutaneous dorsal border of the ulna. Its tendon is evident along the ulnar border of the lower part of the forearm and is most marked when the hand is flexed and adducted. The elevation forming the lateral side of the antecubital fossa consists of the brachioradialis, the extensors, and the supinator. It occupies the lateral and a considerable part of the dorsal surface of the forearm in the region of the elbow and forms a fusiform mass which is altogether on a higher level than that produced by the medial elevation. Its apex is between the triceps brachii and brachialis, some distance below the elbow joint. It acquires its greatest breadth opposite the lateral epicondyle, and below this shades off into a flattened surface. About the middle of the forearm, it divides into two diverging longitudinal eminences. The lateral eminence consists of brachioradialis and the extensoris carpi radialis longus and brevis and descends from the lateral supracondylar ridge in the direction of the styloid process of the radius. 
the medial eminence comprises the extensor digitorum communis, extensor digiti quinti proprius, and the extensor carpi ulnaris. It begins at the lateral epicondyle of the humerus as a tapering mass which is separated above from the achenaeus, from a well-marked furrow, and below from the pronator teres and the flexor group by the ulnar furrow. The medial border of the brachioradialis starts as a rounded elevation above the lateral epicondyle. Lower down, the muscle forms a prominent mass on the radial side of the upper part of the forearm. Below, it tapers to its tendon, which may be traced to the styloid process of the radius. The achenaeus presents a triangular, slightly elevated area, immediately lateral to the subcutaneous surface of the olecranon and differentiated from the extensor group by an oblique depression. The upper angle of the triangle is at the dimple over the lateral epicondyle. At the lower part of the back of the forearm, in the interval between the two diverging eminences, is an oblique elongated swelling. Full above, but flattened and partially subdivided below, it is caused by the abductor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis brevis. It crosses the dorsal and lateral surfaces of the radius to the radial side of the wrist joint, whence it is continued on to the dorsal surface of the thumb as a ridge best marked when the thumb is extended. The tendons of most of the extensor muscles can be seen and felt on the back of the wrist. Laterally is the oblique ridge produced by the extensor pollicis longus. The extensor carpi radialis longus is scarcely palpable, but the extensor carpi radialis brevis can be identified as a vertical ridge emerging from under the ulnar border of the tendon of the extensor pollicis longus when the wrist is extended. Medial to this, the extensor tendons of the finger can be felt, the extensor digiti quinti propius being separated from the tendons of the extensor digitorum communis by a slight furrow. The muscles of the hand are principally concerned, as regards surface form, in producing the thenar and hypothenar eminences, and cannot be individually distinguished. The thenar eminence on the radial side is larger and rounder than the hypothenar, which is a long, narrow elevation along the ulnar side of the palm. When the palmaris brevis is in action, it produces a wrinkling of the skin over the hypothenar eminence and a dimple on the ulnar border. On the back of the hand, the interossi dorsalis give rise to the elongated swellings between the metacarpal bones, the first forms a prominent fusiform bulging when the thumb is adducted, the others are not so marked. Arteries Above the middle of the clavicle, the pulsation of the subclavian artery can be detected by pressing downward, backward, and medialward against the first rib. The pulsation of the axillary artery as it crosses the second rib can be felt below the middle of the clavicle, just medial to the coracoid process. Along the lateral wall of the axilla, the course of the artery can be easily followed close to the medial border of the coracobrachialis. The brachial artery can be recognized in practicality the whole of this extent along the medial margin of the biceps and the upper two-thirds of the arm it lies medial to the humerus, but in the lower third it is more directly on the front of the bone. Over the lower end of the radius, between the styloid process and flexor carpi radialis, a portion of the radial artery is superficial and is used clinically for observations on the pulse. Veins. The superficial veins of the upper extremity are easily rendered visible by compressing the proximal trunks. Their arrangement is described on pages 660 to 662. Nerves. The uppermost trunks of the brachial plexus are palpable for a short distance above the clavicle as they emerge from under the lateral border of the sternocleidomastoideus. The larger nerves, derived from the plexus, can be rolled under the finger against the lateral axillary wall but cannot be identified. The ulnar nerve can be detected in the groove behind the medial epicondyle of the humerus. End of section 56. Recording by Jean Luff.
Section 57 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jean Hilde Fulgham. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. 12. Surface Markings of the Upper Extremity. Bony Landmarks. The bony landmarks as described above are so readily available for surface recognition that no special measurements are required to indicate them. It may be noted, however, that the medial angle of the scapula is applied to the second rib, while the inferior angle lies against the seventh. The intertubercular groove of the humerus is vertically below the acromioclavicular joint, when the arm hangs by the side with the palm of the hand forward. Articulations. The acromioclavicular joint is situated in a plane passing sagittally through the middle line of the front of the arm. The line of the elbow joint is not straight. The radiohumeral portion is practically at right angles to the long axis of the humerus and is situated about two centimeters distal to the lateral epicondyle. The ulnohumeral portion is oblique and its medial end is about 2.5 centimeters distal to the medial epicondyle. The position of the wrist joint can be indicated by drawing a curved line, with its convexity upward, between the styloid processes of the radius and ulna. The summit of the convexity is about 1 centimeter above the center of a straight line joining the two processes. Muscles the only muscles of the upper extremity which occasionally require definition by surface lines are the trapezius, the latissimus dorsi, and the pectoralis major and minor. The antero-superior border of trapezius is indicated by a line from the superior nuchal line about 3 cm lateral to the external occipital protuberance to the junction of the intermediate and lateral thirds of the clavicle. The line of the lower border extends from the spinous process of the twelfth thoracic vertebra to the vertebral border of the scapula at the root of the spine. The upper border of latissimus dorsi is almost horizontal, running from the spinous process of the seventh thoracic vertebra to the inferior angle of the scapula, and thence somewhat obliquely to the intertubercular sulcus of the humerus. The lower border corresponds roughly to a line drawn from the iliac crest about two centimeters from the lateral margin of the sacrospinalis to the intertubercular sulcus. The upper margin of pectoralis major extends from the middle of the clavicle to the surgical neck of the humerus. Its lower border is practically in the line of the fifth rib and reaches from the fifth costochondral junction to the middle of the anterior border of deltoideus. The two lines indicating the borders of pectoralis minor begin at the coracoid process of the scapula and extend to the third and fifth ribs respectively, just lateral to the corresponding costal cartilages. On the front of the elbow joint a triangular space, the antecubital fossa, is mapped out for convenience of reference. The base of the triangle is a line joining the medial and lateral epicondyles while the sides are formed respectively by the salient margins of the brachioradialis and pronator teres. Mucus sheaths. On the volar surfaces of the wrist and hand, the mucus sheaths of the flexor tendons can be indicated as follows. The sheath for flexor pollicis longus extends from about 3 cm above the upper edge of the transverse carpal ligament to the terminal phalanx of the thumb. The common sheath for the flexoris digitorum reaches about 3.5 to 4 cm above the upper edge of the transverse carpal ligament, and extends on the palm of the hand to about the level of the centers of the metacarpal bones. The sheath for the tendons to the little finger is continued from the common sheath to the base of the terminal phalanx of this finger. The sheaths for the tendons of the other fingers are separated from the common sheath by an interval. They begin opposite the necks of the metacarpal bones and extend to the terminal phalanges. Arteries 
The course of the axillary artery can be marked out by abducting the arm to a right angle and drawing a line from the middle of the clavicle to the point where the tendon of the pectoralis major crosses the prominence of the coracobrachialis. Of the branches of the axillary artery, the origin of the thoracoacromial corresponds to the point where the artery crosses the upper border of pectoralis minor. The lateral thoracic takes practically the line of the lower border of pectoralis minor. The subscapular is sufficiently indicated by the axillary border of the scapula. The scapular circumflex is given off the subscapular opposite the midpoint of a line joining the tip of the acromion to the lower edge of the deltoid tuberosity, while the humeral circumflex arteries arise from the axillary about two centimeters above this. The position of the brachial artery is marked by a line drawn from the junction of the anterior and middle thirds of the distance between the anterior and posterior axillary folds to a point midway between the epicondyles of the humerus and continued distally for 2.5 centimeters, at which point the artery bifurcates. With regard to the branches of the brachial artery, the profunda crosses the back of the humerus at the level of the insertion of deltoideus. The nutrient is given off opposite the middle of the body of the humerus. A line from this point to the back of the medial condyle represents the superior ulnar collateral. The inferior ulnar collateral is given off about 5 centimeters above the fold of the elbow joint and runs directly medialward. The position of the radial artery in the forearm is represented by a line from the lateral margin of the biceps tendon in the center of the antecubital fossa to the medial side of the front of the styloid process of the radius when the limb is in the position of supination. The situation of the distal portion of the artery is indicated by continuing this line around the radial side of the wrist to the proximal end of the first intermetacarpal space. On account of the curved direction of the ulnar artery, two lines are required to indicate its course. One is drawn from the front of the medial epicondyl to the radial side of the pisiform bone. The lower two-thirds of this line represents two-thirds of the artery. The upper third is represented by a second line from the center of the hollow in the front of the elbow joint to the junction of the upper and middle thirds of the first line. The superficial volar arch can be indicated by a line starting from the radial side of the pisiform bone and curving distal word and lateral word as far as the base of the thumb with its convexity toward the fingers. The summit of the arch is usually on a level with the ulnar border of the outstretched thumb. The deep volar arch is practically transverse and is situated about one centimeter nearer to the carpus. Nerves. In the arm, the line of the median nerve is practically the same as that for the brachial artery. At the bend of the elbow, the nerve is medial to the artery. The course of the nerve in the forearm is marked by a line starting from a point just medial to the center of one joining the epicondyles and extending to the lateral margin of the tendon of palmaris longus at the wrist. The ulnar nerve follows the line of the brachial artery in the upper half of the arm, but at the middle of the arm it diverges and descends to the back of the medial epicondyle. In the forearm it is represented by a line from the front of the medial epicondyle to the radial side of the pisiform bone. The course of the radial nerve can be indicated by a line from just below the posterior axillary fold to the lateral side of the humerus at the junction of its middle and lower thirds. Thence it passes vertically downward on the front of the arm to the level of the lateral epicondyle. The course of the superficial radial nerve is represented by a continuation of this line downward to the junction of the middle and lower thirds of the radial artery. It then crosses the radius and runs distalward to the dorsum of the base of the first metacarpal bone. The axillary nerve crosses the humerus about two centimeters above the center of a line joining the tip of the acromion to the lower edge of the deltoid tuberosity. End of section 57.
Recording by Jean Hildy Fulgham. Section 58 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. Surface Anatomy of the Lower Extremity. Skin. The skin of the thigh, especially in the hollow of the groin and on the medial side, is thin, smooth, and elastic, and contains few hairs, except in the neighborhood of the pubis. Laterally, it is thicker, and the hairs are more numerous. The junction of the skin of the thigh with that on the front of the abdomen is marked by a well-defined furrow which indicates the site of the inguinal ligament. The furrow presents a general convexity downward, but its medial half, which is the better marked, is nearly straight. The skin over the buttock is fairly thick, and is characterized by its low sensibility and slight vascularity. As a rule, it is destitute of conspicuous hairs, except toward the post-anal furrow, where in some males they are abundantly developed. An almost transverse fold, the gluteal fold, crosses the lower part of the buttock. It practically bisects the lower margin of the gluteus maximus, and is most evident during extension of the hip joint. The skin over the front of the knee is covered by thickened epidermis. It is loose and thrown into transverse wrinkles when the leg is extended. The skin of the leg is thin, especially on the medial side, and is covered with numerous large hairs. On the dorsum of the foot, the skin is thin, loosely connected to subjacent parts, and contains few hairs. On the plantar surface, and especially over the heel, the epidermis is of great thickness. And here, as in the palm of the hand, there are neither hairs nor sebaceous glands. Bones. The hip bones are largely covered with muscles, so that only at a few points do they approach the surface. In front, the anterior superior iliac spine is easily recognized, and in thin subjects stands out as a prominence at the lateral end of the fold of the groin. In fat subjects, its position is indicated by an oblique depression, at the bottom of which the bony process can be felt. Proceeding upward and backward from this process, the sinuously curved iliac crest can be traced to the posterior superior iliac spine, the side of which is indicated by a slight depression. On the outer lip of the crest, about five centimeters behind the anterior superior spine, is the prominent iliac tubercle. In thin subjects, the pubic tubercle is very apparent, but in the obese it is obscured by the pubic fat. It can, however, be detected by following up the tendon of origin of adductor longus. Another part of the bony pelvis which is accessible to touch is the ischial tuberosity situated beneath the gluteus maximus, and when the hip is flexed, easily felt, as it is then uncovered by muscle. The femur is enveloped by muscles, so that in fairly muscular subjects the only accessible parts are the lateral surface of the greater trochanter and the lower expanded end of the bone. The site of the greater trochanter is generally indicated by a depression, owing to the thickness of the glutei medius and minimus which project above it. When, however, the thigh is flexed, and especially if it be crossed over the opposite one, the trochanter produces a blunt eminence on the surface. The lateral condyle is more easily felt than the medial. Both epicondyles can be readily identified, and at the upper part of the medial condyle the sharp adductor tubercle can be recognized without difficulty. When the knee is flexed, a portion of the patellar surface is uncovered and is palpable. The anterior surface of the patella is subcutaneous. When the knee is extended, the medial border of the bone is a little more prominent than the lateral and if the quadriceps femoris be relaxed, the bone can be moved from side to side. When the joint is flexed, the patella recedes into the hollow between the condyles of the femur and the upper end of the tibia, and becomes firmly applied to the femur. A considerable portion of the tibia is subcutaneous. At the upper end, the condyles can be felt just below the knee. The medial condyle is broad and smooth, and merges into the subcutaneous surface of the body below. The lateral is narrower and more prominent, and on it, about midway between the apex of the patella and the head of the fibula, is the tubercle for the attachment of the iliotibial band. In front of the upper end of the bone, between the condyles, is an oval eminence, the tuberosity, which is continuous below with the anterior crest of the bone. 
This crest can be identified in the upper two-thirds of its extent as a flexuous ridge, but in the lower third it disappears, and the bone is concealed by the tendons of the muscles on the front of the leg. Medial to the anterior crest is the broad surface, slightly encroached on by muscles in front and behind. The medial malleolus forms a broad prominence, situated at a higher level, and somewhat farther forward than the lateral malleolus. It overhangs the medial border of the arch of the foot. Its anterior border is nearly straight. Its posterior presents a sharp edge which forms the medial margin of the groove for the tendon of tibialis posterior. The only subcutaneous parts of the fibula are the head, the lower part of the body, and the lateral malleolus. The head lies behind and lateral to the lateral condyle of the tibia, and presents as a small, prominent, pyramidal eminence, slightly above the level of the tibial tuberosity. Its position can be readily located by following downward the tendon of biceps femoris. The lateral malleolus is a narrow, elongated prominence, from which the lower third or half of the lateral surface of the body of the bone can be traced upward. On the dorsum of the tarsus, the individual bones cannot be distinguished, with the exception of the head of the talus, which forms a rounded projection in front of the ankle joint when the foot is forcibly extended. The whole dorsal surface of the foot has a smooth convex outline, the summit of which is the ridge formed by the head of the talus, the navicular, the second cuneiform, and the second metatarsal bone. From this it inclines gradually lateralward and rapidly medialward. On the medial side of the foot, the medial process of the tuberosity of the calcaneus and the ridge separating the posterior from the medial surface of the bone are distinguishable. In front of this, and below the medial malleolus, is the sustentaculum talli. The tuberosity of the navicular is palpable about 2.5 to 3 centimeters in front of the medial malleolus. Farther forward, the ridge formed by the base of the first metatarsal bone can be obscurely felt and from this the body of the bone can be traced to the expanded head. Beneath the base of the first phalanx is the medial sesamoid bone. On the lateral side of the foot, the most posterior bony point is the lateral process of the tuberosity of the calcaneus, with the ridge separating the posterior from the lateral surface of the bone. In front of this, the greater part of the lateral surface of the calcaneus is subcutaneous. On it, below and in front of the lateral malleolus, the trochlear process, when present, can be felt. Farther forward, the base of the fifth metatarsal bone is prominent, and from it the body and expanded head can be traced. As in the case of the metacarpals, the dorsal surfaces of the metatarsal bones are easily defined, although their heads do not form prominences. The plantar surfaces are obscured by muscles. The phalanges, in their whole extent, are readily palpable. Articulations. The hip joint is deeply seated and cannot be palpated. The interval between the tibia and femur can always be easily felt. If the knee joint be extended, this interval is on a higher level than the apex of the patella, but if the joint be slightly flexed, it is directly behind the apex. When the knee is semi-flexed, the medial borders of the patella and of the medial condyle of the femur, and the upper border of the medial condyle of the tibia, bound a triangular depressed area, which indicates the position of the joint. The ankle joint can be felt on either side of the extensor tendons, and during extension of the joint, the superior articular surface of the talus presents below the anterior border of the lower end of the tibia. Muscles. Of the muscles of the thigh, those of the anterior femoral region contribute largely to surface form. The tensor fascia lata produces a broad elevation immediately below the anterior part of the iliac crest and behind the anterior superior iliac spine. From its lower border, a groove caused by the iliotibial band extends downward to the lateral side of the knee joint. The upper portion of sartorius constitutes the lateral boundary of the femoral triangle, and when the muscle is in action, forms a prominent oblique ridge, which is continued below into a flattened plane and then gradually merges into a general fullness on the medial side of the knee joint. When the sartorius is not in action, a depression exists between the quadriceps femoris and the adductors, and extends obliquely downward and medialward, from the apex of the femoral triangle to the side of the knee. 
In the angle formed by the divergence of sartorius and tensor fasciolata, just below the anterior superior iliac spine, the rectus femoris appears. And in a muscular subject, its borders can be clearly defined when the muscle is in action. The vastus lateralis forms a long, flattened plane traversed by the groove of the iliotibial band. The vastus medialis gives rise to a considerable prominence on the medial side of the lower half of the thigh. This prominence increases toward the knee, and ends somewhat abruptly with a full, curved outline. The vastus intermedius is completely hidden. The adductores cannot be differentiated from one another, with the exception of the upper tendon of adductor longus and the lower tendon of adductor magnus. When the adductor longus is in action, its upper tendon stands out as a prominent ridge running obliquely downward and lateralward from the neighborhood of the pubic tubercle and forming the medial border of the femoral triangle. The lower tendon of adductor magnus can be distinctly felt as a short ridge extending downward between the sartorius and vastus medialis to the adductor tubercle. The adductories fill in the triangular space at the upper part of the thigh, between the femur and the pelvis, and to them is due the contour of the medial border of the thigh, the gracilis contributing largely to the smoothness of the outline. The gluteus maximus forms the full rounded outline of the buttock. It is more prominent behind, compressed in front, and ends at its tendinous insertion in a depression immediately behind the greater trochanter. Its lower border crosses the gluteal fold obliquely downward and lateralward. The upper is part of gluteus medius and is visible, but its lower part with gluteus minimus and the external rotators are completely hidden. From beneath the lower margin of gluteus maximus the hamstrings appear. At first they are narrow and not well defined, but as they descend they become more prominent and eventually divide into two well-marked ridges formed by their tendons. These constitute the upper boundaries of the popliteal fossa. The tendon of biceps femoris is a thick cord running to the head of the fibula. The tendons of the semimembranosus and semitendinosus, as they run medialward to the tibia, are separated by a slight furrow. The semitendinosus is the more medial, and can be felt in certain positions of the limb as a sharp cord, while the semimembranosus is thick and rounded. The gracilis is situated a little in front of them. The tibialis anterior presents a fusiform enlargement at the lateral side of the tibia, and projects beyond the anterior crest of the bone. Its tendon can be traced on the front of the tibia and ankle joint, and thence along the medial side of the foot to the base of the first metatarsal bone. The fleshy fibers of perineus longus are strongly marked at the upper part of the lateral side of the leg. It is separated by furrows from extensor digitorum longus in front, and soleus behind. Below, the fleshy fibers end abruptly in a tendon which overlaps the more flattened elevation of perineus brevis. Below the lateral malleolus, the tendon of perineus brevis is the more marked. On the dorsum of the foot, the tendons emerging from beneath the transverse and cruciate crural ligaments spread out and can be distinguished as follows. The most medial and largest is tibialis anterior. The next is extensor hallucis proprius, then extensor digitorum longus dividing into four tendons to the second, third, fourth, and fifth toes. And lastly, perineus tertius. The extensor digitorum brevis produces a rounded outline on the dorsum of the foot and a fullness in front of the lateral malleolus. The interossei dorsales bulge between the metatarsal bones. At the back of the knee is the popliteal fossa, bounded above by the tendons of the hamstrings, and below by the gastrocnemius. Below this fossa is the prominent fleshy mass of the calf of the leg, produced by gastrocnemius and soleus. When these muscles are in action, the borders of gastrocnemius form two well-defined curved lines, which converge to the tendocalcaneus. The medial border is the more prominent. At the same time, the edges of soleus can be seen forming, on either side of gastrocnemius, curved eminences, of which the lateral is the longer. The fleshy mass of the calf ends somewhat abruptly in the tendocalcaneus, which tapers in the upper three-fourths of its extent, but widens out slightly below. Behind the medial border of the lower part of the tibia, a well-defined ridge is produced by the tendon of tibialis posterior during contraction of the muscle. 
On the sole of the foot, the abductor digiti quinti forms a narrow, rounded elevation on the lateral side, and the abductor hallucis a lesser elevation on the medial side. The flexor digitorum brevis, bound down by the plantar aponeurosis, is not very apparent. It produces a flattened form, and the thickened skin underlying it is thrown into numerous wrinkles. Arteries. The femoral artery, as it crosses the brim of the pelvis, is readily felt. In its course down the thigh, its pulsation becomes gradually more difficult of recognition. When the knee is flexed, the pulsation of the popliteal artery can easily be detected in the popliteal fossa. On the lower part of the front of the tibia, the anterior tibial artery becomes superficial and can be traced over the ankle into the dorsalis pedis. The latter can be followed to the proximal end of the first intermetatarsal space. The pulsation of the posterior tibial artery becomes evident near the lower end of the back of the tibia and is easily detected behind the medial malleolus. Veins. By compressing the proximal trunks, the venous arch on the dorsum of the foot, together with the great and small saphenous veins leading from it, are rendered visible. Nerves. The only nerve of the lower extremity which can be located by palpation is the common perineal as it winds around the lateral side of the neck of the fibula. End of section 58「Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 5, by Henry Gray. Surface Markings of the Lower Extremity. Bony Landmarks. The anterior superior iliac spine is at the level of the sacral promontory, the posterior at the level of the spinous process of the second sacral vertebra. A horizontal line through the highest points of the iliac crests passes also through the spinous process of the fourth lumbar vertebra, while, as already pointed out, the transtubercular plane through the tubercles on the iliac crests cuts the body of the fifth lumbar vertebra. The upper margin of the greater sciatic notch is opposite the spinous process of the third sacral vertebra, and slightly below this level is the posterior inferior iliac spine. The surface markings of the posterior inferior iliac spine and the ischial spine are both situated in a line which joins the posterior superior iliac spine to the outer part of the ischial tuberosity. The posterior inferior spine is 5 cm and the ischial spine 10 cm below the posterior superior spine. The ischial spine is opposite the first piece of the coccyx. With the body in the erect posture, the line joining the pubic tubercle to the top of the greater trochanter is practically horizontal. The middle of this line overlies the acetabulum and the head of the femur. A line used for clinical purposes is that of Nelaton, which is drawn from the anterior superior iliac spine to the most prominent part of the ischial tuberosity. It crosses the center of the acetabulum and the upper border of the greater trochanter. Another surface marking of clinical importance is Bryant's triangle, which is mapped out thus. A line from the anterior superior iliac spine to the top of the greater trochanter forms the base of the triangle. Its sides are formed respectively by a horizontal line from the anterior superior iliac spine and a vertical line from the top of the greater trochanter. Articulations the posterior superior iliac spine overlies the center of the sacroiliac articulations. The hip joint may be indicated, as described above, by the center of a horizontal line from the pubic tubercle to the top of the greater trochanter, or, more generally, it is below and slightly lateral to the middle of the inguinal ligament. The knee joint is superficial and requires no surface marking. The level of the ankle joint is that of a transverse line about one centimeter above the level of the tip of the medial malleolus. If the foot be forcibly extended, the head of the talus appears as a rounded prominence on the medial side of the dorsum. Just in front of this prominence, and behind the tuberosity of the navicular, is the talonavicular joint. The calcaneocuboid joint is situated midway between the lateral malleolus and the prominent base of the fifth metatarsal bone. The line indicating it is parallel to that of the talonavicular joint. The line of the fifth tarsometatarsal joint is very oblique. 
It starts from the projection of the base of the fifth metatarsal bone, and if continued would pass through the head of the first metatarsal. The lines of the fourth and third tarso-metatarsal joints are less oblique. The first tarso-metatarsal joint corresponds to a groove which can be felt by making firm pressure on the medial border of the foot 2.5 cm in front of the tuberosity of the navicular bone. The position of the second tarso-metatarsal joint is 1.25 cm behind this. The metatarsophalangeal joints are about 2.5 cm behind the webs of the corresponding toes. Muscles None of the muscles require any special surface lines to indicate them, but there are three intermuscular spaces which occasionally require definition. These are the femoral triangle, the adductor canal, and the popliteal fossa. The femoral triangle is bounded above by the inguinal ligament, laterally by the medial border of sartorius, and medially by the medial border of adductor longus. In the triangle is the fossa ovalis, through which the great saphenous vein dips to join the femoral. The center of this fossa is about four centimeters below and lateral to the pubic tubercle. Its vertical diameter measures about four centimeters, and its transverse about 1.5 centimeters. The femoral ring is about 1.25 centimeters lateral to the pubic tubercle. The adductor canal occupies the medial part of the middle third of the thigh. It begins at the apex of the femoral triangle and lies deep to the vertical part of the sartorius. The popliteal fossa is bounded, above and medially, by the tendons of semimembranosus and semitendinosus, above and laterally by the tendon of biceps femoris, below and medially by the medial head of gastrocnemius, below and laterally by the lateral head of gastrocnemius and the plantaris. Mucus sheaths the positions of the mucus sheaths around the tendons about the ankle joints are sufficiently indicated in figures 1241 and 1242. Arteries. The points of emergence of the three main arteries on the buttock, that is, the superior and inferior gluteals and the internal pudendal, may be indicated in the following manner. With the femur slightly flexed and rotated inward, a line is drawn from the posterior superior iliac spine to the posterior superior angle of the greater trochanter. The point of emergence of the superior gluteal artery from the upper part of the greater sciatic foramen corresponds to the junction of the upper and middle thirds of this line. A second line is drawn from the posterior superior iliac spine to the outer part of the ischial tuberosity. The junction of its lower with its middle third marks the point of emergence of the inferior gluteal and internal pudendal arteries from the lower part of the greater sciatic foramen. The course of the femoral artery is represented by the upper two-thirds of a line from a point midway between the anterior superior iliac spine and the symphysis pubis to the adductor tubercle with the thigh abducted and rotated outward. The profunda femoris arises from it about one to five centimeters below the inguinal ligament. The course of the upper part of the popliteal artery is indicated by a line from the lateral margin of semimembranosus at the junction of the middle and lower thirds of the thigh, obliquely downward to the middle of the popliteal fossa. From this point it runs vertically downward for about 2.5 centimeters, or to the level of a line through the lower part of the tibial tuberosity. The line indicating the anterior tibial artery is drawn from the medial side of the head of the fibula to a point midway between the malleoli. The artery begins about three centimeters below the head of the fibula. The dorsalis pedis artery is represented on the dorsum of the foot by a line from the center of the interval between the malleoli to the proximal end of the first intermetatarsal space. The course of the posterior tibial artery can be shown by a line from the end of the popliteal artery, that is, 2.5 cm below the center of the popliteal fossa, to midway between the tip of the medial malleolus and the center of the convexity of the heel. Its main branch, the peroneal artery, begins about 7 or 8 cm below the level of the knee joint and follows the line of the fibula to the back of the lateral malleolus. The medial and lateral plantar arteries begin from the end of the posterior tibial. The medial extends to the middle of the plantar surface of the ball of the great toe. The lateral to within a finger's breadth of the tuberosity of the fifth metatarsal bone. 
From this latter point the plantar arch crosses the foot transversely to the proximal end of the first intermetatarsal space. Veins the line of the great saphenous vein is from the front of the medial malleolus to the center of the fossa ovalis. The small saphenous vein runs from the back of the lateral malleolus to the center of the popliteal fossa. Nerves. The course of the sciatic nerve can be indicated by a line from a point midway between the outer border of the ischial tuberosity and the posterior superior angle of the greater trochanter to the upper angle of the popliteal fossa. The continuation of this line vertically, through the center of the popliteal fossa, represents the position of the tibial nerve, while the common peroneal nerve follows the line of the tendon of biceps femoris. The lines for the deep peroneal nerve and the continuation of the tibial nerve correspond, respectively, to those for the anterior and posterior tibial arteries. End of section 59. End of part 5. This concludes Anatomy of the Human Body by Henry Gray.